let's talk about some of the top foods for people who have tuned into this point. They want to include, and this is beyond eating a healthy diet of whole foods, but specific foods that have special properties when it comes to fixing and maintaining a health a healthy metabolism. Okay. So first of all, let me um, set the stage by saying I'm a researcher and a doctor who studies food as medicine. Food as medicine has become kind of a common label, but I've been doing this for well over a decade. And I can tell you, food as medicine researchers like me, what we're trying to do is understand what's inside of food. And when you eat it, how does your body respond to what you're feeding it? And what are the consequences? Do you get healthier? Do you get sicker? Now, so much about food historically has been about guilt, shame, and fear, right? And we tend to focus on what foods we should eliminate and talk about all the bad things, whether it's soda or chips or sugar, you know, all that kind of stuff. People vilify that stuff and it's okay, you know, when there's real evidence supporting it. But the problem is, you know, it gets really tiring to hear vilification all the time. It's a very negative approach. So what I've done is I've actually gone the other direction to say, okay, look, there's plenty of people studying what you shouldn't eat. What should we be eating? And is there any way that we can tie in the things that we should be eating, can be eating with joy, the things that actually bring us joy that we love to actually eat? And this is actually where the, um, where the wonderful research has brought us to this day is that we now know when it comes to your metabolism and your other health defenses in your body, your circulation, your re- ability to regenerate and heal from the inside, your gut health, your um, natural ability to slow down cellular aging with the, at your DNA level, and also your immune system, right? These are all health defenses. And your metabolism sits all on top of all of these things. It turns out that you can just go to the ordinary grocery store and follow what the researchers have discovered, which is that when you go into the produce section, there's plenty of foods that are great for you. I'll just list off a couple of them. And I can tell you for every food, we actually are beginning to discover exactly what the compounds are natural chemicals, we call them bioactives, what are in them that actually are good for us and how they fight body fat and improve your metabolism. Walk into the produce section. You see the fruit, apples, pears, pink grapefruit, mangoes, papaya, watermelon. Yes, they all have fructose in them, but also they're very nutrient dense. They've got dietary fiber and they've got bioactives like lycopene and chlorogenic acid and hesperidin and aerogenin. All these Greek words I just pronounced for you, Guess what? They all fight body fat. When you eat them, ironically, you can eat foods that contain substances, natural chemicals, that will actually pound on your body fat, and they will also spark your brown fat. This is another kind of fat we haven't talked about yet. Good fat that will light up. It's like a space heater that will flare up like uh, like a space heater. And when it actually flares up, it draws energy. Good fat draws energy. Brown fat draws energy from bad fat, from visceral fat, and it burns it right down. And so other foods that are good, hot chili peppers, uh, red bell peppers, mushrooms, turmeric. Uh, you know the turmeric root you can actually find uh, in the grocery store? Oh, leafy greens, broccoli, bok choy, broccolini, broccoli rob. Go over to the other section. Onions, garlic, scallions. These are all things that um, tomatoes, forgot about tomatoes, all kinds of tomatoes. So if this sounds like, hmm, I could probably make a, a, a nice lunch or a nice salad, or I could make a stew or a soup, or I could go to an Italian or Mediterranean recipe, or maybe go an Asian recipe, I could whip something up in a really, really tasty way. That's the point. These traditional healthy cuisines from the Mediterranean and Asia have figured out thousands of years ago, how to pick and choose the ingredients that when combined together are not only tasty, but are good for your health if you eat them at the right time in the right way. All right. Now, what we what we have today, though, is this real spanking new cutting edge science, smoking hot science that gives us the why and how of why we should choose these. So go around the grocery store. We talked about, you know, fresh plant based foods, but it's not just that you can wheel into that forbidden middle aisle, which remember people used to say. Shop only on the perimeter of the grocery store. Okay. Even I believe this before I got into food as medicine research. Um, but I'm telling you, the research shows us it is absolutely perfectly fine to go into the middle aisles. Okay. I'm giving you permission to do it. 
In fact, I'm telling you to do it. But what I call it, and this is a whole chapter in my book called Treasure Hunt. That's the name of the chapter. And I'm saying, go into the Middle Isles to look for the treasure. Watch out for the fool's gold because there's stuff there that is not good for your metabolism, not good for body fat, um, not good for your health defenses, but go for the real gold so you can pick out the real treasures. What are some of them? Lentils, navy beans, dried mushrooms, dried chili peppers, spices like peppermint, uh, 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 turmeric, cumin, uh, coriander, uh, oregano, uh, tomato, tomato sauce, tomato paste, tinned fish, mackerel, sardines, oysters, um, uh, uh, clams. Uh, You can actually go to olive oil. Then look for the pickled section. There are prunes, dried prunes, also really good. Oh, middle aisle, dried nuts. You can buy nuts in bulk. Walnuts, pecans, cashews, um, uh, almonds. You can buy all these in bulk, and it's actually really good for you. Oh, did I mention soba noodles made with buckwheat and barley? If you know this sounds like kind of like a, a cruise through the uh, the middle aisles of the grocery store, that you know you might not be sure what you should actually get for health. I just gave you a clue, and there and there's a ton. There's a whole chapter about middle aisle foods, and so in total, I I, I literally take people on this tour the grocery store for 150 different foods that have been shown in the laboratory and in human studies to actually help your metabolism by fighting harmful body fat. All right, we're going to get into the physiology of some of those and how they help fight body fat and improve our metabolism. But before we do, I want to talk from the other angle, and I know this isn't your favorite thing to do, but we're going to go there at least quickly and talk about plant toxins. And we're going to avoid lectins for now because we've already gone in depth into those in another conversation. People can go look that up. But what about things like phytic acid, oxalates, these quote unquote plant toxins that are found in some of the foods that you just named? How do you think about those? A poisonous plant is like the angel, the death angel mushroom. You eat that, it's like being bitten by a cobra. You'll die. Okay. Um, if you eat belladonna, which is a true nightshade, it will actually poison you and your heart will actually stop, slow down and stop. Okay. So there are true plant poisons. I would not recommend uh, chewing on uh, poison ivy or poison oak leaf. It'll probably cause a severe reaction in your mouth um, that you're going to be really sorry you actually uh, uh, consumed. But for the most part, all the plants that you would actually find in the supermarket that have been consumed for not hundreds, but thousands of years that people have lived with are perfectly fine. So people talk about plant toxins and anti-nutrients. You know what? Those are all made up marketing concepts. Somebody who is not a scientist, who is not a physician, who doesn't study food as medicine, wants to come up and figure out like, and I always sort of give people credit mostly well-intentioned people that really are trying hard to try to have their own understanding of the natural world and what's good for them. And they come up with this idea, a lectin. Oh, I looked on Wikipedia and there is a poison lectin. Well, everything that has a lectin must be poison. Oh, soybeans. Oh, it's got a, a an estrogen in it, a phytoestrogen. Ooh, that sounds scary. Like estrogen causes breast cancer. Now every woman should avoid soy. Well-intentioned people misinterpret the details of science, and then come up with their own explanation that they spread like wildfire, and it becomes an urban legend. So let me kind of, let me just kind of put to bed right now. There are, there are really very few plant toxins and foods that you would actually eat in quantities that would actually do anything harmful to you. If you have, if you are a kidney stone former or a gall bladder, gall stone former, yes cut down on your oxalate forming uh, foods because you don't want to actually trip off a kidney stone or a gallstone. All right. But most people, it's fine. And if you eat in moderation and you stay well hydrated, your body will flush out all those oxalates. You'll be just fine. Same thing as uric acid. If you don't have gout, you can eat foods containing uric acid. Um, You know, so I, I would sort of try to take a reasonable, like we spend way too much looking up plant toxins on the internet and then categorize them and trying to figure out, okay, what food should I character assassinate today? I, I, I sort of think that the flip side of that is, all right, pick a food that you think is toxic. It's got plant toxins. Use tomatoes with lectins because I know it's a lectin is something that's been so well established in the urban legend world that must be poisonous because it's a nightshade. And let's take a look at what the evidence is. Well, it turns out 
Eating tomatoes actually helps you lose weight. It improves your metabolism by fighting harmful white fat and visceral fat and increasing the burn of your brown fat. Well, you know what? If it was a real poison, toxin, probably wouldn't do that. Oh, eating tomatoes containing um, uh, lycopene actually lowers the risk of developing prostate cancer by almost 30% in men who have two to three servings of cooked tomatoes a week. Well, you know what? If there was a real poison, a real toxin to it, it probably wouldn't lower your risk of cancer. It might do, it might be the other way around as well. And so again, you know, I think that we just need to, if you're going to go in one direction, what I encourage you to do, this is anybody watching, listening to this. Look, I'm a scientist. I got to be open minded. For a long time, I didn't, there were things that I didn't believe were true, like apple cider vinegar could actually cause you to lose weight. I had lots of people, I have friends who were actually consuming apple cider vinegar and telling me that they, they were losing weight. And I said, ah, oh, it's got to be bunk. All right, that's just another trend. Well, I'm open-minded. Now I'm looking at the data, and it turns out, sure enough, eating two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar and splitting it up twice a day, you know, uh, splitting up in the morning and the evening, will actually help you burn body fat and shrink your waist circumference. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And so what I what I think is that there's two sides to every coin when it comes to food. First, is there anything dangerous or toxic to it? You know, for most fresh foods, whole foods, probably not. Not that you would eat, that you would sell. They'd be banned for eating. Um, uh, are, there, are there good, is there good evidence for every food that you're trying to um, uh, say is dangerous? I would encourage people to look at the other side. What's the evidence that, in fact, it shows that it's healthy? Because you got to balance that net net. Is it healthy or is it dangerous? And by the way, nothing's more dangerous than the so some of the ultra processed foods we're talking about, right? So think about the stuff that comes in a powder or comes in a box or comes in a bag, you know, that's been manufactured and doesn't look like real food anymore. That actually is probably got the greatest number of toxins. You show me a plant-based toxin, an anti-nutrient, I will show you a ultra processed food. We can pick out any ingredient on the side of the box and let's go. Side by side, I will ride shotgun and let's go. You give me um, uh, my literature and I'll give you your literature and let's go see which one is more toxic. I bet I'll win. Important we went there. That was that was a good rant and, and debriefing from, you know, again, you're a researcher, a scientist. So this is this is important to see the other side. Absolutely. And, you know, like I said, I I really believe most people in the food and health and nutrition world, they're, they're well-intentioned. You know, I, I think we all are interested in finding out what's the best for us. What's the best for ourselves? What's the best for our fellow man, man person, kind, you know, and humans? Like, I, I, so I give a big credit for that. I just sort of think that I always get, like, uh, bummed out when I watch people rush in the direction of something that doesn't have a lot of evidence. It might sound attractive or um, sound convincing. But again, this is where we need to actually do our own research so that we can make up our own individual minds. Where is the evidence actually? What is it actually telling us? And you touched on this quickly. I think for all of us, it's important that we have an open mind though, because, and I try and do this with the show where I'm taking on guests that have all different opinions and, and they're presenting their own facts in their own way. And then people can try things on and see what works for them. And we're all different. So different things are going to interact with our biology in different ways. So very complex. It's not, not a simple sure. thing to decipher, but I think it's important. All of us keep the conversation open and, 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 I wanna, and I wanna... continue to, to, to experiment and be open to different ideas. 100%. I'm going to give your viewers and listeners um, a little tip. There is a website called PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D. Anybody can look it up. It's free. It's on Google. And what I encourage you to do, because this is a, a little kind of um, technique that I use to do my own research. If, I, if I'm not doing my own research, I'm like looking up something to check a fact or check a claim. Type the food into, it's basically, this is the National Library of Medicine. That's like the government, the U.S. government's repository of all the medical research that's out there. Type in a food that you are interested in exploring for good or for bad, okay? Chestnuts, blueberries, you know, the soybeans, whatever you want to put in there, okay? Artificial meat, um, plant-based meats, and then type in clinical trial, okay? Those two things. It's it's neutral, non-judgmental. It's the name of the food and put clinical. 
or clinical trial. If you don't want to put trial, put clinical. Those two words, the food and the word clinical, and hit search, and it'll pull up all the human research that's been done to show if something is beneficial or harmful. And you can just scroll through that. And, you know, to the extent that not every, that most people can read the basic sum, summaries, um, an abstract, you can get something out of it. You'll get an idea of what the research is showing. And when you look at page after page after page, you'll get a better idea of what's newly discovered, what's been mispro- disproven, and, um, and where are some of the open questions? Because I think open mindedness is very important. Let's talk about some of these power foods now from the other way around. And you mentioned apple cider vinegar. This is one that in the weight loss world has had a lot of steam for a long time. But what I want to do, we can't go through all of them. You've named so many great foods that we want to start including on a regular basis as part of our diet. But let's take a handful of them and talk about the physiology, starting with ACV. How is that helping when it comes specifically to our metabolism and fat burning? Okay. so. Previously, earlier in the conversation, we went through all the mechanisms of metabolism. So I'll don't put it in the context of food. Let's just use apple cider vinegar. Actually, it has nothing, very little to do with the apple or the cider, but it has everything to do with vinegar. So um, I have a chemistry background, biochemistry background. So I'll tell you, vinegar is actually made of acetic acid. Acetic acid is what gives vinegar its pungent, potent smell. And it's the same thing. It's an apple cider vinegar. Any kind of fermented fruit will actually do it. Red wine vinegar will do it. Raspberry vinegar will do it. Um, black vinegar, uh, balsamic vinegar will also have acetic acid. And it's the acetic acid in vinegar that's now been discovered in research, both in the lab and in the clinic with humans, that actually burns down harmful body fat. Okay, burns down visceral fat. What does it actually do? It actually slows the ability of your metabolism to load up fat cells as fuel tanks. Remember I told you, you load it up, it gets bigger and fatter and fatter a hundred times. Yep, ACV, but the acetic acid in all vinegars prevents that from blowing up so quickly. So the fat doesn't expand quite as fast. That's just preventing fat from growing. But what about burning it down? It turns on your brown fat. Brown fat actually is like the space heater. And when you actually have the space heater, going on, what you're actually doing. And again, I, I, I'm going to show you a little demo. This is that mention. This is your brown fat and you have apple cider vinegar. It actually turns on the brown fat. It's a special kind of fat. It's paper thin, pressed close to the bone and it turns it on. Look at that. Look at this flame. Okay. That flame has to consume energy. Where does it get the energy from? From your visceral fat. It just steals that energy and it burns down harmful fat. So apple cider vinegar will actually do this. Now we know um, in the lab, it'll actually cause obese diabetic rats to lose weight. In humans, it'll decrease body fat, um, and it'll cre- decrease waist size, which is your visceral fat, in- the fat inside the tube that we started talking about at the beginning of this podcast. And so, and you don't, by the way, you don't need to have very much apple cider vinegar. I was very, very surprised to see how modest of amount of vinegar you need to take to have an effect. Even one tablespoon of ACV, and this is from a clinical trial, that you split up into drinking half of it in, in a glass of water or kombucha or something um, and after breakfast and one after dinner, that's enough to start triggering weight loss and fighting body fat. You double that and you go to two tablespoons a day, split it up, put it into a beverage so you don't dissolve your teeth when you're actually swinging it. Um, tomato juice is a great way because now tomatoes also have some extra fat fighting. You'll actually um, improve and increase the amount of weight and body fat you're going to burn down. So again, that's a, a, an example of a food that actually is um, mighty in terms of its effect on your metabolism. And another benefit too of adding ACV and say a glass of water and having that with a meal is it helps curb your blood sugar spike. So if you consume that with a meal with carbohydrates in it, it's been shown to help. It's not going to be perfect. You're still going to get a spike, but it helps you know, make that more gradual. Well, actually, you know, so one of the reasons that does that is by making whatever amount of insulin that you have more efficient. So you don't need to keep spiking your insulin. It'll take whatever's there and just make it work more efficiently. So these things make sense once you look at the research on it. Um, uh, and and uh, so that's an example of something in a middle aisle that you can easily put in your pantry 
inexpensive, easy to have. You don't need very much of it to have a beneficial effect. So to highlight what you just said there with ACV, it affects our metabolism in two ways. One, it affects the fat cell from expanding and getting bigger. And two, it activates the brown fat. So two different ways within that one food or liquid in this case. What I want to do before we part ways, let's talk about a couple of the other foods you mentioned before that act on the system and the physiology in a different way to help burn fat. So let's uh, talk about um, a pear. I actually love pears, you know, especially uh, in the fall and winter. I lo- There's nothing I love more than a, like a really ripe pear uh, and, and, and when it's in season. And what does pear, what do pears have? Um, pears have a lot of dietary fiber. Dietary fiber helps your gut microbiome, help feed your gut bacteria. Your healthy gut bacteria helps to streamline your metabolism, helps make your body more sensitive to insulin. So your glucose, your fuels, uh, uh, absorb more f- efficiently, but also it's got chlorogenic acid, which is different than acetic acid. It's a different acid, chlorogenic acid. Chlorogenic acid, by the way, also turns on your brown fat, but chlorogenic acid also takes your white fat, the harmful wiggly jiggly stuff, and says, hey, by the way, taps on your shoulders. Hey, by the way, here's what we'd like you to do. We'd like you to start turning it more into brown fat, healthy fat, helpful fat, useful fat. And literally, you know, your wiggly jiggly stuff goes, "Eh, you know what? Okay, I'll do that. And so you can actually use pears, the chlorogenic acid in pears to help to convert some of your harmful white fat towards brown fat. And in fact, it will also tell your stem cells that might turn, may create another fuel tank. And rather than making more white fat, it might say, hey, buddy, over that the other direction, don't make more fuel tank for white fat. Go ahead and make some brown fat. It can actually have stem cells make more brown fat. All right, one more food before we part ways. And I want to talk about a food you can pick your favorite that acts on the angiogenesis system. So I'm going to come up with a, a, a fairly complicated food, but it's very tasty. And that's pomegranates. All right. Now, pomegranates are, um, they've got seeds with a little rim, a little, little, um, little layer of juice around it. And, um, and pomegranate juice is really pressed from those seeds. Some kinds of pomegranate juice actually is pressed through the skin of the pomegranate, and most of the polyphenols are actually found in the skin. And so how the juice gets pressed can make a big difference. You get a lot more polyphenol with juice that's pressed through the skin. All right. Now, um, pomegranate juice we know contains a natural bioactive called elagitannin. Elagitannins actually do some pretty amazing things. One of the things that it does is it actually um, – fights harmful body fat, white fat. It activates brown fat, lowers inflammation in fat. So all these good things that we actually know, it also affects the stem cells of fat as well. So these mechanisms are redundant, okay? So that way you can swap and switch and it's not like you got to eat the one thing all the time. Thank goodness that we can actually have diversity. Now, the other thing that happens with the lagitannins is that when we actually um, consume them from pomegranate juice or seeds, it actually, when it gets to our gut, our colon, it, it helps our colon secrete mucus. Mucus is very um, normal and healthy. And it help, and that mucus loves, there's a particular gut bacteria called Acromancia. In fact, it's called Acromancia mucinophila. It's the first name is Acromancia. The last name is mucinophila. That's genus and species. And the mucinophila means that this is the bacteria that loves to grow in, um, in mucus. And your gut normally makes it. The more Acromancia you have, Acromancia is a guardian of your met- metabolism, all right? It helps you burn down body fat, helps your metabolism be streamlined. In fact, people who are um, uh, very uh, slim, if you look in their poop and you look at how much acromancia they have, they tend to have a lot of acromancia. You go to somebody who is overweight or markedly obese and you look for acromancia, it's hardly there at all. It just shows you the power of just one bacteria in your gut bacteria that can be grown like fertilizer with pomegranate juice. Now, the other thing about pomegranate juice that actually is really important about these elagitannins is that it actually helps to control the blood vessels that might be growing into feed expanding fat. Remember I told you, the more, the bigger the fat you're growing, the more it, it will try to outgrow its blood supply. So the way, one way you can actually tame it so it just can't grow that large is by cutting off those extra blood vessels that's trying to grow. It'll still get a little inflamed. Eventually, it's going to die back. It's like, oh, man, 
we give up. We can't get any bigger. And so turns out that elagitanins tannins from pomegranate juice are anti-angiogenic, meaning they prevent extra blood vessels from growing to feed body fat as it's trying to expand. And so here's a way to yoke back expanding fat that's trying to grow out of control by keeping them from growing, getting their own private blood supply. By the way, this is the same approach that's been shown to have an effect, a beneficial effect in cancers that are trying to grow out of control. You can yoke back the growth of these undesirable tissue by actually preventing blood vessels or preventing angiogenesis, excessive angiogenesis from happening. So you can have just the right number of blood vessels, not too few and not too many. It's interesting as you talk about the physiology for some of these different foods that act on the metabolism, it gets me thinking back to earlier an earlier part of our conversation when we talked about calories, where it's clear, as you're saying, some of these different mechanisms, you know, activating brown fat or cutting off blood supply to fat, that there's a lot more that goes into how foods interact with our body beyond just calories. So right there, we're, we're proving a point that it's like you can actually take in a food, which is going to inherently have calories in it, but it can help you fight fat which is just such a backwards way compared to the current paradigm, which you're helping shatter. Yeah, it's paradoxical. And, and it, you know, and you and we wouldn't have thought this before the research came to light, but it is absolutely true. You can eat food to fight fat. And that doesn't seem to make sense when you think about it without any of this other conversation we've been having. But now that we have the science and you go ahead and you start looking at foods and obesity, there's in the lab and in the clinic, there are definitely foods, a growing list, and I write about 150 of them in my book, Eat to Be Your Diet, that you can actually find in your grocery store to put on your plate. And if eaten at the right time, in the right way, in the right volumes, all those parentheticals, by the way, are quite important. If you overeat anything, if you overdo anything over time, you're going to take some risks uh, to go along with it. But you know, I think that there are very sensible ways um, to actually eat for health. And that's what I, what I try to do is I can try to reconnect and try to send the message that we should be rediscovering our relationship with food. We shouldn't fear our food the way that the messaging has been given to us for so long. You know, food is about fear, guilt, and shame. You're a bad person if you eat this. You're going to get fat. It's so terrible. I think that we should learn to fall in love with our food all over again, connecting with our food in ways that make sense for our individual bodies. There are no hard and fast rules, no black and white things. This is not a light switch. This is a volume switch, and everybody has their own um, temperament and their own preferences, their own tolerability to the volume of that we can actually use these tools. But it's Mother Nature's Pharmacy with an F that she's actually created for us. So we should be really grateful that that exists. And thank goodness there are these delicious recipes from the Mediterranean and Asia, I call it Mediterranean eating, that allows us to dive into these foods in a way that tastes great. So they're good and good for us. The last paradox I want to mention here, I can't help but mention before we part ways, is tying this to the insulin piece as well, where when we're having some of these fat burning foods, they're inherently going to have carbohydrate in them. They're going to spike insulin, which we know, you know, is going to put us into growth mode and, and putting on weight. But the paradox is because of these other mechanisms, it's not as black and white as that. And you can actually have these foods and through other systems that are being talked about today, you can actually have a fat burning effect. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like lots of different things that are happening at the same time. What you want to look at is net net at the end of the day is the outcome of how your body responds to it useful or not? Do you actually gain or lose at the end of the day? It's, it is quite complicated, honestly. But, you know, I, I think that if we do things in moderation, uh, and we choose those, we make good choices for those healthy, delicious ingredients that are actually good for us, I, I think we'll be just fine. I'm taking a quick break from the episode to ask a small favor from you. Right now, the YouTube stats are showing that 92.3% of you are watching, but haven't subscribed to the channel yet. If you're one of these people and you've been enjoying the videos, please take a second and subscribe below. It's going to help the community continue to grow and help bring on bigger and bigger guests over time. I hope you're enjoying this episode and continue to do so, and I thank you ahead of time. 
say somebody right now is dealing with cancer or they just want to be really preventative, what are some of the foods that they can include to, you know, dampen down the blood supply to cancer? Yeah, well, I, you know, I like to talk about what is the research that supports foods and it gives us a clue to which ones might be useful. So let's talk about common, two common cancers in men and women, prostate cancer and breast cancer, right? Like regardless of who you're watching, who's watching this, you know, they're, they're, they're at some point, they're going to be concerned about that in their lives. All right. Um, prostate cancer. So there was a study of more than 30,000 men called the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study that looked at prostate cancer and followed these men over 20 some years. And they wanted to find out what people are eating and who got prostate cancer. And they um, found something amazing. They found um, those men who ate two to three servings per week, two to three times a week of cooked tomatoes, think tomato sauce, how much? About a half cup. So if you had a half fluid cup and you were actually trying to put some sauce on your pasta, that's not very much sauce. So a little actually gives you a lot. It turns out that those men eating two to three cups of cooked tomatoes uh, per week, tomato sauce per week, had a 29% decrease, almost 30% decrease in the risk of having prostate cancer. Pretty amazing. Okay. And then for those men who wound up developing prostate cancer, when they actually did the biopsy of the cancer, looked under the microscope at the blood vessels feeding the cancer, it turns out that those men who ate more servings, four servings a week, five servings a week, six servings a week, even seven servings a week, that's a pretty hardcore pasta eater, for example, um, seven servings a week, actually had fewer and fewer and fewer blood vessels. Their prostate cancers were less aggressive as well. And so eating tomatoes is an example of a food that can cut off the blood supply, anti-angiogenesis, in a disease like prostate cancer that have been studied in humans, studied in people. Now, um, what is it in a tomato? Well, it turns out tomato has a natural bioactive compound called lycopene. Lycopene is anti-angiogenic. That's one of the first studies that I did. We put lycopene into the system, cut off the blood supply like gangbusters. Now, Lycopene is in a raw tomato. So if you want, if you grew your tomato this summer, you had a vine and you picked it off the vine and bit into it like an apple or cut it up and put it into a salad, you'll get some vitamin C, you'll get some amazing flavor. The lycopene, unfortunately, when it comes, the tomato comes off the vine is not in a chemical form that your body absorbs very easily. Like only 20% absorbed. That's, you're not getting the full bang out of the buck. But when you actually heat that tomato, uh, in a skillet, slowly, tomato sauce, you wind up changing the chemical structure in a very natural way so that when you eat it, it, it gets absorbed. So now 80% gets absorbed. So 20% not absorbed, raw, 80% absorbed, lycopene cooked. Now, because lycopene is a what we call a fat-soluble chemical, meaning that it doesn't really dissolve in water, but if you actually put it in oil, it dissolves really well. Turns out if you cook your tomato with a little bit of olive oil, okay, so now you're talking about nona cook making tomato sauce, all right, now you're actually really changing that lycopene into a form that when you eat it, it not only is ready to be absorbed, it's more absorbable because it's actually in oil that will then get absorbed into your bloodstream. So that's an example um, uh, for tomatoes. Another for breast cancer, I think that's really important is to think about soy. Now there's an urban legend by the way, tomato urban legend too. You know, it's been said uh, uh, that people should avoid tomatoes because they're nightshades and because that they have something called lectins in them that are poisonous. So let me tell, let me kind of dispel. Uh, let's, let me try to clear up some urban legends here. I just told you human evidence that tomatoes are good to protect against prostate cancer. That's human research. Let me tell you that tomatoes do um, belong to a genus of plants called Solanacea, of which nightshades is one member. There's a lot of other forms of plants that are safe without, that are not deadly nightshade as well in that same family. And just because a tomato is, has a, rel rel is a relative by the evolutionary tree to nightshades doesn't mean that they're poison like nightshades. And, and number one, number two is that uh, their leaves match. Let's put it that way. Um, uh, looking at lectins, lectin is not one deadly bullet. There are hundreds of lectins. 
yeah, some are poisonous. Turns out the ones in tomatoes are not poisonous. And so I think people who have tried to put, who are well-intentioned that try to put together the scientific story, sort of logically try to put together something with their logic that unfortunately isn't really true. At the end of the day, one of the things that I uh, uh, tell people, Jesse, is that may be a theory. Let's see what happens in people. And here I just gave you the human evidence that tomatoes, two to three cups um, uh, uh, a week, half a cup serving lowers prostate cancer. So you, so that's really, that's the fact, Jack. Um, another urban legend for breast cancer also occurs. Um, and, and that's also worth talking about because it has to do with um, something that women are told to stay away from, which is soy food. Well, before we get into soy food, I want to talk more about this, this tomato sauce thing. Cause as you're sharing that, I'm sure the obvious question that comes up for a lot of people, if this is cutting off blood supply to cancer, if I'm doing this too much, is this going to impact, say, my wound healing in a negative way? Fantastic question. So let's back up for a second to say all of your body's health defenses, angiogenesis, stem cells, which you haven't talked about yet, microbiome, our DNA repair, and our immune system, all five of these, they are hardwired into our body like an operating system. They're part of our operating system, our OS. Okay. And they are designed to operate within a zone, meaning too little is harmful, too much is not good. And this zone means that you can go a little bit up and a little bit down and you're totally fine. And our body is hardwired as part of our defenses to grow more of the health defense if it's too low and also to mow down like a gardener on a golf course, mow down landscaper, mow down if it's too high. But that way you can operate in the zone. Drugs, I can tell you, because I have worked on this, can definitely punch through the zone. You want to take down blood vessels? I could, I could prescribe a drug that'll take your ability to grow blood vessels and wound healing down. I can impair it. Food doesn't work like that. Food is so naturally attuned to your body and your body is so naturally attuned to processing food. All it can do is to grow just enough blood vessels or to tamp down those extra blood vessels. You can, with food, you can only stay in the range. And that's the advantage of eating to beat disease, to to boost your body's health defenses. If you were to eat a lot of tomatoes, okay, you will mow that lawn to prevent too many angiogenesis from growing, but you cannot hurt your wound healing. Your body will compensate and make sure there's enough uh, ability to grow blood vessels to heal yourself. Lucky for us. Otherwise, this would get really complicated. We'd be bringing scales around to our meals and trying to figure out different numbers. And yeah, the other piece is the lectins. I want to highlight what you said there, because I think there's a lot of information, not think, I know there is of lectins being bad for us. And what you're saying is there's an array of different lectins and some of them are poisonous. Others aren't. Obviously, in the case of the tomato sauce, you share a real world example there that this is a beneficial food for people. That's right. And, you know, this is true for a lot of compounds that are out there as well. I mean, even uh, polyphenols and alkaloids and, uh, you know, there's a number of different uh, uh, natural substances that are present in our plant-based foods. Uh, Some of them are toxic, but some of them are not. And so one of the things that food as medicine researchers like I, like myself, what we're doing is really trying to figure out in foods that make a difference in human research, what why do they work? What's in them? We try to figure out what the compounds are, and then we try to figure out, okay, so how do they work? What health defense do they actually activate? And can we build a body of evidence to show, um, look, we've identified this or this number of chemicals in a particular food or food ingredient. We've identified the mechanism or mechanisms, the ma- manner in which they work, so we can understand it. And here's actually the impact in terms of how they are eaten, in terms of cooking, preparation, growing, all that kind of stuff. Uh, These are the ones that you should probably try to go for, and this is how you should prepare it. And then at the end of the day, the real rubber on the road, the real evidence, is: does it work in people? Do we have human evidence? And what I focus on is not the theory about the food. I focus on the rubber meets the road part. What foods have been shown to have human benefit? And then can we go back and do the research to figure out why? So that way, actually, we're always um, allowing the thing that matters the most, which is real benefit in the real world, to really be kind of our guide. 
Well, you started talking about a food there, another food that has a lot of controversy around it being soy and breast cancer. So I'll have you take that and run. Okay. So just like the tomatoes, this is a, uh, uh, this is sort of an urban legend is what I would call it. So women are, uh, it's very common to hear women being told if you are trying to uh, avoid breast cancer or if you're fearful of breast cancer or if you have breast cancer at all, um, uh, go to lengths to avoid eating soy. Soy is dangerous as it's told in a urban legend because it's got estrogen in it. And the estrogen in <clears throat> some forms of human cancer, breast cancer, can stimulate the growth of the breast cancer. Not all, not every breast cancer has estrogen receptors, but some do. And that, and therefore, um, if you were to connect those dots, women should avoid soy at all costs, right? That's really the urban legend that's out there. Well, um, first of all, I can actually tell you that if you were to look at the plant estrogen called a phytoestrogen, phyto for plant estrogen, and compare it to human estrogen, compare those chemical structures left and right, you'll see that they don't look anything the same. All right. So they're not the same chemical, even though they both contain the word estrogen. And this is really where the, I think the, the, the slippery road wound up starting. The word estrogen, well, it must be the same thing. Well, actually, chemically, they're not the same. Number two is that while plant estrogens will, will actually bind to estrogen receptors, guess what? <clears throat> if you actually study cell signaling, the plant estrogen will block human estrogen receptors. So in fact, it's mother nature's tamoxifen. It's like a drug that drug companies develop to try to block estrogen. Pl plants do that with a, with a plant estrogen that's found in soy. Then if you actually study what it actually does uh, in the lab, at the, at the level for can where it matters for cancer, it turns out that the plant estrogen, I'm going to call it, to tell you what it's called. It's called genistein. Okay. Genistein is what the plant estrogen is. Genistein is a powerful cancer starver. It cuts off the blood supply to tumors. I've studied that myself. <clears throat> you know, it works. And so, um, uh, take this forward to ask the real rubber meets the road question. So you've, you, you've, you've, Tell, given all these reasons to, to make me think that maybe it's always okay, what's the evidence? What's the proof? Here it is. A study of 5,000 women who are at the highest risk for breast cancer. You know who those women are? They're women who already have breast cancer, okay, showed that those women who ate more soy while they were battling cancer had better survival. In fact, they had about a 30% reduction in mortality if they ate more soy, not less soy. So soy didn't kill them, saved them, actually. And in fact, the uh, so how much soy do you have to get for that effect? And again, this is the research, about 10 grams of soy protein a day. How much is a gr 10 grams of soy protein? Because most people have no idea, grams or whatever, like what does that mean? It's about the amount you get in a uh, uh, cup of soy milk, a tall glass of soy milk easily achievable every single day. Um, now, I just gave you uh, an example of a study that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, one of the most credible uh, research journals, okay, in 5,000 women. That's a lot of women at super high risk. But then, you know, the critics will come out, you know, to say, yeah, well, you know, you're cherry picking a study. You know, one study doesn't mean anything because maybe it was a fluke. Maybe it wasn't well designed. Well, Here's what I did. Let's take a look at all the other evidence. Turns out that there's a meta-analysis of 14 other research studies involving women with breast cancer and looking at soy. And, and in every single study, eating soy, soy was accompanied by better survival. And in no case, zero cases, was eating soy associated with increasing mortality. So. It's pretty clear. Soy is not harmful. Soy does not cause breast cancer. Eating soy is not dangerous for women. Um, and by the way, here's another proof of concept. Just go ask people in Asia, Thailand, China, Vietnam, you know, uh, Malaysia. When they have breast cancer, the women are not told by their oncologists to stay away from soy. They eat it as part of their core plant-based protein. 
So anyway, that's that's another example of an urban legend. Food as medicine research, Jesse, is like really like we don't we don't pull our punches. We get right in there. And if we were to find out that a food that we thought was helpful was actually a hurtful, we call a shoe a shoe. You just got to call it by. And that's the power of science. It doesn't care what your opinion is. It just it, it just delivers on the facts. And sometimes the facts will evolve. Once you get more research on it, but that's where science actually is. You know, we don't know everything there is to know about the solar system, but we can tell you where we believe it is today. Let's talk about soy and men. You went deep there in talking about women and specifically with breast cancer, but I'm sure a lot of the men tuning in are hearing phytoestrogen and, and all the men want to know about testosterone and how to naturally boost that. What would you say to the men out there that are listening saying, I don't want to put more phytoestrogen in my body is... Is this a concern? No. And the reason it's not, I I alluded to before, plant estrogens block human estrogens. So in fact, it opposes the thing that you don't want the most. I mean, men have estrogen as well, just not as much as women because we don't have ovaries pumping out the estrogen. But, you know, as we get older, the estrogen competes with the testosterone and what people want is more T, testosterone, right? And so, um, and the testosterone goes down. So now you got to compete with the estrogen. I'll tell you, soy, the phytoestrogen, actually blocks the human estrogen in men's body. So soy actually is probably better for you in that regard as well. I'd love to hear what a typical day of eating looks like for you. Oh, okay. Well, it's, a, it's, 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 um, I don't have a, um, I don't follow a diet, but I follow an approach. And my approach is really based on the traditions of both the Mediterranean and also based on the traditions of Asia, both of which are very healthy cultures, both of which actually cook fresh whole foods together and combine ingredients in a way that, you know, are really appealing and tasty with traditions that go back thousands of years, okay, Um, and eat seasonally. Uh, So I would say that's my general approach. But in the morning, you know, honestly, I eat a very, very light breakfast and I love to have coffee. I lived in Italy uh, during a gap year before I went to medical school and I never, I developed a habit of, of drinking coffee. I take it straight. I don't put dairy in it. I don't put sugar in it. Um, and it turns out that there's a, that it's like an espresso is like packed with omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and, and so I'll, I'll have coffee uh, during the day. Later in the day, I'll actually switch to tea. Um, and because the caffeine doesn't bother me so much, um, I, I'm okay having tea, you know, even after dinner, I'll sip some tea. There's different kinds of tea, like a digestive tea. There's something called pu'er tea, P-U hyphen E-R-H, comes from a town of pu'er in China. It's a smoky fermented tea. It's a probiotic tea, by the way. So people don't realize that there are teas that are probiotic. And in fact, there's a bacteria, a new bacteria uh, that was um, discovered in pu'er tea, and it actually helps your metabolism. It helps to fight body fat, which is pretty cool. Um, so, um, but I also drink green tea and and oolong teas as well. So that's just kind of like the background of the beverage. And then water is what I'll also drink. So if you notice, I'm not talking about drinking soda. I don't drink soda. I'm not. I, I, I do. Well, I will occasionally sip some juices. Um, but but only like fresh squeezed juices, and I take the pulp with it. Um, I don't have the pure stuff. I want the fiber. I want the good stuff in it. And so these are. But but water is another kind of beverage I have, and I'm setting the stage for this because that's important. You know, like uh, beverages, what we drink actually are an important part of what we eat. A lot of people don't think about that, right? You know, what foods should I eat? And then you don't think talk about what people are drinking. But we need to drink. We need to hydrate every single day. So I wanted to start with that to let you know that I'm very conscious of what I drink. And what I take into my body. I am as well. And before we move into the food piece, I want to ask Mm. you about something. You mentioned Mm. quickly there, omega-3s, the connection with espresso. Talk more about that. Oh, no, no. Well, expre- I, I, I talked about chlorogenic acid with, uh, with coffee. And, and so um, I, I'm not aware of any omega-3s linked to coffee, uh, but, I do, but I do actually drink coffee uh, regularly. Um, that makes I, sense. I, I was confused on the connection there. Yeah. Um, and I try to get organic coffee, by the way, for the reasons I said earlier, which is that the organic actually has more of the bioactive, the chlorogenic acid. You know what? These things are all kind of rules of thumb, and I try to get it. If I 
have a cup of, you know, conventionally grown coffee, not going to hurt me. Um, I'm okay with it. I think you have to be reasonable at how you live your life. Um, and that's one of the things that I want people to know is that I don't go by hard, strict rules. You have to adapt to your circumstances. Every day is a little bit different than the previous day. But I do actually, I'm, I'm well aware of that. In terms of the foods that I eat, you know, um, I like to actually um, eat fruit, not too much of it. Um, you know, a single pear during a seasonal fruit, like a pear, um, actually will have six grams of dietary fiber. That's been shown, a medium-sized pear, actually to be helpful to your gut microbiome. It helps to grow a bacteria called ruminococcus. That ruminococcus has been shown to up your game in terms of immune defense so powerfully, by the way, that they've studied cancer patients who are eating about six grams of dietary fiber. And that ruminococcus that they're able to measure out of their poop actually correlates with their immune response to fight cancer. You get better survival, actually, if you actually eat six grams of dietary fiber a day, anywhere from six to 20. And so really powerful stuff. Like it's in the back of my mind. Um, and by the way, you know, for people who are interested, I, 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 uh, I, I put this kind of information out on a regular basis, every single week on a newsletter that I have on my website that's free. And, you know, please sign up for it because I'm drinking out of a fire hose every day, looking at this new research that's coming out and trying to figure out like, okay, so what's important for us to know? What's actionable? And so that's, that's the kind of information that I'll incorporate into my own life, into my own diet, right? So I'll try to have some fruit. Um, I don't eat a, a ton of fruit at a sitting and that's important. You know, um, if you eat, if you drink two cups of orange juice, by the way, it takes about eight oranges to make uh, two cups of juice, and that's got more sugar in it than uh, a, can, a can of soda. All right. So a lot of people don't realize that uh, just because it's coming out of a fruit doesn't make mean that it's healthy for you. But a little bit of an orange, I would eat a, I would eat a whole fresh orange, a clementine, um, uh, a Valencia orange. I'll just eat that, but, but make sure you have it with the pulp and the fiber because that's actually good for your microbiome. So I'm very aware of that, of that kind of a thing. Um, I like to have a light salad. I eat very light lunches. I like to have light salad. Um, I took an opportunity to have greens. Sometimes if I have a cooked green, um, uh, or vegetable, I'll take it from leftovers the night before and I'll heat it up. Uh, and uh, and eat that, and I I tend to eat a light ish lunch as well. Um, something that you know we can talk about you know if you like, or we can uh, talk about another juncture. Is really this whole idea of what's become quite trendy. We call it intermittent fasting. Um, eating lightly actually is equivalent to has has equivalence to fasting because it all has to do with the amount of calories that you're putting into your body. Eating lightly actually makes everything that we've ever studied in research live longer and live healthier. It's really when we actually have the overage of putting food and calories in our body that we overload. And I tend to have a little bit of a more filling dinner. And, you know, I like fish. Um, I like uh, uh, whole grains. I like legumes. Something that gets underrated, but that is super helpful, healthy and dirt cheap are beans. Canned beans, dried beans. You can buy them by the bushel by the bag and you can create all kinds of flavorful things with herbs and spices and cook them with broths you can make a stew out of it um, uh, uh, and and uh, and they're also good for sprinkling on the salads and so um, I, I do like to actually eat that I you know for so, and by the way the reason I'm mentioning all this in this order is that this is how I think about meal planning Okay. Um, notice I haven't yet gotten to the protein, the, the animal protein or the fish protein I'm actually going to eat because sometimes they don't add one. But if I add one, you know, I, I stay away from red meat. Uh, sometimes I'll have a little chicken. If I have chicken, I'll actually have the dark meat because the dark meat, which is usually from thigh, will normally contain more vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 is a bioactive in mostly in free range chickens that are actually allowed to eat normal things that chickens are supposed to eat, accumulate the vitamin K accumulates in their legs. And that's, and you can actually get that into your body that way. It starves cancer. It's really good for your circulation. Uh, so, you know, again, very mindful or fish. Now here's a little, um, here's another little kind of um, hack, I guess that I use. Now I really like to cook and I really, I don't love to eat, but I really enjoy food. I enjoy the history of food. I love the traditions of food. And more importantly, I enjoy good taste, right? So um, one of the things that you can do uh, that, that's a little, if you want to get omega-3s 
and you want something really tasty and you want to make it super convenient and not very expensive, people might laugh at this, but um, I will go and buy a tin of fish, uh, like tin fish in the middle aisles, not the stuff that looks like catfish, the cat food. Okay. That's what I used to think when I was a kid, that like, you know, the, the cans of tuna, when you open them up, they look, they look and smell exactly like cat food to me. Um, but actually in Europe, they have these beautiful thin tins of fish that have piquillo peppers and olive oil and garlic and lemon and herbs. It's a great way to, you know, it's a couple, a couple of bucks for a tin. You pop it open. It's already cooked, steamed, flavored, and literally you can eat it right out of the can and you get this amazing burst of protein, burst of flavor, and you get the omega-3s. And because when they're packed in olive oil, you also get the benefits of the bioactives in olive oil, which is a healthy fat like hydroxytyrosol, which is anti-inflammatory, good for your gut microbiome, and it actually helps your metabolism as well. I appreciate all the detail there. And there's three different things I want to hit on after you went through that. One being, you mentioned consuming grains. I'm curious, do you avoid gluten? I don't avoid gluten, although I know that it can be helpful for some people to avoid gluten. And again, let me explain my position on this. If you are an individual who has eaten foods that contain gluten and your your stomach is upset, uh, you could actually be gluten sensitive. And then in a minority of cases, you might actually have celiac disease, which is an essentially an autoimmune or cross-reaction of your own immune system triggered by gluten that actually attacks your own gut. In which case, by all means, what you need to do medically is actually just stay cut down or cut out gluten altogether because that continuous uh, uh, assault by your immune system, infl- inflammation on your gut, attacking prompted by gluten can be actually very um, harmful uh, to your overall long-term health. Um, but, you know, if you're not somebody who's sensitive to gluten, um, you know, many glutinous foods also carry along with them all these other bioactives. And so I think that, you know, this idea of like gluten being the devil, you know, got to stay away from gluten, all gluten-free, all glutens are, you know, it's so easy in the health and wellness space to demonize, find a term that may have, well-intentioned people find a term that may have some biological rationale in certain situations, but then they actually create a banner on it and then it gets spread as, you know, the, 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 the mother of all evils, you know? And it's not the case. So I will eat gluten. Um, I think that, you know, I'm, I generally eat whole, uh, whole uh, grain types of foods. And I don't eat a lot, a ton of carbs to begin with, but I, I, I will have that. And for me, it actually works for me. Uh, I don't, I'm not actually harmed by it. I, I do think that a lot of people, by the way, who say that they're gluten sensitive, um, it turns out, and this is not everybody, but some people, what they're sensitive when they're eating a, a package of pancake mix or whatever it is, and it's got a lot of gluten in it, right? Because of pancakes, of flour and pancakes. It turns out it's the, they're also sensitive to the chemicals and preservatives and the flavorings that are found in the pancake mix. So sometimes it's not just the, the gluten that's actually harmful. So again, uh, I think that there's all this vilification of things like lectins and vilification of, of, um, of, of phytoestrogens and, uh, uh, and, and gluten that the goddess in the details, and this is what food is medicine research and researchers like me are doing. We're really trying to wade in there and try to tease apart all the stuff so that people are not quite so confused. You mentioned lectins there quickly. Let's go deeper mm-hmm. into that. I know a lot of people who are aware of lectins trying to avoid them might be avoiding things like nightshades, or if they're consuming things like a tomato, taking the peel off, taking the seeds out, go deeper into that. Or you mentioned, oh, obviously yeah. from what you said there, I know you're not totally avoiding them, but are you aware and trying to limit them or how do you feel about all that? Okay. Same deal as gluten. Okay. I mean, actually even different than gluten. Um, so first of all, I'm a vascular biologist. I study blood vessels. And so I know a lot about lectins because lectins are very important for the integrity of our, our circulation. In fact, lectins are kind of the super glue that holds our tissues together. If you didn't have lectins, you'd literally fall apart. Okay. Like you would, you would just like fall up, like literally you'd fall apart. So lectins are actually who we, part of who we are. And there are hundreds of different kinds of lectins. And yeah, there are a few of them that are in fact poisonous. All right. But the whole, there's a whole mythology, okay, about lectins 
and their toxicity that, once again, I'm sure somebody well-intentioned started to put together the facts, and then it started to snowball into essentially an urban legend that got spread everywhere. And we know when you talk about lots of people being aware of lectins, what they're aware of, they're aware of the narrative behind lectins, but they're not, they're not really um, yet informed on the science behind lectins because most people don't know that without lectins, they fall apart. Okay. So let me kind of tell you, uh, I'll try to condense this into something that I think your, your listeners and viewers will watch you remember. Tomatoes are one of the culprits because it's got lectins and it's part of the nightshade family. Ooh, nightshades are deadly. Deadly nightshade. Got to stay away from that. Okay. And, and the lectins are deadly as well. And tomatoes are poisonous, right? Got to stay away from them. Let me give you a little historical fact because I, I'm a, I'm a big believer to understand our present and our future. It's very helpful to reflect on the past and where some of these, um, what, where some of the traditions and stories may have come from. Go back to the 1600s. Um, the Spaniards actually, um, went to Latin America and discovered tomatoes. They were not red tomatoes. They were, um, yellow and orange and they were called, colored, gold colored. So when they brought them back to the Mediterranean, to Spain and Italy, um, they didn't call them red. Um, they looked like apples, right? Tomato kind of look almost approximates an apple. They didn't call, they didn't, they called them, um, golden apples, pom apple, d'oro, pomodoro, right? Uh, Italian for, for tomato. And they called them golden apples. Okay. And later on, they were bred to be red and beautiful and beefy. Okay. In the beginning, the people who were in the Mediterranean who received uh, tomatoes and they were the fruits on a vine and the Europeans hadn't seen this plant before. They were curious what plant it was. So they sent the clipping of the vine up to Oxford in England to the scholars that were there studying it. So, um, and the scholars that were looking at the plants were like, hmm, we haven't seen this before. This leaf looked really unusual. And they tried to match it to other leaves. Closest leaf it actually looked like was the nightshade. And so they basically said, wrote back to say, I think it's related to the nightshade. All right. That, that's the link. Okay. There's a lot of nightshades out there. They all look the same. They're not all poisonous. Okay. Now, nightshade itself is poisonous, but even a poisonous nightshade is used, um, like the belladonna plant is actually used medically to treat diseases like atropine comes from, uh, the nightshade plant. So again, we don't fear it. We understand it. Now, back to the tomato. Only wealthy people in the beginning could actually have these um, beautiful gifts from Latin America, uh, these uh, uh, these tomatoes. And what they did is they they used them as objets de art to display their their influence and their wealth. So they took these tomatoes and they put them on pewter lead pewter trays. Okay. Now, what's in a tomato? It's, it's got acid in it. What does the acid do to the pewter and the lead? It sucks up the lead. And so now the tomatoes from these trays actually became lead poisoners. All right. And so then when they started eating the tomatoes, they got lead poisoning. And that's how they actually associated to tomato with toxicity with um, the nightshades. And this is a little bit of history a lot of people don't know about. So what do they do? Well, the wealthy people threw the tomatoes out the window. And where did they land? They landed in the, at the feet of the peasants. Peasants don't have pewter, fancy pewter lead trays. They just planted them in the ground. The tomatoes grew up. No lead, no pewter. Eat the tomato. They had no problems. And that's why tomato sauce sugo in Italian, for example, uh, is a peasant food. It comes from simple people. They never feared the peasant. The poor people never feared tomatoes. All right. So I'll stop there. But just to let you know that there's a context to all this. And there is a lectin. There are lectins in tomatoes. None of them are toxic. No, I really appreciate that history lesson. That's that's a lot of new stuff I didn't I've never heard of. Let's go into the red meat piece. When you're talking about your diet, you talked about how red meats is something you avoid. I can understand from a process standpoint, you know, meats that have been heavily processed, but let's get into the details. Talk about why, as somebody who is deep into the science, this is something you don't consume. Well, first of all, I'm not a vegan and I sort of am an omnivore. So I will sample a little bit of everything, but I would say mostly... I'm mostly a plant-based eater, okay? Um, 85% of my diet is plant-based. Um, uh, I try to cut down and or, or avoid red meat. It doesn't mean that I don't eat red meat, but it's very, very rare. Uh, I, I rarely eat red meat. 
but I try to avoid it because in general, you know, it doesn't make me feel that great. Um, red meat will change the gut microbiome pretty quickly. Like overnight, it'll start to change the gut microbiome in ways that are not quite so healthy. So I try to stay away from that. Uh, and um, uh, there's a lot of saturated fat in a lot of ways that red meats are, are prepared. I mean, the, you know, the beautiful ribeye steak with a lot of marbling packed with saturated fats. I mean, so look, I'm also somebody, besides being a scientist and a doctor, I appreciate food. So I can tell you why people love a uh, richly marbled steak. I mean, it tastes great. You know, you can really make it taste great, but it's not that good for you because of the marbling, because of that saturated fat. You keep on doing that every single day and you have a three-inch steak, you are just really doing your health and your cardiovascular disease, your heart health, a disservice, all right? Every now and then, if you have a little bit of it, don't eat too much of it. It's okay. Honestly, if you spend most of your time eating foods that prop up your health defenses, you could take a hit or two and, you're, and you'll rebound as long as you don't keep on doing it. So red meat, saturated fat. And by the way, there's another dimension to meat. Again, this is really the detail part of it. And I, I want people to think about this. How do you tend to prepare foods um, can actually make a big difference in terms of if, whether they're good or not so good for you. Chicken fried steak is a great example. You take red meat, okay, that's kind of a fatty, not a particularly good cut, not a particularly tasty cut. You bread it and you deep fry it, okay? Now you've taken it something that's not that great for you and you made it a lot worse, all right? And then people are eating that every single day. Not surprisingly, it's not that good for you. So, um, you know, what I tell people to do is um, if you're not a big fan of red meat, Cut it down or cut it out. Find other ways to substitute it. But I'm not a categorical person, right? So every now and then, you know, you might have a hankering for a piece of steak. Don't eat the whole ribeye. Have a couple of slices. And that's another little uh, tip that I try to give people. Some people really, really love red meat. And I try to tell people, try to cook it in the healthy ways, he healthiest way possible. Some people want to grill their meat. And I say, you know, when you actually... Uh, uh, grill meats, you're actually putting carcinogens on it. The smoke from the fire, the fat that the saturated fat that drips off the meat on the on the charcoal, the charcoal burns that uh, fat and it coats the meat with a carcinogen. And you know that that uh, the char of a really really amazingly grilled steak, you know, kind of medium rare on the inside, uh, the juicy and but charred on the outside to give you that taste. Okay, obviously I've had that kind of steak before. It tastes great. But not healthy for you because that char actually is a carcinogen. And with that smoke flavor also is a carcinogen. And you don't want to actually get the fake smoke flavor, which is made by chemicals, poured onto your meat either, right? So these are all the kind of details. So there are ways, by the way, to, to lower the harmful things on a grill even. If you marinate your meat in a marinade mostly with fruit, uh, chopped up fruit, pineapples, and you know peaches or whatever it is, you'll actually neutralize a lot of the carcinogens that might come onto it. So how you cook your meat actually can make a difference as well. And I'm not telling people categorically never eat meat. There are other people that will do that. I'm I'm sort of a reasonable guy, and I can appreciate when people really just really love to have a food. You know, people oh, – everyone has something fa that they love that's not so good for them. What I tell people is cut down or cut out the, re the things that are not so good for you. And if you're not – and if you're going to eat it, eat it occasionally. And if you're going to go for it, eat one that's actually really high quality and that you're going to, it's really going to satisfy that craving. You know, uh, let's talk about meat for one second. You know, I, I'm a researcher and I'm well aware of the innovation of plant-based meats. Okay. Interesting idea, right? You take plants and you break them down and you reform them and you add all kinds of stuff to them to make them taste like meat. Um, and you can even grow meat on a, in a, in a glass dish to create, you know, lab grown steaks and fish and chickens and ducks even. It's kind of crazy, but I'm familiar with that because th that's what we used to do in a lab uh, to study hum to do human research. Well, you know, the plant-based meats are really ultra processed foods. And if you're somebody who doesn't want to, who wants to avoid GMO, you know, genetically modified foods, the ones that bleed, well, they engineer the gene to make them bleed. The plants don't bleed. There's no blood, but they actually engineer a gene for hemoglobin. And so here's a thing that I would say, you know, rather than switch from your hamburger or your steak to a plant-based meat, you know, just go for whole foods and try to find the healthiest combination. If you want to eat a steak every now and then, 
just get the best damn steak you can actually find and get a small piece of it. Cook it the way, just the way you want it and, and eat it, enjoy it, but don't substitute it with an ultra processed food either. That's not necessarily good for you. I'm glad you touched on GMO there. And this is something that ties back to organic, what we talked about earlier, because when you're buying organic, supposedly it's, it's non-GMO. Let's talk about GMO, zoom out a little bit from a broader perspective. When you're, you know, at the grocery store or the Asian market buying produce, are you totally avoiding GMO or how do you feel about that? You know, I think there's a practical part of me and then there's sort of a principal part of me. I I would like to avoid GMO foods whenever I can, um, but I think they're really hard to avoid. I think like it or not, um, most of the foods that we actually would encounter have some genetic modification uh, uh, legacy uh, attached to them. Uh, uh, and some of the uh, uh, genes that have been used actually make the plant more robust and more resistant to climate or pesticides or, or sorry, or, or pests as well without necessarily doing clear cut damage. So that's the principle of me. Like, you know, I, I'd rather avoid it if I can. But I think a lot of plants, even the ones that are labeled GMO, it's probably they are some element of GMO. Who's going to check? Who's going to tell you? You're just going to believe what's on a label or what the grocer tells you? If you go to a farmer's market, you know, it looks more natural and looks more organic. The dude might have grown it in his backyard or in his field. Could also have some impact of G- GMO as well. So I think it's very, very difficult to avoid. But I can tell you, I definitely go out of my way to, if I spot that there's something clearly genetically modified, uh, I, I will I will avoid it if I see it. You touched on cooking methods, and I think that's really important. We we talked about that. That's actually where I was going to go. But there's also this other side to it. I want to make sure we touch on quickly as well. And that is, if you're using the right cooking method in cooking certain foods, you're actually enhancing certain properties. And we can come back to our friend the tomato. That's a good example with the lycopene. Where cooking actually unlocks that nutrient and makes it more bioavailable. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, most people feel like, you know, if you cook, you might be breaking down the good stuff. And yeah, sure. I certainly remember my grade school cafeteria, you know, having that overboiled vegetable, that limp green beans or whatever it is, you know, they they clearly have had the heck cooked out of them and the heck including the nutrients, right? I mean, there's not a lot left uh, and they don't taste very good either. But it turns out that some uh, 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 compounds actually are unlocked, like tomatoes. You take lycopene, uh, and that's the bioactive in a tomato, and you pick out a tomato off the vine and eat it like an apple or cut it up in a salad, a fresh tomato salad. You get the vitamins, you get the hydration, you get some of the dietary fiber. The lycopene, you'll swallow it, but it's in a chemical form that is not that easy for your body to absorb. In fact, for every mouthful of, of tomato you eat, you probably your body will only absorb about 20% of the lycopene. Rest of it isn't easy for your body to absorb. And so uh, it's, it's in a chemical formation. So how do you get it to absorb it? You heat it up. You heat the lycopene, simmer it at a low temperature. You'll slowly change the natural chemical into a form your body loves to absorb. And you can actually, um, just with simmering tomato sauce for about 20 minutes, Okay, think about grandma's tomato recipe, slow cooking on the stove. You can then get your body to absorb 80% of it. So that's an example of where cooking actually activates the bioactive so your body can get more of it. When you went through a typical day of what you'd eat, you talked about breakfast, you'd have something light at that time, and then later touched on intermittent fasting and calorie restriction. I want to take some time and, and dig into the two there. Intermittent fasting, something that in the health and wellness space right now is really popular, especially when it comes to weight loss and other health benefits. You're obviously somebody that isn't practicing that yourself, and it sounds like you're more into the calorie restriction. So I'd love for you to get into the two different aspects there and why you feel the way you do. Well, I mean, and this is really a focal point of the my next book that will come out next March. Um you know, what is the real science? You know, one of the themes we've been talking about is that lots of things that people are doing, lots of things that people believe in, a lot of things that people are acting on in the wellness and health space 
I come at this from a scientist to say, you know, what's a myth and what's real science? What is data driven? Well, it turns out that for intermittent fasting, it's something that is trendy, but actually researchers have known about interfasting, intermittent fasting for a long time um, and caloric restriction. And they're, they're, they're very cl- close and different. I'll try to give you the, the short answer from this and we could do a whole, a uh, whole session just on these, um, uh, these concepts alone. But in a nutshell, um, uh, intermittent fasting means that you're not eating all the time. Intermittently fasting, look, when we go to bed at night and we're not eating, we're intermittently fasting. And you get up in the morning, what do you do when you eat something? You have breakfast, break fast. You're breaking your intermittent fast and you're going on and eating. And in fact, we're intermittently fasting between breakfast and lunch and between lunch and dinner. The problem is really um, we've turned into a snacking culture and we've got abundance of food. So we're eating all the time and putting stuff in our body all the time. Mindless eating, not giving your body, your metabolism a chance to relax, chill out, reboot itself. Um, uh, and that overload that, that causes a metabolic overload that taxes your system and it screws up the hormone that your normal healthy fat makes to make it difficult to lose weight um, uh, and, and actually to have a hormonal cycle uh, that's actually your, your body's hormones for metabolism are knocked out of whack. So intermittent fasting is actually really, really helpful. We do it normally. And people that are doing intermittent fasting, with you know, the, the, the different time frames, they're doing it in a more disciplined fashion. But um, and we can talk about this another time. But I mean, really, that's a that that's a um, uh, that is one mode of actually res- uh, uh uh, limiting the times that you are actually putting fuel into your body. Now, caloric restriction is related but different. Caloric restriction just means I, I'm trying to make things easy for people to understand. Um, but I, and this is how I first understood it, and it's still the case. Caloric restriction is exactly what it sounds like: eating less calories. All right. Here's an example: if you sit down and you had a cake in front of you and you ate the entire cake and not just a piece. You're not clearly not restricting your calorie, but if you actually ate uh, a whole bowl of of, uh, of beans, okay, uh, and you you had a uh, a, a serving, a, a couple of you know a small serving of it, um, that that's healthy for you. But if you ate the entire pot of beans, you'd be also also overloading calories in your body as well. Even though there's some good stuff, you're actually overloading your system. So. Um, Calorie restrictions is basically saying don't overload your body, and it's beneficial. And think about it this way. It's like going to the filling station if you drive a car using gasoline still and filling up your tank. What do you do? Uh, Your tank's running on empty. You got to fill it up. You go there. You put the nozzle into the tank, and you click it, and uh, it's running, filling up, filling up, filling up. That's the equivalent of when we're eating food, all right? Now, what happens when it's like when it, the tank's filled, there's a, the nozzle has a sensor that'll click off when the tank is full and you're not overloading it. And you put the tank back and you drive off and you're starting to burn down the fuel. That's basically like eating a normal size meal and going off and doing your daily activities, including a little physical activity, a little exercise. All right. Now, what happens is that in an era of abundancy and a society where there's food all around all the time, it's like filling your car with gas all the time. And not only are you filling up the car with gas all the time, all right, um, you're actually overloading it. So imagine that that little clicker that stops the fuel coming out, imagine that was broken. And now you're just pumping the fill and the gas tank is full. What happens next? The gas comes rushing out of the tank, spills down the side of the car, gets on your shoes, and it is a, it's a lethal hazard. It's a fire hazard. That's what happens when we do caloric overload. And so when people talk about caloric restrictions, I try to tell people, look, it's kind of like overfilling your, your car with gas. You don't want to be doing that. It's dangerous for you. And rather than thinking about it like some kind of like, um, rigid thing that you have to follow and you need to calculate it. Like I know there's biohackers that are, that are into that. And I, I I credit them for doing that. Um, But you know, for most normal people who don't want to be counting their calories and measuring and weighing their food, what I would say is that give your body a break, give your metabolism a break and don't overload your gas tank because that's actually what eating calories are. It's putting fuel into your body. You don't want to overload it because just like anything else, if you overload your fuel tank, it becomes a danger. 
And earlier you talked about the Grand Slam foods. You gave a couple examples. They make it a lot easier too. So if there's foods like chocolate or green tea, you know, if you can incorporate that, you're going to cover a lot of the different defense systems, all of them in those cases. That's right. And, you know, and, and if you enjoy them, if you, that the key thing is that, you know, you have to love it. Like I, you know, one of my, one of my mantras, Jesse, that I tell people is that I always tell people, my motto is to love your food, to love your health. Most people think about health and food as diametrically opposed. You got to cut out the stuff you love in order to have better health, right? Um, I'm not that way. I'm the opposite. I'm saying, find the foods that you love that actually are good for your health and then lean into them. Because if you can actually do that, those foods will bring you not just health, but they'll bring you the joy. And then it's something you like to do so you can maintain it for over the course of a lifetime. This idea of yo-yo dieting, doing extreme diets, you know, I don't have a problem if you want to go on them, but they're really hard to maintain. And not all of them are good for your health. Let's get into specific foods that boost immunity. We went on the other end of the spectrum. Say somebody listening right now, they are in a home where a lot of people are sick and they're like, you know, I really need to ramp up my immune system right now and I don't have an autoimmune condition. What can they, what can they consume? Well, turns out that there are um, really, really powerful polyphenols that are present in blueberries. They're called anthocyanins. And in fact, it's a, it's a natural dye that makes blueberries blue. It also kind of gives a purple red kind of color. Um, uh, so blackberries, uh, lingonberries, um, you know, any of these dark uh, red berries will actually have this anthocyanin. And anthocyanins actually boost your immune system. They not only lower inflammation, but they boost your immune cell system, the system of the cells of the immune system. They arm the super soldiers, make them perform better. And it turns out that um, eating just like a, a cup full of blueberries a day, cup and a third of blueberries a day, can actually increase your immunity by about 30%. Okay. And that's not too easy. That's not too, that's not, that, that's not too difficult to actually eat, um, you know, a cup and a half of blueberries. You know, you have a bowl in front of you for breakfast while you're reading the newspaper or flipping through your, the news on your phone. It's e pretty easy to actually eat that. Um, what I would say is make sure you're not putting sugar on it, like added sugars, like enjoy really ripe seasonal foods. Um, but by the way, you can also get frozen blueberries. Uh, if they're flash frozen, they'll also contain the same nutrients, maybe not as, perfectly good as the fresh blueberries, but they'll still have them. So you can make a smoothie with frozen blueberries in the winter, and you'll also get that kind of uh, benefit. Another food that actually boosts your immune system that's quite remarkable in my mind is broccoli and broccoli sprouts. Now, broccoli, you know, our moms always told us to eat broccoli. And when we ate, bro you know, like when you were in a school cafeteria in high school, you know, or whatever, junior or high school, like everybody bummed out when they had the treetops you know, uh, in the, in the, uh, in the, you know, when you were taking out the, the food line, right? Well, it turns out that there's something really amazing in broccoli in those treetops. It's called sulforaphanes. Those sulforaphanes actually give broccoli its characteristic taste. Um, and it's anti-androgenic. It starves cancer of the blood supply. Um, sulforaphanes also, um, uh, boost your immunity. They actually up your immune function, help you make better antibodies. Uh, they, they help you fight viruses and bacteria really better. And they are present in the treetops, but turns out they're also present in the stem of the broccoli. So most people don't realize this, but when you buy the frozen version of broccoli and you open it from a grocery store and you open it up the bag, it's only the treetops and everyone's the same size perfectly. But if you've ever been to a farmer's market, um, you'll see, you'll know that the broccoli is actually this gigantic long, um, a plant with a gigantic stem and the trees are just a little thing at the little top. I've done research on broccoli stems and broccoli tops and the good stuff, the sulforaphane is present in the tree stem. So please eat that. But it's tw there's tw two times as much in the broccoli stem. So um, go to different cultures and you see how people eat broccoli stems. They don't just eat the florets. They'll slice up the stems. They'll saute them as well. You can um, put them in a fruit processor and make a broccoli stem soup. Um, that's how broccoli soup is, is made. Really delicious. Okay. Now, those sulforaphanes are present in the grown-up broccoli. But did you know that the baby broccoli, broccoli sprouts, 
These are just hatched from the broccoli seedlings, not hatched, sprouted, about three to four day old. So if you go to, actually, I, you know, the most of the grocery stores around where I live now, just a regular average grocery store. If you actually go to the sections for sprouts, oftentimes they'll have broccoli sprouts now. Okay, kind of nutty flavor, doesn't taste like a grown-up broccoli. Um, good for sprinkling onto a salad. You could put it into a, a smoothie. Well, it turns out researchers have actually looked at this. It, these are super powerful immune system boosters because the sulforaphanes in baby broccoli are 100 times more concentrated than the adult broccoli. It's like the broccoli was born with all the sulforaphanes it's ever going to have in this little sprout. And as it gets bigger, it just distributes all the sulforaphanes out to the rest of the plant. So a study was done at the University of North Carolina looking at young 20-year-olds getting a uh, just a flu vaccine. You know, it's a fall season, get a flu vaccine. And what they did is they gave everybody the flu vaccine, but half of the people, in addition to the flu vaccine, they gave them a cup of broccoli sprout shake. So they put the broccoli sprouts, made a shake out of it. The, the, the kids actually sucked on the, the shake, drank it down, and then they uh, just did it for four days. And they tested the immune system of these people before and afterwards and compared the two groups. And it turns out that the immune system of both groups actually went up after the flu vaccine, just like you'd expect. But the people who had the flu vaccine and also had the broccoli sprouts, they had 22 times better immune boosting due to the broccoli sprout shake than just the vaccine alone. And when they swabbed their noses to look for the flu virus, there was almost nothing in the people who actually also had the broccoli shake, while there was some particles still in the people that actually just had the vaccine alone. So that's another powerful example of how foods can actually boost our immune system. I know we got to part ways soon, but before we do, I want to talk a bit about telomeres. And this is under the DNA protection defense system. These are the little caps on the end of our DNA and they help protect the DNA. So I'd love for you to talk about a little bit in more detail what they are, why they're important, and how we go about eating certain foods to protect those. Okay. Well, there's a, you know, we could talk a whole hour uh, about telomere. So I'll try to boil it down to um, sort of like the, the nugget that is a take home practical nugget. So, um, our DNA, every, every cell in our body, remember I told you we have 40 trillion cells, every single cell in our body, if you were to take a cell out and look at it under the microscope and take uh, microscopic tweezers and open up the cell and pull out the DNA, every single cell has six feet of DNA in our body. Okay. That's our genetic code. It turns out that our genetic code is super important. 2% of that six feet, okay, is actually used to code for proteins. The rest of it is actually all in, in, uh, uh, helps our coordinate our immune defenses and to coordinate other parts of our body uh, to work. All right. So that those instructions are absolutely critical not to mess with. Why? Remember, we thought at the very beginning, you make a mistake with that DNA. You screw with that. You mess it up. And it's going to actually turn into a mutation. Then you get the microscopic cancer. Health defenses keep it healthy. Well, in order to help protect the DNA from damage, you have to put caps on the end of it. So they're like the um, caplets on the end of a shoelace. You know, when you go out, go out to buy a pair of brand new tennis shoes, right? And you you slip your foot in there, and the laces are on the side. And then you see when you pull the laces out, they've got the plastic caps. And that those plastic caplets protect the lace from fraying. And if you get an old pair of tennis shoes where your caplets are gone and you actually see the shoelaces, that man, is it hard to rethread it, okay? And eventually the whole shoelace will come apart. So that's what the telomeres are, the caps, the protective caps at the end of our DNA, of the six feet strand. As we age, our DNA shrinks. That six foot thing gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And, our, and that's called cellular aging. So the difference between our grandmother, who might be cute but wrinkly, okay, um, adorable and wrinkly. Uh, well, why is it? Why is that aging happening? Well, her cells aren't functioning as well as they used to. Why? Because all those telomeres um, uh, have worn down the cell, and, and, this, and DNA is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So, uh, our body tries to slow that down, but foods can help our body protect our DNA and prevent that slowing. Green tea will prevent slowing the of uh, tree nuts will prevent slowing. Uh, olive oil 
Uh, having olive oil will prevent slowing down. Um, uh, uh, here's my favorite because I got a, I got some of it right here. This is a cup of coffee. All right, coffee has been shown not only to slow down cellular aging, but actually to lengthen, make your telomeres longer. That's like making a new cap, not just preventing the cap from shortening, but actually making a new cap uh, to the to to the to the DNA protection. So that's really cool as well. So again, foods as medicine is really a metaphor that uh, unlike medicines that we only give to people when they're sick, foods are a kind of medicine that we can take all day long when we're healthy. And in fact, they help us stay healthy. They're the medicines we take when we don't, so that we don't need a prescription medicine. And, you know, like uh, something I always talk about is that, you know, for many, many years, people were saying, if you really think about diet, nutrition for healing, that's called alternative medicine. Nah, the real medicine is a prescription. All right. Uh, and what I will tell you based on the science that's happening now, and like I said, I'm a MD who does biotechnology. Like I'm, I'm like the guy who's I, I, like I do serious research in the lab. I can tell you that what we're, what I believe is going to happen in a decade from now, in the future, is that the um, that food is food is medicine is just going to be incorporated into our everyday healthcare system. People are going to know how to do it. Nurses are going to know how to do it. Doctors are going to know how to do it. And in fact, the people who are practicing the future alternative medicine are going to be those doctors who only prescribe drugs. That's going to be the alternative. So we're going to turn this whole baby on its head, and it's going to be the science that's going to take us there. Well, let's attack weight loss from a whole different area now. And this is angiogenesis, an area mm. that you're definitely an expert in. And this ties back to a lot of our previous conversations where there are certain foods that can affect blood vessels, either to create more or to lessen and prevent the creation of new vessels. And the reason why this is important in the past, we've talked about it from a cancer perspective, but tying it into our new topic of metabolism and weight loss, fat as an organ needs a blood supply. That's so right. if we can attack that blood supply, we can attack weight loss from that angle. So I'll have you take that and explain yeah. in greater detail what I was getting at there. Okay. Every normal, healthy organ in your body requires a blood supply, including your heart, your kidneys, your liver, and your body fat. Remember, body fat's normal, healthy organ in your body. You need some blood supply. But when fat starts to grow excessively, too much fat starts to grow because you've overeaten. Now you need to clone your and stem cells need to make more fat cells to fill up and load up with, with fuel. And now you and you haven't fin finished loading up it. You need another uh, fuel tank. Now you're going to clone it again with uh, more stem cells. Now you got another one. Keep on adding up that 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 uh, copy pasting of the fuel cells of body fat, yeah, of fat fat cells. And now you've got a mound of fat that has outgrown the original fat that is healthy. Now, just like a tumor, when it actually starts to expand abnormally. It requires a blood supply in order to really support its bigger size. So too does fat need a blood supply to go beyond what it normally wants to have. Now, this is actually where when you expand your body fat, excessive body fat, your fat is desperately growing bigger and bigger and bigger, and it needs more blood supply. So it's, it's, it's whipping around looking for trying to grow new blood vessels. Usually it grows faster than the blood vessels can actually feed it. Before, you know, the androgenesis, the growth of blood vessels isn't fast enough. And so the center of this expanding fat starts to die. It doesn't have enough blood vessels. And so when fat, like a tumor, this happens in a tumor as well. So in a tumor, when the center of the tumor doesn't get enough blood vessels, because of blood flow, because it's tumors expanding too large, what happens is that that kind of necrotic or like a kind of rotting center, dying center, suddenly attracts inflammatory cells. It becomes very inflammatory. And the inflammation in both tumors and fat actually isn't just stuck in, 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 the, in the mass, expanding mass. It leaks out, and now you've got inflammation spilling out from your growing fat everywhere in your body. And as we know, inflammation in the body is very helpful when you have it in small amounts in the right place at the right time, then it goes away. But if you have chronic leaking overflowing inflammation in your body that goes everywhere. Now it's a setup for autoimmune disease, uh, diabetes, uh, for cancer, heart disease, 
uh, vision loss, all Alzheimer's, all kinds of really harmful conditions associated with inflammation, which we know is so important. So one of the things that is actually interesting that we're tearing a page from the playbook of cancer medicine. So in cancer, you can actually give medicines that can cut off the blood supply to tumors. There are foods that can do the same thing. And so what's really interesting is there are certain foods that can help tame excessive body fat that can cut off the blood supply that cut prevent the tumors from getting bigger and bigger just because they, they don't have enough oxygen. Eventually, they're going to start to shrink. And that's an anti-angiogenic approach to body fat, to obesity. And that's been shown in a lab to work really well. When you take a look at the foods that actually um, are also useful for shrinking body fat and improving your metabolism, exactly the same foods that have anti-angiogenic, tumor-starving, and now fat-starving properties as well. Let's come back to the microbiome piece, another defense system. We mm -hmm. quickly touched on it before, but let's get really practical and specifically from a metabolism weight loss piece, what we want to do to support the microbiome and how the physiology works there. Okay. Look, um, almost everyone who's interested in health and wellness has heard of a microbiome. Microbiome is gut bacteria. It's actually bacteria outside of our gut as well, but most of it's in our gut. And, you know, a lot of people don't actually appreciate where in the gut the microbiome actually is located. It's in the last part of your gut in a little pouchy area in your colon called the cecum. That's spelled C-E-C-U-M. Most of our gut bacteria is actually found in that spot. It's kind of like a, the, the, the cave of, uh, of the, the, the corridor of the microbiome. That's an ecosystem. And that ecosystem is composed of oh, somewhere about almost 33, 39 trillion bacteria. Now, we know some of them, but there's more that we're discovering all the time. And by the way, it's not just bacteria. It's viruses. It's fungi. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's archaea. There's a whole other species of organism that lives in our gut. But let's talk about bacteria for a second. We now know that certain bacteria activate our metabolism. All right. Uh, and when you're missing those bacteria, one of them is called Acromancia mucinophila. When you're missing that healthy bacteria, what happens is your metabolism doesn't function properly. And so you're not drawing in energy the right way. Your fat starts to grow out of control. Uh, you know, you've got, you're not, not, even when you're eating regularly, you might not actually absorb all your energy efficiently. And so you can actually, your blood sugars can rise. You become, meta, you get developed metabolic syndrome. And so the lack of certain bacteria we know um, can be problematic. And there are certain foods that can grow back acromancia, like pomegranate juice, cranberry juice, uh, Concord grape juice, for example, are, are, are ways to actually grow back and help nurture some of these bacteria. We also know, by the way, that when you have extra body fat, remember I told you that inflammation leaks out? I mean, th think about like a, a garden hose. You're filling up a, a, a pot in your garden and you forget about it and the, 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 the water overflows the pot and now it's everywhere. It's got dirt everywhere as well. If your fat inflammation spills out over the sides and leaks everywhere, very, very dangerous, by the way, that situation. It actually is po that, that fat's poison in your blood, all right? It can poison your liver. Um, that's called non alcoholic fatty liver disease, leaking fat that poisons our organs. Highly inflammatory situation, all right? It turns out that our gut microbiome, healthy gut microbiome, all right? not poisoned with too much sugar, artificial sweeteners, ultra processed foods, all the things that, are, sodas, things that really harm our gut microbiome. If you have a good, healthy, vibrant gut microbiome, if you have too much body fat and the inflammation leaks up, guess what? Your gut microbiome, which is a health defense system, lowers inflammation. It basically is like the fire, um, like the fire department to help put out the inflammation, put out that fire, all right? If your gut microbiome is damaged, it can't put out that fire. And, not only, and now, not only is your metabolism screwed up, all right, and your fat is starting to grow and, and, and mess up your metabolism further, but the inflammation is leaking out, and now you don't have the fire department to put out that fire. So for somebody who feels like right now their microbiome is, you know, all over the place and they've destroyed a lot of it living an unhealthy lifestyle, you mentioned the specific, I think you said cranberry juice, pomegranate juice, Concord grape juice, when it comes to the acromancia. What do you recommend in a general sense to rebuild up that diversity of the microbiome to help tame inflammation as a whole? Yeah, very important. And, and this is true for every aspect of your health, and it helps you resist virtually every type of disease that's known. 
And that is take care of your gut microbiome like you would if you had a pet dog or a pet cat or a goldfish or a parakeet, which is that you've got to feed, you got to feed your critters. And the thing is that our gut microbiome is really part of who we are. When we eat food, every decision we make of the food we eat, our human cell, our human bodies are going to absorb some of the nutrients, but anything that we don't absorb goes down, down, down to your cecum, the part of your colon where your gut bacteria, and it feeds your gut bacteria. So you don't want to actually, you want to cut down or cut out the foods that actually harm your gut bacteria. Do not piss off. Do not, uh, do not, um, uh, do not uh, chase away those good neighbors. You don't want to evacuate them from the neighborhood. You want to keep them there and you want to keep them healthy, feel secure. So what are the foods that actually um, uh, are, are harm them? Too much alcohol, sodas harm them, ultra-processed foods, uh, ultra-processed meats. Look, I mean, all the things that we already know that people are bludgeoning us over the head with that are not so healthy, we now know one of the reasons that they're not so healthy is they really kind of destroy they damage our gut microbiome. So more importantly, what are the foods that can restore that for somebody that goes, well, you know, am I screwed because I've been messing with my, 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 my gut microbiome is not so healthy? No way. We have really amazing resiliency to grow back a good neighborhood and get those good characters back in our neighborhood. So what are some general principles of doing this? Well, one thing I'll tell you from a beverage perspective, what should I be drinking uh, to help build back my gut microbiome? I call it my book, The Holy Trinity of Beverages. These are the beverages that can really do no wrong in and of themselves. Water, okay, you can hydrate your gut microbiome, just like to be dried out. Tea, green tea, slightly fermented tea, like oolong, black tea, even like an ultra-fermented probiotic tea. There's actually a probiotic tea, which is cool, called Pu-er, P-U apostrophe E-R-H, E-E-R-H. Pu-er tea is an actual fermented tea that has its own tea bacteria. That's a healthy bacteria, good for your gut microbiome. Coffee, another great beverage that actually feeds your gut microbiome with its bioactives. These are all prebiotics that are found in uh, uh, in these beverages. So you got to drink something rather than you know, like swap out the soda and go for water, tea, or coffee. That's one way of actually you know starting to make a, a, a concrete step towards helping your gut microbiome recover. Second, you know, as a general rule, your gut microbiome loves to eat fiber. The food you feed it, the kibble, you know, think about your dog, uh, your pet dog, you know, whether it's dry food or wet food or raw food. Look, what bac- gut bacteria likes, they, they like fiber, dietary fiber. Where do you get dietary fiber? Greens, salad greens, uh, carrots, even mushrooms, soft, soft things in a produce section also have dietary fiber. Kiwi, a great source of dietary fiber. Some of the softest vegetables you you can find, avocado. Avocado's got a ton of dietary fiber. So it's not just stringy stuff that you have to pick out of your teeth or floss out of your teeth, but even uh, an avocado. You do an avocado toast for breakfast, you're getting some dietary fiber. You are feeding your gut microbiome. And so anybody who's like, you know, what can I do? I I don't know. I must have screwed my gut microbiome. I don't feel so good. Look, first... Cut down or cut out the things that are harming your microbiome. That's mostly the ultra-processed foods and the sodas and all that kind of stuff. And start adding in some of the stuff that's good for you. And it's a lot of it. And this is what I write about. I take people in my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, right through the grocery store as if you were like riding in a cart, like when when you were a kid and you rode in the grocery cart and your mom pushed you along. In my book, I want people to realize that in that second section of my book, I invite you into the grocery cart and I take you through an average grocery store and literally just like kind of kibitz and whisper in your ear what to put in a cart that can help your metabolism fight body fat um, and improve your inner health. Dr. Lee, one of the common topics that comes up lately on the podcast when it comes to the microbiome is the short chain fatty acids. Mm -hmm. So feeding the gut microbiome, they're creating these short chain fatty acids. What I'm curious about is, when it comes to those specifically, do they have a role in metabolism and weight loss? Absolutely. So first of all, the let me kind of give you the uh, an easy to understand analogy of of dietary fiber feeding your gut healthy gut bacteria. Now your gut bacteria need to eat, so you're feeding them the dietary fiber and other natural bioactives that are prebiotics. Uh, and, the, and the bacteria live in your colon. They live in your gut in that area called the cecum. So we, as humans, provide room, cecum, and board, 
prebiotics to our gut bacteria, right? So we're basically landlords for our gut bacteria. And the rent they pay, okay, uh, uh, in exchange for, um, you know, uh, being in our, uh, being uh, boarders in our body is they pay us with short chain fatty acids. So when we feed them the right way. They hand us a check every single day. And that check, that rent check is actually called short chain fatty acids. It turns out those short chain fatty acids do a lot of the good stuff um, that the gut, gut, gut bacteria actually do. They streamline our metabolism, make our body more sensitive to insulin. They lowers inflammation, helps our body heal, sends signals to our brain. Short chain fatty acids are, are sort of the, um, they are the, um, uh, the units to communicate. That's the currency that uh, our gut microbiome uh, gives us. And so, you know, one thing that we're beginning to do is to real- realize that we can measure short chain fatty acids in the body. It's a medical part thing so far, but eventually what I'm excited by is this idea that we are not, you know, we can start to, we already can do this. We can at least get a dipstick picture of what our gut microbiome is. You can get your mi- bi- stool microbiome measured. And in the future, we're going to start to take a look at short chain fatty acids and know how well we're doing. Earlier, when we were talking about a specific strain, we mentioned acromancia when it comes to metabolism. Another one you mentioned in the book is lactobacillus rotori. Mm-hmm. So let's talk right. about why that one fits into this whole conversation. And you did give us specific examples of different drinks we could have to help grow the acromancia. What can we do to get the lactobacillus rotori going? All right. Well, first of all, lactobacillus rotori. Lactobacillus is a um, um, very common type of normal, healthy gut bacteria, but it's pretty sensitive to antibiotics. And so lactobacillus rotori is just one member of the lactobacillus family. It used to be present in all of us, and we used to get it um, uh, from, from our moms, Right. So basically, moms had lactobacillus ruteri in her colon and about eight months into pregnancy, um, uh, her uterus uh, uh, coordinates and sends a signal to her colon and says, hey, you know, we're about a month away from delivering a baby. It's time to move some lactobacillus so the baby will have some lactobacillus. So that's how we got it. Now, it's amazing. Um, there are these little blood cells called, called neutrophils. Um, uh, and uh, now we know that these neutrophils um, go down to the colon at around eight months. And they basically are like Ubers. And they pick up lactobacillus into the cell like an Uber driver. And the Uber driver moves from the colon and it navigates its way to the breast by the nipple. And it drops off the passenger, the lactobacillus, by the nipple. And so when the baby crawls up, comes out and crawls up to the mom after you know, after some skin time to actually have the first suckle of milk. That used to be the point at which moms squirted some of her lactobacillus ruteri into the baby's gut. So generation after generation after generation, that's how we used to have it. Now, that was before about 1930 or 40. After 1930 or 40, the advent of antibiotics came into play and babies were getting treated with antibiotics and moms were getting treated with antibiotics and antibiotics are life-saving. But one of the sort of the side effects, the collateral damage is it kills off lactobacillus ruteri. So now it's hard to know who has it and who doesn't have it because, gosh, we haven't been even thinking about this unintended consequence of treating infection with antibiotics, right? So overuse of antibiotics. Now here, even judicious use of antibiotics can damage our that member of our gut microbiome. Why is that important? Because research I and other people have done has shown that lactobacillus ruteri in the gut does a lot of really important things. One thing it does is it actually speeds up healing. You have surgery, you have trauma, uh, you know, like you you cut yourself, you, 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 you have a car accident, you fall off a bike, scrape your knee. Lactobacillus actually speeds up the healing in your body. In fact, it can double the rate of healing in your body when it's actually there in good form. Other thing it does is it actually helps us support your immune system. My gosh, you doesn't want to have a good immune system. You don't have any lactobacillus, you're going to be you're going to be at a disadvantage when it comes to your immune system. Lactobacillus ruteri actually in the lab has shown been shown to resist the development of colon cancer and breast cancer. How about them apples? Like, oh my gosh, here's a bacteria that's been shown to resist the development. It's not a cure, but it actually helps your body defend against colon and breast cancer. Whoa, that's an important bacteria. And then the other thing that's even you know more profound to me is that lactobacillus ruteri has been shown to text message your brain. You've heard about the gut-brain connection, right? People talk about that. Lactobacillus is one of the actors, the good actors, that text message your brain to release social hormones that control our mood. Lactobacillus helps our brain secrete 
dopamine, serotonin. I mean, all these things that psychiatrists and therapists prescribe drugs for, our gut bacteria writes that prescription invisibly, you know, by sending a message to our brain. Our gut bacteria, lactobacillus, also um, helps our brain release a social hormone called oxytocin. Now, oxytocin happens to be that same hormone that when the baby comes out of the womb and has the first suckle on the nipple to, to breastfeed, there's a huge rush of oxytocin, um, not surprisingly, that goes whoosh. It helps their, your breast ducts, um, the milk ducts contract to squirt that milk and lactobacillus into the baby's gut. So that makes a lot of sense, given the story I just told you. But oxytocin is also a feel-good hormone. So if you haven't seen a friend and you're picking him or her up at the airport and you see them coming out of the, the arrival gate and you, you run up to give them a hug and you feel great about it, that is oxytocin, that feeling, that feel good. Um, we, uh, another time oxytocin comes up, when you have a kiss, not just a peck on the cheek, but a good, deep French kiss, that incredible feeling, that's oxytocin being released from your brain. Another time you get oxytocin, when you have an orgasm, for a few seconds, this massive explosion of oxytocin comes surging out of your brain. That's how important lactobacillus is. Lactobacillus ha- helps our brain secrete those natural mood enhancing chemicals, right? Here we are talking about like mood enhancers and psychotropics, mushrooms and things like that. Here's actually a natural role that our gut bacteria plays and lactobacillus ruderize one of them. So if we've depleted that through, say we haven't gotten breastfed as a kid and we never picked that up, or I think you mentioned antibiotics will destroy it. Is there certain foods that we can ingest to rebuild that up or is there a supplement we can take or so, what do we do? So, so so the good news is that there are supplements for lactobacillus ruteri that you, you know, you can take it. I actually take it. I take one of these every day. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting paid to endorse anything, but I can tell you because I did the research and I, when I looked at that research, I'm like, holy cow, like, why wouldn't I take that lactobacillus ruteri supplement? The other reason I take it and I take it at night after I brush my teeth, by the way, and I, t- I don't take the adult version, by the way, I take the children's chewable version. And, and when people realize I'm doing it, they're like, why would you want to do that? Right? It turns out clinical trials have shown that this lactobacillus ruteri actually uh, uh, is part of the oral mouth microbiome too. And it fights the bacteria that causes cavities. So for me, like you can take a dietary supplement, you can actually chew it up, rinse it out, rinse your mouth, get the bacteria in there, and then swallow it. Now you've actually two shots on goal, once to fight cavities and once for the rest of your body um, at, at, the, at the end of the evening. Now, but there are other dietary sources of lactobacillus ruteri as well. Yogurt, some forms of yogurt actually have it. You have to kind of look around to see which types of yogurt actually have it. Um, sourdough bread, okay, uh, the, the tangy sourness of sourdough bread, that delicious tangy feel, if you like sourdough bread. It's tangy, hence sourdough, um, uh, actually because uh, it's a lactic acid. It, that acid actually is what makes it tangy. And guess what? The starter for sourdough bread is lactobacillus ruteri that makes lactic acid and it secretes it into the dough. So when you bake it, you're actually getting lactobacillus ruteri. And so that actually is another way of actually getting lactobacillus ruteri. And then a lot of people don't know this. Uh, and, and I'm not saying that this is a health food. I'm just telling you, this is a source of, lacto- of natural lactobacillus ruteri. Parmesan cheese actually is made, the starter for Parmesan cheese is lactobacillus ruteri. So that's kind of a cool thing if you're grating a little bit on your pasta or whatever it is. Um, now, obviously, uh, uh, and not just, by the way, not just any Parmesan cheese, Parmigiano Reggiano, the real Parmesan cheese, okay, from Italy. It's a, kind of pricey, but oh man, the, the flavor is amazing. You don't need to eat a lot of it to really get this nice flavor, but that's actually made with lactobacillus ruteri. So that's got probiotic uh, type of food. Now, I always tell people when people say, well, wait a minute, are you telling me to eat cheese? I'm saying, no, uh, not all cheeses are created equal. What I'm telling you, there are some cheeses that are actually probiotic cheeses that have some of the good stuff. You do have to watch out for cheese. It can be very salty, okay? And some people with high blood pressure need to worry about that. It can also have a lot of saturated fat, which isn't necessarily good for you. So you want to kind of control and lower the amount of saturated fat. But I'm just telling you, if you're going to reach for a block of cheese uh, uh, from time to time, 
and you want to know what kind of cheese I should use, I would say go for, for taste, go to um, Parmigiano Reggiano for probiotic benefit and lactobacillus ruteus specifically. Go ahead. Cheese grate a little bit of that on your stuff. You're not going to, you're, you're, you're actually going to benefit your gut microbiome. Throughout our conversation, we've tethered a lot of what we've been talking about to our previous chats through the five health defense system. So far, we've talked specifically about angiogenesis, the microbiome, and regeneration with the stem cells. I know we have to part ways here in a few minutes, but I want to touch on the other two, starting with immunity. And this kind of ties into the visceral fat, not by function, but by proximity through the omentum. Ah. So let's talk about this special fat in the body and how it ties into immunity. All right. Well, when I was a medical student, um, you know, medical students don't know anything. We're there to absorb all the textbooks and we go into the hospital and follow attending, teaching doctors or professors around, learning everything. And they're sharing with us the craft, right? It's like a trade. It's a trade. We're being apprenticed as medical students. Um, I remember in surgery, um, we were operating on people that were both large, big body types and just regular, normal, healthy body types and some skinny people. And there was always one piece when you open up the belly, you know, to do surgery in the gut. Um, uh, you know, most people don't know this, but when you're having your guts operated on, like they open you up and they actually, the surgeon actually moves the guts to the side, pull them out, move them off to the side of the table, um, or off a little bit to the side and you can do manipulate whatever you need to go do. And then you put it back. It's like taking, it's like unpacking a suitcase, right? You got to get something at the bottom. All right. You can't, you don't want to reach in, you'll destroy everything. So just carefully move things out. And then you actually put it back when you're done. But one of the things that we always saw that I, I could never forget there was this thick, um, fingery uh, um, piece of fatty tissue that's called the omentum, and it's tethered to the back of your belly, kind of by your spine, and it's got this incredible blood supply. And, and I used to tell my, sur- my surgery professor, the first time I saw it, I'm like, what is that? And, he, and the surgeon told me that my friend, future Dr. Lee, is called the omentum. And I'm like, what the heck is omentum? It is part of the body. It's made out of body fat. And it's called the policeman of the abdomen. And I'm like, what do you mean policeman of the abdomen? This is a, um, a, it actually looks like a baseball glove, um, but it's actually the same in everybody. And it is actually um, packed with immune cells and it crawls around like an octopus. Remember I told you it's like on arms, crawls around like your belly, like an octopus conducting surveillance, making sure that the gut, which is filled with this bacteria and you're eating different foods are running through it. And if you had a perforation in your belly, like that'll kill you if you don't wall it off. And so this policeman of your belt, of your abdomen literally is crawling around like an octopus, getting its little technicals into all the, the all the little, um, the, 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 the twisted areas of your gut, making sure everything is cool. There's no perforations, there's no leakage, there's no infections, everything is good. When it sees that there's a problem, if you had a perforated gut, appendix, appendicitis, man, this policeman of the admin, this omentum leaps into action. It goes right to where the perforation is, and it literally forms like a cup around that area that might where bacteria might be. It forms a cup around it to block it. The infection doesn't leak out anywhere. And then, like um, just like uh, like uh, like uh, like the future uh, Star Wars, it beams immunity, immune cells, inflammatory cells, right at that area of infection to clean it up. All right. That's why it's called the policeman of the abdomen. It patrols, it finds problems, it forms a barricade around it, and then it cleans up the problem. And then only when everything is calm and, and, and everything is all, all clear sign, does the omentum go back and retreat, retract, and it goes back to its place normally going to look around. So that is an amazing thing that a lot of people don't recognize that there's a, in addition to fat being the endocrine organ, there's a special part of the or, uh, of the fat that's called the momentum that is like an octopus and it's going around your belly crawling around literally it's it's moving around all day long looking for looking for trouble and when it doesn't find it it's you're happy but when it finds it it's life saving that is so fascinating and does it tie directly to metabolism or is it more just an immune thing uh it's you know 
it probably ties back to metabolism because my, we're beginning to now look at the links between the momentum and the gut microbiome and what role that plays as well. So listen, what's so exciting, uh, Jesse, is that, uh, and, and I, I, you know, you hear me talking about this in a very excited way because I'm a scientist and I love discovery and we are discovering more about the healthy parts of our body fat, how to tame our body fat using food, using metabolism, using fasting, and how to actually all this connects to our gut health, our heart health, our brain health, our emotional wellness, as well as our physical wellness, and the amount of energy that we actually have. And, you know, people talk a lot about aging, right? Healthy aging is and longevity is a, is a big topic now, uh, and, 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 and for good reason. A good, healthy metabolism allows you to get to live long and prosper, as Mr. Spock used to say in Star Trek. It's very, very important. So all these pieces all fit together, and it's just that we never appreciated how important all these pieces were. And also, we never appreciated how possible it is for us to be empowered and have the agency to be able to make decisions that can help our body do what it wants to do. All right. So last defense system, the DNA protection. Let's tie this into metabolism. All right. Well, we um, actually just talked about, I just mentioned aging. All right. And I want to just start right there because as we age, our genetic code starts to um, uh, kind of burn burn away and burn down. Think about it like a candle, right? You, you light a long dinner candle at the beginning of dinner. If you, if you have a great dinner and you're uh, and, and it's like a long dinner date and the candle burns all the way down. You're up all night, you know, like you, you have a l- late night dinner and the candle burns down. Well, at the bottom, like it like lights out. And that's basically, we have a fuse like the candle wick in our DNA. And it's, and it's, it's protected by the, something called the telomere. And our telomeres are these protective caps at the end of our DNA that burn down slowly as we age. The faster we, uh, the faster it burns down, the faster we age. And there are things that we do, like we don't live healthy lifestyles, we don't get enough sleep, we eat crappy food. That life fuse burns down, the protective cap burns down faster and faster and faster. And guess what? When it burns all the way down, our cells age really fast. So that's called cellular aging. So, and by the way, this is all DNA. So you want to protect your DNA, you want to slow down cellular aging. So it turns out, remember I told you that body fat can leak inflammation if it gets too big. All right. Normal body fat calms inflammation, but too much body fat leaks out the inflammation everywhere. When inflammation leaks out, you you accelerate your cellular aging. It burns down these telomeres faster and faster and faster. And that's why you want to tame that body fat because you want to slow down your cellular aging as much as you can possibly do it. Now, the other thing is that some of the foods that help to fight excess body fat also slow down cellular aging. So here's a connection right between protecting your DNA, helping you live longer and a more vital life and giving you more energy while you're at it that's directly connected to your DNA, that's correctly directly connected to your body fat, that's that's connected to your metabolism. But there's other uh, reasons also that that's really, really important, which is that when you have excess body fat, now remember, we're t- what we want is balance. We want normal, healthy, balanced body fat. When you have too much of it, it's growing and growing and growing and it doesn't have enough blood supply. It's kind of dying in the middle. So it's becoming very inflammatory and the inflammation is leaking out. All right. Now that what's happening is that that kind of uh, rotting fat, as it's kind of growing faster in this blood supply, leaks free radicals. Free radicals damage our DNA. So one of the things that we want to do is to tame our fat is we want to lower the oxidative stress caused by those free radicals in the rest of our body as well. So it's very important to know that when our fat is functioning well, it lowers inflammation, it slows down cellular aging, uh, you know, it helps us to, uh, protect our oxidative status in our body. When we have extra body fat, it completely undoes all those protective things. And that makes our DNA much more vulnerable. Now, our DNA, by the way, it's not just a genetic code. It protects us from harms in the environment because it can fix itself. Radon from the ground, ultraviolet radiation from the sun, not just sunburn or, or sun tanning booth, but even like you know what you get in a car window uh, when you're stuck in traffic. Or uh, if you're in an airplane and you have the window open, that ultraviolet radiation is coming in and frying your DNA on one side of your one side of your body. Thank goodness your DNA can fix itself. So you don't want to compromise that DNA's ability. And body fat and metabolism is intricately connected to that. 
the great thing about your book and the information you spread is that when we're talking about foods and these foods that we can implement to fight or prevent disease, there's no no wallet for people. They can implement what they're going to learn today right away, which is just awesome. Yeah, well, you know, the my background as a physician and as a scientist is was originally in biotechnology. So I've been involved with, you know, trying to develop better treatments for cancer, diabetes, heart disease, blindness, and all of those things take decade or more to actually um, come into fruition. But the nice thing about food as medicine, particularly what's informed by science, is that you can actually translate what you're learning that's based on science into action pretty much right after you hear about it. And so that immediacy is something that's really a, a welcome change when it comes to health care. Well, we're going to get right into it. And there's these five defense systems you talk about in your book. We're going to cover each one, starting with your bread and butter, which is angiogenesis. So I'll have you describe, first of all, what that is. And then we're going to get into a lot of the nuances around that. Right. Well, so um, about 25 years ago, I wound up actually uh, getting involved in a field called angiogenesis. And it's a fancy Greek word, but it's easy to understand. Angio, blood, blood vessel genesis growth. And so angiogenesis is how our body grows blood vessels. Why is that important? It's because we've got 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels packed inside our body. And these blood vessels are the highways and byways that bring oxygen as well that we breathe in and the nutrients that we eat into every single cell of our body. So when we actually have a good cir circulation, which is grown by angiogenesis, we're healthy. And when angiogenesis is not well, meaning we don't have enough blood vessels, or we've got too many blood vessels, on the other hand, um, it throws our circulation out of balance. And if we don't have enough blood vessels, our organs start to get starved and can die. And if we've got too many blood vessels, that's also dangerous because it can actually help to feed diseases like cancer that we don't want to grow. And that's the field of angiogenesis. And what's really amazing is that um, starting in 2000 and uh, 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 well, actually, starting in 1998, the first angiogenesis treatments for growing blood vessels to heal a wound became available for diabetics. Fast forward to 2004, the first anti-angiogenic to really prevent too many blood vessels from growing became a reality for cancer patients, starting with colon cancer. And so really, part of my background has been figuring out how do we take the science and turn it into action? How do we grow blood vessels where we want them? How do we mow them down where we don't want them? Kind of like a gardener, you know, mowing a lawn. Um, and what's really great is that in addition to biotech treatments, now we can actually add food as another tool in the toolbox to be able to right size our circulation. Well, you talked about the two different sides there to angiogenesis, the fact that in different situations, we're going to want to prune things back and then in other situations we want to accentuate. So let's start talking about pruning things back. And you mentioned cancer there. So we'll use that as an example. In your book, you talk about how all of us, we actually have these small cancers in our body right now. So I think that would be profound for a lot of people to learn. Talk about how that works and why it's not something we need to really fear. Right. Well, you know, when you hear the word cancer now, it strikes fear into your soul, frankly, no matter who you are and how old you are, simply because it's become kind of like this um, uh, almost mythical threat uh, from a health perspective. There is no other disease that uh, triggers the same kind of um, fearful reaction than, than cancer. Well, there's been a lot learned about cancer in the last couple of decades, and now we understand cancer a lot better. And we also learned uh, understand the human body a lot better. And let me tell you, so here's what's interesting. What is cancer? Cancer is a normal cell that has become abnormal through mutations, and those mutations uh, uh, multiply as the cell multiplies. And when there's enough multiplication, one times one, one times two, two times two. When there's enough of them, you have a tiny little microscopic cancer. How microscopic? Well, you know, it can ex it could grow to maybe the size of the tip of a ballpoint pen, about two millimeters in diameter, and then it can't get any bigger, no matter what. And that's the reason is because it doesn't have a blood supply, no oxygen, no nutrients, no highway and byway feeding it, because this abnormal thing is just sitting by there by itself. 
Um, and this is happening in our bodies all the time from the time we were kids. It's invisible. These little tiny microscopic cancers are like pimples that form in our body. You know, you might see a pimple on your face, okay, just like you might see a skin cancer on your face. But if the pimple were on your back, it'd be like a microscopic tumor growing somewhere in your body. You would never even know it. And just like most pimples wind, don't wind up becoming a scar, so too most cancers wind up being completely harmless. These microscopic cancers are cancer without disease. Now, why is that? It's because they're isolated from a blood supply, no blood vessels feeding these cancers, and our immune system, which is another one of our body's health defenses. Angiogenesis is one of our health defenses. Immune systems, another health defense. Our immune system continuously conducts surveillance like cops on a beat. And these microscopic cancers are like drug dealers sitting on the corner of a suburban neighborhood. They're not dealing, but they just don't belong there. Cop on a beat wings by, sees that weird looking character. I, I think we're gonna pick him up and take him away. Puts him in a squad car, drives off. And now the neighborhood is safe again. And that's basically what happens to these microscopic cancers. And so it doesn't wind up becoming a problem. Now, how do we know this is true, right? It seems shocking to people. How do we know it's true? Well, because our body is made out of 40 trillion cells that all have to multiply, almost all of them every single day. And all it takes is for one mistake out of 40 trillion in order to be able to cause that mutation that I talked about that build, grows, builds up to turn into a microscopic cancer. So then you ask the question, well, how many mistakes, how many mutations, possible mutations can occur a day? That's been studied too. The average healthy human body makes 10,000 DNA mistakes, mutation creating mistakes every 24 hours. Wow, that is stunning to think about. And so we, uh, fortunately, our DNA can fix itself, but a few of those are gonna escape and they're gonna turn into these little microscopic pimples, pimple cancers. OK, that fortunately are never going to become dangerous because our immune system will wing by and take that drug dealer off the street corner and before the neighborhood becomes a problem. Now, here's the thing. Oh, by the way, let me tell you another statistic of how we know this is uh, uh, happening. Autopsy studies of people who died of car accidents have shown that 40 percent of women between the ages of 40 and 50 have microscopic cancers found in their breasts when they do autopsies. 50% of men between the ages of 50 and 60 wind up having microscopic cancers in their prostate at autopsy, and they don't, they don't have clinical prostate cancer. And of 70 years old and above, 100% of people have microscopic thyroid cancers, and they're not, most people don't die of thyroid cancers. Okay, so what's the secret of having cancer if cancer actually is like a pimple? and our body normally takes care of it. What's the secret of keeping cancer not from becoming a disease? Well, we need good, strong health defenses. We need a, a strong angiogenesis system that defends us from blood vessels growing to feed that cancer, all right, cutting off the blood supply. That's part of our defense. We also need our DNA to repair itself so we don't have too many um, uh, cancers forming. We also need to have a good, strong immune system so that those cops on a beat can wing by and take away those microscopic cells and destroy them. And so this is really what I write about in my book, Eat to Beat Disease. When it comes to understanding why we are, remain healthy, see, the questions that pe some people ask is, well, you know, like if you have cancer, uh, unfortunately, many people have cancer. One of the questions that comes up is, why did I get cancer? Any, any patient that actually gets a diagnosis like that, first thing in their head is like, how did I get that? Why me? All right. I can tell you as a medical researcher, as somebody studying food as medicine, one of the questions that's being asked by the research community is, why don't we get cancer more often? With uh, 40 trillion cells, with 10,000 mutations that can be made a single day, with ultraviolet radiation, ozone going away, radon coming up through our feet, off gassing, um, gasoline, you know, uh, gasoline fumes, petrol fumes that we breathe in or filling at the filling station. Why don't we get cancer more often? And the answer is we've got these amazing health defense systems in our body that are swashbuckling on behalf of our health from the day we're born to our very last breath. Angiogenesis is one of them. Our immune system is one of them. Uh, and our DNA defense system is another one of them. So three out of five of them we've already talked about just in the course of talking about cancer. And um, 
biotech and pharmaceutical companies are trying to figure out how to invent drugs that can actually act on some of these systems. But what I've actually discovered coming from the biotech side is that, you know what, when you actually test foods in these same systems, it's quite amazing. Foods can be used as medicines for prevention by activating these health defenses. How powerful are these foods when it comes to comparing them to medicine? Yeah, well, okay, so you got to realize how I got into this. Um, I started to realize about 10 years ago that my patients that were getting these awful diagnoses, um, cancer, heart disease, stroke, blindness, arthritis, you name it, they would um, uh, get prescriptions from me. They'd get referrals to specialists. And, but, you know, and they would get dressed and they would leave, the, they would leave my, my office, uh, clinic office, and then they'd pop their head back in and they'd say, hey, doc, one more question. Forgot to ask. What should I be eating? What can I do for myself? And, you know, I was always stunned when that happened because I was, I realized I was never taught that in medical school. I had like a week's worth of medic education of a nutrition when I was in medical school. And I thought that not knowing that answer as a doctor was just wrong. So I went back to figure out how could I figure out the answer to what we should be eating. Now, my unfair advantage is that because, as I had mentioned, I've been involved with drug development for many years in the field of angiogenesis, and I actually helped to develop some of the systems used to test drugs, to find drugs, to, to treat angiogenesis. I thought, well, you know, maybe what we could do uh, is uh, use the same systems to study drugs and instead dump food into them to see what was going on with the food. And being a, you know, a, a credential scientist, um, I didn't have any preconceived notions. You got to just call it as you see it. Science leads the way with the, with the data. And man, was I surprised. When we dumped in green tea, garlic, olive oil, grapes, uh, strawberries, all that kind of stuff into these test systems used to develop cancer treatments, we found that many times they would go head to head with the drug. So I studied the drugs and the food at the same time in the same system to do head to head studies. And we found many of the, many of the foods would actually have the same power as the drugs. In some cases, the foods were even more powerful. Now that said, you know, this is not about, you know, using foods to replace medicine. If you've got a, disease, a serious health condition, you got to talk to your doctor and your doctor is probably going to use medicines and that can be life saving. But what I realized is that food is a missing tool in the toolbox that we should be using. And yes, doctors should be using them as well. They should be answering that question that my patients were, were asking, I told you. But here's the great news is that people, even if you're not sick, can use these same tools in a toolbox. And all you got to do is open your fridge, go into your pantry, go out to the farmer's market, go to the grocery store, and you can find some of these foods. Well, let's stick on that point of being sick versus not sick and coming back to angiogenesis and cancer. So we have these different little cancers that develop in our body throughout our lifetime. When it comes to eating certain foods that we're going to get into here in a sec, is the goal here to have them before the cancer starts? In a, well, not before the cancer starts, sorry, before the cancer gets that blood supply or afterwards or either way? Well, look. Uh, what I love about this podcast is its name, Ultimate Health. So in the ultimate health scenario, we would be eating delicious foods that have the capability of propping up and, and, and boosting, activating our body's angiogenesis defenses to prevent cancers from ever growing up. So even if the pimples form, they're not going to get a blood supply. So we never have to worry about them ever, the horse ever coming out of the barn. Okay. Think about having um, foods that prevent blood vessels from growing into cancers, like putting a padlock on the, on the barn. Those horses are not getting out. All right. That's what we kind of want. That's, that would be the ideal. That would be the ultimate scenario. But, you know, many people, uh, one already have cancer, right? I mean, that's, that's what it's a, it's a, it's such as the number two, maybe number three now after COVID is um, the num number three killer. Uh, of people. So a lot of people have cancer. Not only are they fighting with cancer now, there's also people who have recovered from cancer, even more people, right? For those people, um, they want to prevent it from coming back, right? We also know cancer can come back, can recur. And people who are battling cancer, you know, they're right now they're kind of stuck with whatever their oncologist 
is giving them in the chemotherapy unit or in or, or prescription to take pills at home, that's okay. I'm not one of those doctors that basically says, don't worry about the medical world, go off on your own to the to grow your own garden and and be be done with it. What I'm saying is that tool in a toolbox, by the way, something really important. There was a study that just came out about a month ago, okay, that's a game changer. And it showed looking at 200 people with melan malignant melanoma, that's a deadly form of skin cancer, okay, um, uh, getting the state-of-the-art treatment, which is called immunotherapy. That's a drug treatment, biotech treatment that activates our health defenses, our immune health defenses. So it's not just cops and a beat winging by taking out those pimples. You can, you, uh, you know, when you actually rear up your immune system with immunotherapy, it's kind of like, you know, you, you can take out an army of cancer cells now. You could, you, could, you could take out a whole gang of cancer cells. You can wipe out cancer in your brain, spread all of in your body. It's doable with immunotherapy. However, only about 20% of people wind up getting that kind of like unheard of response where you can literally wipe out. It's kind of like on a dry erase board. You could basically erase, dry erase all the cancer out of your body using good, strong immune defenses. Now, we can talk about foods for that as well. But it turns out that in this study, they looked at 200 people and they looked at the difference between responders and non-responders, people who didn't respond very well. And, the, and, the, and what they found was that there was a difference between responders and non-responders in one bacteria in the gut. So they looked at the poop. And that one bacteria is called ruminococcus. Now, ruminococcus, and the name of the bacteria doesn't matter so much uh, as a concept, grows when you eat dietary fiber. What, what, what kind of foods give you dietary fiber? Well, and a medium-sized peach, uh, a pear, um, actually has about five grams of dietary fiber. But so do mushrooms. So does broccoli. So does kale. Lots of food. So does popcorn. Gives you dietary fiber. And it turns out that uh, if, if they've calculated from the research, for every five grams of dietary fiber you have per day, while you're getting treatment with immunotherapy for malignant melanoma, and five grams, remember, is about how much you get from a medium-sized pear per day, it decreases mortality by 30%. Now, why does that work? It works through another health defense. That dietary fiber that you eat activates our gut bacteria, our microbiome. Now we're getting to the fourth health defense system, and our gut bacteria defends our health as well. In, in Anti-inflammatory talks to our immune system, boosts our immune system, helps our brain secrete social hormones and, and makes us feel better, uh, lowers stress, helps our metabolism. So if you're a cancer patient and you're getting treatment and you have foods with diet, tool in the toolbox, with that tool, diet with fiber, that the fiber activates the gut microbiome. The gut microbiome lowers inflammation, but it props up our immune system. And with a reared up immune system, you're getting immunotherapy. It can actually help the chances that you're going to survive the cancer by responding to this immune signal to wipe out uh, advanced cancer. So that's another example of how it's so important based on research to be able to eat foods that can actually help your health defenses. If somebody's tuning in right now, they're feeling skeptical because they feel like they've tried all the different diets out there and they've you know not had any success to this point and we want to hook them early and let them know we have something different here, what would you say to them? Well, I would actually say there's a new science of the metabolism that really tells us how to take control of our own lives and that our metabolism really is not our destiny determined from birth, but that we can actually take some concrete steps, very easy steps to get on that right path. And then there's very concrete steps we can take to up our game along the way. And when it comes to metabolism, a good jumping off place is to talk about the concept of carrying extra body weight and how this actually slows the metabolism. Right. Well, which is kind of backwards the way typically people typically think about it. So I'll have you elaborate on that. Right. Well, for many years, we thought that people were born with a slow metabolism or a fast metabolism. Even doctors actually had that idea. That's kind of how what we were taught in medical school. But it turns out more recent research, in fact, only research that's only two years old, shows that all humans are hardwired with our metabolism the same way that your laptop has an operating system. And when you take it out of the box from you come home from the store and start it up, 
Everyone's body is like the laptop out of the box. Our metabolism is designed and hardwired to work exactly the same way. And it turns out that all humans are wired wired to actually go through only four phases of metabolism. From zero to one year old, our metabolism skyrockets to 50% higher than what it's going to be when we're an adult. From one year old to 20 years old, our metabolism actually comes down to adult levels, down, 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 okay? Um, doesn't rise like you think teenagers might be full of energy and bouncing off the walls. Metabolism is going up, right? Wrong. And it turns out that the third stage, which is the most surprising actually for most adults, from age 20 to age 60, metabolism, human metabolism is hardwired to be completely rock stable, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. It's not supposed to to change. Our hardwiring tells us we have the same, we're designed to have the same amount of energy and the same fuel efficiency all throughout our diet, adult lives. I'll come back to why that's, that's a problem. And then from age 60 to 90, we do have a slight decrease, only about 17%. So when you're 90, your metabolism's hardwiring says slow down about 17% to when you were 16, which basically is the same as when you're 20. So what I'm telling you uh, is that 60 can be the new 20 if you follow your metabolism. And it's the problem of excess body fat that actually shuts down, sits on top of our metabolism. So it's not that a slow metabolism causes us to grow body fat and gain weight. It's the other way around. Excess body fat actually suppresses our metabolism. And that means the power is actually in our hands to do something about it. So let's talk about that period of time. You mentioned the four different phases Let's talk about that second phase where from two through our teens, the metabolism slowly coming down, which would be a surprise to a lot of people, including myself, because typically during that teen period, we can eat a lot of food, or at least, you know, this was my experience being a teen and I was skinny as a rail. And I know that's not the case for everybody, but I know a lot of teens are in that, that boat. Is it just because of the increased amount of activity during that period or what's going on there? Yeah, well, think about it. Um, I'm telling you, our hardwiring for our metabolism is following a program, again, like the operating system on your laptop. It doesn't want to actually do anything different. Now, at the same time that we're teens, okay, um, uh, other things are happening in our body. We're kind of unfolding our wings like a butterfly coming out of a cocoon and starting to sprout wings, get bigger, taller, grow our muscles. All those things actually take more energy. So although our hardwiring says stay with the stable energy, the fact that we're actually getting taller, getting more muscular, starting to take our body shape, now we actually need more fuel, which is coming from the food that we eat, in order to be able to power up that additional growth. And so if you think about food as the fuel for our metabolism, Although our metabolism is actually coming down, by the way, it's not slowing down to unnatural levels. It's actually just coming down to our adult level. Partly it's because that first skyrocketing at age one is so high that actually we've got some room to, to come down to hit our adult, uh, our, our adult peak. So I would say that it's really the fact that we've overshot at age one. And then secondly, when that we're actually starting to unfold our wings, so to speak, uh, as we're uh, gaining all these other body functions and our height uh, that that we're actually using, um, uh, we're consuming more energy as we actually unfold our own other physical programming. Another layer to this could be the fact that some of the fat we could be building during those teen years might not be visible fat. So it could be the fat, the visceral fat in around the organs. And then maybe when we're, you know, between 20 and 40, it finally catches up with us. Well, here's another way to look at it. Think about it. When we are kids, the boys and girls in your class actually look exactly the same. They're pretty much all real, you know, they're straight up and down, right? But when we're actually in our adolescence, um, uh, you know, as we're going through, our uh, prepubertal years, our, our teenage years, through adolescence, what happens is that the shape of, of males and females begins to change. And part of that is actually the redistribute, redistribution of body fat. So what actually happens is you're absolutely correct that in boys, in men, people with a, with a Y chromosome, actually what's happening is that we actually gain more visceral fat. 
So uh, although we get taller and we get a little wider, the tube of our body gets wider. There's more fat stuffed inside. All right. And then for for females, uh, teenage girls, what actually happening? Ha what actually happens is that their uh, s their subcutaneous fat um, uh, slims down. They redistribute body fat around the hips, around the breasts, around the buttocks. And basically, it's when we start to unfold. You know, if you think about the Venus de Milo, the statue, uh, and the st statue of David, right? So those are sort of two iconic uh, shapes of humans between male and female. That's actually what starts to happen during um, adolescence. And so the, the distribution of body fat also uh, actually changes. So the extra body fat that you're referring to that can that we can, quote, pay for later that only happens if we overeat or if we eat the wrong things over time during our adolescence. It's true. It, we can overthrow uh, uh, our, our hardwiring of our metabolism. The same way you can actually download a program that contains viruses on your uh, laptop even after you open it up out of the box and you can actually screw up your operating system and now you got to take it in to do the antivirus program to clean it all up. And so I think it's really important for us to understand hardwiring of our metabolism tells us what we're capable of. And as long as we actually allow our body to achieve its potential, that's how we optimize our metabolism at any age. A few scary things when it comes to the visceral fat is one, like we talked about, it's, it's, you know, not always visible. It's actually not visible Two. A lot of people are going to be motivated to burn fat only when they can see their body changing. So if it's if it's not an aesthetic thing, they might not have the same motivation. And three, this is the dangerous kind of fat that does a lot of damage in the body. So it's kind of like a triple threat when you look at it that way. It is true. Um, but again, don't forget, we have to have some body fat. It's healthy for us. It makes hormones. It's our cushion against injury. We fall on the ground. It's actually um, a fuel reservoirs or fuel tanks. So there's a lot of good things about body fat. It's only when it's excess, it's actually a problem. Now, here's a super easy way for people to get an idea of how much visceral fat they have, because all you've got to do is to look at your waistline, your waist circumference. So if you're a guy and you wear a belt, all right, um, how many holes do you actually need to go in in order to wear your pants comfortably? Right. That's kind of like if you need to really loosen it up, it means your waist circumference is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which actually means you're growing visceral fat. That's the harmful stuff. And you can notice that. I mean, I, we've all been through this at some point in our life. If you're an adult, you've gone through a period where, you know, your waist band, your waist starts to expand and you really you know, loosen up a belt loop. But we've also many of us have actually been in a place where we get in better shape. And then we are able to tighten our belt loop. And that's really one of the easiest ways without using a DEXA scan or a CT scan or any kind of other fat calibration method. There's all kinds of technology out there, but the easiest kind of like romper room way to actually figure out if you actually are are um, losing harmful visceral fat is just to check your waist circumference, your belt size. Let's talk about why visceral fat is different. Get into the physiology and talk about why that is so dangerous. So there's two kinds of fat that are there's there's three kinds of main fat there's white fat which is wiggly and jiggly uh and it can be visceral or it could be subcutaneous meaning under the skin and then there's brown fat which is paper thin and it's close to the bone and it actually is good fat that generates heat to burn down harmful fat but visceral fat is really the f first kind it's wiggly jiggly and, it, and it's found inside the tube of your body visceral meaning gut gut fat visceral fat's the same thing and if you think about it, it starts off like packing peanuts in, inside the tube of your body. It's a cushion to prevent if you tripped on a rug and you fell on the floor, your organs are cushioned by a little bit of these packing peanuts. And so it's going to be fine. Now, visceral fat, by the way, has another function. It actually contains part of our immune system. I want to talk about the good part first. Our immune system, um, and, and I can tell you what it does. There's a specific organ. There's even an org, a sub-organ of, of fat. Our whole fat is an organ. There's one part of our fat called the omentum, O-M-E-N-T-U-M. -E Most people who are not doctors will have never heard of it because it is actually what we – it's like an apron of fat, healthy fat, that crawls around our body like an octopus. You know, if you see those uh, 
videos online or on, on like uh, Discovery Channel, the octopus uh, is going around the rock and the reef, just looking for places the crevice, crevices to go into. That's the omentum made out of body fat. Here's what it does. It patrols our abdomen, our, our belly on the inside around our intestines doing a couple of things. Number one, it conducts surveillance to make sure there are no leaks or cracks or injuries to our gut. You know, our gut is full of bacteria and our gut is actually full of poop. Can you imagine if there's a perforation, a tiny hole or an injury, and all that bacteria seeps out from inside, from the tube of your intestines into the viscera, into the open cavity of your body? I'll tell you as a doctor what would happen. You would get septic, you would go to the ICU, and there's a good chance you would die. All right? So, thank goodness for the, the omentum, this healthy fat, this octopus. Um, it's kind of like a mix between an octopus and a baseball glove. And it basically cruises around your belly silently. You can't feel it. And it can get in between the intestines. Now, look, your intestines is about 40 feet of a tube, all folded up, like packed into a suitcase, which is our, our belly. And the omentum conducts surveillance to make sure that everything is hunky-dory and actually fine and there's no inflammation. Now, the, the, the omentum also, this is visceral fat, also secretes those hormones, leptin, to help control our appetite, adiponectin, which is another hormone to allow insulin to draw our uh, energy in, our fuel, our glucose, more efficiently into our cell, and resistin, which is actually to allow us to have a little bit less versus a little bit more um, uh, energy drawn in. Okay, this is all healthy stuff. Now, and the other thing that omentum contains it actually contains part of our immune system. So think of it, our momentum like a battleship that contains ready to roll super soldiers inside its, um, in, inside its cab, in, inside the ship. And basically it's waiting there. And if it actually finds a little hole in our intestines, right? Think about all the stuff that we actually throw down our gut. If there's a little hole, little perforation, immediately that octopus, the momentum will crawl over there. It'll stick out a tentacle and it will cup that area and it will blast the super soldiers, the immune system to clean up that area and kill the infection until it heals. All right. We used to call this the policeman of the abdomen, the omentum. So it's quite amazing. So, okay. So what happens? Um, that's normal. I'm just, I want to tell you normal because everybody thinks of fat as bad. That's all normal. If you actually grow too much visceral fat and visceral fat also being fuel cells, and you just keep on piling up fat, 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 fat by overeating, by eating the wrong things, by disrupting your gut health, which then causes your metabolism to go haywire, and then it's easier to gain, uh, to develop body fat. And then what actually happens is that those hormonal functions are disrupted. Basically, think about it like uh, disrupting the hormones, like getting too much visceral fat is like you walk into a symphony hall that's in the middle of a performance of, you know, Beethoven's. Uh, uh, symphony and you get in there and you just jump on stage and start throwing, you know, stuff around, uh, emptying a garbage can on stage. You're going to disrupt everything. The music is not going to flow. And that's what actually happens when you develop excess visceral fat. It's dangerous for several reasons. Number one, those hormones, leptin, adiponectin, resistant, all the things that control how well and efficiently we use our energy, all thrown off course. I don't know. Do we want to absorb more energy or less energy? I can't tell. It's too noisy in here. All right. That the immune system super soldiers, well, guess what? They're thrown out of whack as well. They're like, whoa, I can't, I don't know what's going on. And so basically your fat unleashes the super soldiers as inflammation. All right. Now you've got inflammation instead of defenders of the, of your body. Now they become inflammatory cells and they are all over the place, spilling out over your uh, guts. On top of that, when you if you grow too much visceral fat, and remember, fat normally is a fuel tank that stores the energy into fat cells. If you if you overstuff that area, the fuel, the fat will leak out. Okay, it's just like overfilling your gas tank at a gas station. Boom, it comes out, full, it rolls down the side of the of the car, around your tires, around your shoes. You're, it's a toxic, dangerous, flammable mess at the gas station. Same deal. When you have overflowing fuel, fat will leak out of fat. A liquid will leak out of fat cells, which is supposed to contain them like a fuel tank. And that leaking fat poisons your liver. It's called lipo, meaning fat. Toxicity, meaning it's poison to your liver. And in fact, that's actually the cause in our world of abundance of something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 
N A F L D. That's is this is actually a hidden epidemic that is leading to hepatitis and leading to liver cancer when you poison your liver. And by the way, your liver detoxifies your whole body, detoxifies your blood. You damage that organ with leaking excess fat, man, we are in a world of hurt. So what I'm telling you is that normal healthy fat, think about it like an orchestra um, with a conductor that plays a beautiful symphony. Everybody's in harmony doing their thing, and it's a performance for the, your whole life. And when you actually grow too much visceral fat, it's like rushing on stage with garbage cans and dumping them out and completely disrupting the performance. That's how bad it actually is. I know another reason that people get fatty liver is from too much fructose. Can you talk about that mechanism and how is there any overlap between the two? Yeah. So, you know, I think uh, it is true that if you overload with carbs, including fructose, but also added sugar of any sort, you can actually overwhelm your metabolism, which can then lead the liver to be less efficient and then lead to the accumulation of fat, which leaks, which then leads to fatty liver disease. So in fact, the process I told you about, regardless if it's fructose or sucrose or, you know, any kind of uh, OS, which is uh, sugars and carbs, it all start, stems from the same thing. It's fuel. It gets stored into the fuel tank. It leaks out and then it poisons and over and, 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 and is toxic to the liver. So it's not that eating a piece of fruit actually does it because there's something special about the fruit. It's the, it's a general overwhelming of it. And fructose, by the way, um, uh, consumed in, you know, it gets vilified just like people tend to do in the nutrition and food and health world actually is perfectly fine for most people with normal healthy metabolisms. You know, there are plenty of people who are in their 80s and 90s and above who actually eat fruit without, you know, poisoning their liver. The problem is when you start out, you know, with the scales tip against you as an adult with bad eating habits, not enough exercise, poor sleep, an excessive amount of stress, and then, you know, you start to overeat as well. All those things are like the four horsemen of the apocalypse that converge to help you grow that extra body fat, which then leaks and causes inflammation. And of course, inflammation being the, the sort of setting the stage for almost every other undesirable chronic disease that we know. Well, let's zoom back then. Now we know what happens when the visceral fat gets out of control and the damage it can cause. But let's zoom back and talk about the dietary piece, what we're consuming and when we're consuming that's causing that visceral fat to accumulate. So the simple analogy I like to give people to think about our metabolism. So set aside calories in, calories out, counting calories. There's so much, uh, there's so much uh, baggage associated with the term calorie. Think about your body like an engine of a car and the food that you eat providing the fuel. When your fuel is low, it's like a fuel, like, a, like your gas tank, your gauge, gauge in your car. When you see it's low, we feel hungry. We pull over to the filling station, which is not a gas station. In the case of our metabolism, it's really to the kitchen table, the refrigerator, the pantry, the restaurant, what have you to go eat something. Now, here's the thing. When we actually eat food and you put, put, start approaching food and, and put it into our mouth, our, our pancreas, which one of the organs in our body, secretes a hormone called insulin. When insulin goes up, it allows, it's a hormone that allows our body to absorb the energy from the food, the fuel that we eat. Food equals fuel. Fuel is into food. Now we're actually taking the fuel into our cells. So we have energy blinking, uh, talking, rushing to catch an airplane, going out for a walk, working out. All those things take fuel. Just pumping your heart actually takes fuel. So, so you low, use that fuel. Insulin uses that, brings that fuel in. And anything extra from whatever you're eating, all right, no matter how many calories it is, gets stored in for later use in your body fat. And so little fat cells are called adipocytes. And when you've got extra fuel from whatever you're eating that's not usable at the moment, you store it into a little fat cell. And that fat cell, it's a little cell, but it'll grow a 100 times in size when it's being loaded up with fuel. That's uh, food from the from the food that we're eating. And you can load that up. When you're done eating, you're done fueling up. Insulin basically comes down and your body go, can go from switch from your metabolism, which is from fuel storing mode, okay, to fuel burning mode. Just like when you're in a car, when you're filling up your gas tank, you're told to turn off the engine, 
right? And now you're in fuel storing mode. When you're done fueling up, the thing clicks and you put the nozzle back, close the gas cap, get back in the car. Now you can switch to fuel burning mode. So that's basically in our body. When we're eating, our insulin's up, metabolism says, uh, let's not burn any fuel, let's store it. We want to store it. Bring it on, baby. When we actually are done eating, our insulin goes down, and that's a signal for our metabolism to switch gears, and now it switches to fuel burning mode. And that makes sense. When we're not eating, we need to have a source of energy, and so we just draw on the fuel that's stored in our fat. Now, if we eat normal amounts, we fill up our fuel tank. Let's call it three quarters full. The tank is full. All right, maybe a little bit higher than that. But what happens for overeating from a habit perspective, if we overeat, we are overfilling our gas tank. Imagine if the, in a, your car, you didn't have the clicker at the end of the gas station and the fuel just kept on going up to fill up and then overflow the tank. The gas will run down the car and you'll st be standing in this dangerous, flammable mess in your body. Remember I told you about leaking fuel. All right. Instead of leaking at the very beginning, what happens is that your body goes, let's go fill up another fuel tank, another fat cell, another fat cell. Oh, still eating. Still more fuel. All right. Let's fill up another one. You can kind of see what's going on. From one cell, a hundred times bigger, another cell, a hundred times bigger, so on and so forth. Repeat, rinse and repeat. Now you're run, you've run out of fat uh, storage tanks. Oops, still eating, right? I mean, like we've all been through this ourselves at some point in our lives. You're still eating, dude. All right. Now what happens is your your body says, "Look, uh, we're really grateful when we have more fuel. We're not going to waste any. So let's take some stem cells that live in our body and let's go make some more fat. All right. So more fat cells." Now it makes more fat cells, more fat cells, more fat cells, and fills them up. As long as you're eating, it'll keep on filling up the fat. That's how we build up first extra visceral fat, but eventually it'll spill to the other kinds of fat as well. The bigger the fat, the bigger the mound, okay, and this could be inside your butt, belly with visceral fat. What winds up happening is that your fat, as it expands, can outgrow its own blood supply. Your fat needs a blood supply to live when it's expanding that quickly because you're filling it up. It, the, the, the outside gets big, but there doesn't have enough blood vessels. So what happens? The center of it, which is, doesn't have enough blood flow, winds up dying. It won't die completely, but it's called ischemia, hypoxia, not enough oxygen. And so when it's not enough oxygen, guess what it does? It, your fat basically says, release inflammation. So now inflammation is unleashed inside your necrotic dying fat as it's expanding. And then the inflammation starts seeping out as well. Leakage of growing fat, excessive fat, of, of fat fuel itself, as well as inflammation. That sets the stage for all these problems, heart disease, diabetes, frank obesity, uh, probably Alzheimer's and neurodegeneration, a whole host of things. And then your immune system starts to crash, and then your health defenses start to crash, and your metabolism crashes. And when your metabolism crashes, your energy starts to really flag. Uh, and and uh, and then your gut health also starts to flag. This is the interconnectedness of all of our systems. I know it's so tempting, and we do this all the time, to vilify this or that, and it's either a hero or it's a villain. Actually, no, there's a lot of body parts that are interconnected. What we want is everything to work in harmony together. And the interesting thing, as you explain that, we can see how everything can be working for us or it can quickly flip the other way and if we get to that point where, you know, we have inflammation and our metabolism starts to come down, we're going to start to put more weight on and that's going to cause more inflammation. And you can see how this could all spiral out of control if somebody lets this get out of hand. So, yeah, I mean, I feel for people and I can see how it would easily get there. The problems can happen very silently, right? Because life happens to us, right? I mean, this is what happens. Why? So between 20 and 60, when metabolism is hardwired to be stable and yet people do struggle with their weight they, and they feel like their metabolism is slowing down. This is why we used to think, oh, when we're middle age, we're nat our metabolism naturally slows. No, actually what happens, our metabolism doesn't slow. It actually is hardwired to be completely stable, operating system on your laptop. But the problem is life happens to us. We get distracted. We get stressed, financial stress, economic stress, uh, relationship stress. You've got kids you're worried about, job stress. You know, there's whatever's going on in the world. All these things, uh, you know, we've got more complexity. And what happens is that over time, we start to change our behavior. When our behavior changes, it's very easy to start eating overeating. And especially if you're not eating the right things, now you're overeating the wrong things. 
so easy to go to that old fuel overloading, inflammatory, uh, fat overspillage, damaging your metabolism stage. And that's why overeating and excess body fat crushes your metabolism, not the other way around. And I think it's important to point out too that this system is actually trying to work for us. And a lot of the time throughout our history, it would have worked for us when we didn't have such an abundance of food and we could go up to the fridge and, you know, every couple hours open it up and continue to put calories in and spike that insulin, as you talked about, and go into storage mode. We would have needed this system to get through to where we are today as humans. It's only in the last little period of time that because of our new way of living, it's easy enough to throw the system awry. Completely, 100%. Now think about it this way. Another way to think about it is imagine if you are somebody who doesn't get a chance to eat very much. Maybe maybe you're on a budget and so you have to watch what you're buying and what you're eating. Like many people are like that. Um, you're going to be really grateful when you actually have something good to eat, right? Um, and maybe you'll eat three times a day. Maybe you won't. But every time you have food, you'll be appreciative and you'll um, think about the value of what, the value of what you're actually eating. Now, let me give you a different scenario. You're a kid thrown into a candy store. All right. Now you're surrounded by everything and someone tells you, go ahead. There's no limit. Get anything you want. Right. So you're going to go first. You're going to be excited. You're going to dive in and start eating everything. But pretty soon you don't, you're confused. You don't know what to do anymore because you're just surrounded by overage. And I think this is true on the behavioral level, but it's also true on the cellular level. When we actually have our, are surrounded with overabundance, it confuses the system in our body. It can overwhelm our metabolism. And so what we want to do when you ask, you know, like, oh, how do you eat? When do you eat? What do you eat? One of the things we want to do is to be moderate. Don't, don't overeat. That's easy. Quit the clean plate club. All right. Um, don't take, don't pile on to your plate. You know, uh, you're not preparing for hibernation. <laughs> so you want to actually uh, be careful that you are taking just the right amount. Stop eating when you're 80% full. There's a Japanese saying called hara hachi ban mi. And it basically means, you know, if you eat slowly and you feel like you're satisfied, but not full, push the plate away. You're not a member of the Clean Plate Club anymore. You're fine. Thank your host. You know, thank whoever cooked the meal and, and, and be grateful that you had it. You don't need to keep on eating. That's the whole thing. All right. You, you can just stop. That's the sort of like how to eat. When to eat. Look, remember I told you when you are actually not eating, for example, sleeping, what actually happens is that your insulin levels are down when you're not eating. Your metabolism switches gears to fuel burning mode. So when you're sleeping, you're also not eating, which is also called fasting. We get up in the morning, we're breaking our fast, which is why we call it breakfast, break fast. When you're not, when you're not eating, your body is in fuel burning mode, burning down extra energy in those fat cells that got stored up. Remember? So the longer you don't eat, the more energy, excess fat you can burn. And it draws it for, for first from visceral fat. Now, this is a, this is sort of like a when to, to eat. If, for example, you sleep for eight hours a day, and I've talked about this uh, with many people, you should try to eat sleep eight hours a day. That's best for your health. Let's say you sleep from 11 to 7. If you eat dinner the night before, let's say it's 7 o'clock, and the time isn't so, the exact hour time is less important than the concept. You eat dinner at 7, you, you finish at 8, put your dishes away. Don't eat a late night snack, no midnight snack, no noshing, don't wait for your dessert to eat later. So many of us were trained over time to have this habit of finishing dinner and just eating continuously, maybe out through the night or definitely before sleeping, eating something. Look, every time you put your dishes away and then you're still snacking, your insulin's going up. Now you're cutting into the time. You want to actually get more fat burning time. This is the how to eat. Stop. When you put your dishes away, don't eat anything else. And now let's say you go to bed, you eat at seven, you get you put your dishes away at eight, and you go to bed at 11. You've just gained three extra hours of fat burning time. How awesome is that? And it's very easy to retrain yourself to having, you're not going to, believe me, you're not going to perish in those three hours. And then what I do myself is I, 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 you know, I keep track of this. So I get three hours before bed. I get my eight hours of sleep. In the morning when I get up, I don't, immediately rush off and eat breakfast like when I was when a kid. I take my time to get ready, to get showered, 
uh, to change, get dressed. And I might go out for a walk or I might read a book or I might check my email or something and I'm not eating yet. I usually wait for an hour after I get up before I eat anything. Maybe even longer sometimes, like this morning I didn't eat for a couple hours after I got up. Guess what? I just gained one or two extra hours of fuel burning. Do the math. 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock, three hours. 11 o'clock to 7 o'clock, eight hours. That's 11 hours. Now you give yourself one extra hour in that morning. It's 12 hours. There's 24 hours in a day. And now you have spent half the day allowing your hardwired metabolism to be in fuel and fat burning mode. How good and how easy is that? Well, so this is this whole topic about how do we take care of our health defense called the gut microbiome. So the microbiome is really an ecosystem that's in our body. Um, and most people don't know this, but, you know, here you and I are on this podcast. And, you know, if somebody had to put a label on us, if an alien from outer space had to put a label on us, they'd call us humans, right? But if you actually look inside our body, we're only 50% human. The other 50% of the cells that are in our inside our body that we're made out of actually is our gut bacteria. So in fact, they don't even call us humans anymore. There's a term for an organism like you and me that are, is made up of other organisms. And it's called, the term is called a holobiont. H-O-L-O-B-I-O-N-T. A holobiont is a, is a mega organism made of other organisms. And that's what we are. We live with this ecosystem, this coral reef of bacteria. The Great Barrier Reef of bacteria lives inside our gut, also lives in our skin, also lives in our uh, the orifices in our body. But these healthy bacteria are really important because they help to um, they help to they help our metabolism, they lower inflammation. They're incredibly important for our immune system. Now, uh, how do you get these healthy gut bacteria? Where do we get them? Well, we get them from mom. So while you know when your dad's sperm met your mom's egg and you were just starting to be forming. When you started to look like a little tadpole in the womb, at that point, mom was giving you parts of her microbiome through the womb, feeding you the good bacteria, and that was building your gut. As your gut starts to form, good bacteria comes. When you're born, when we're born, we also get good bacteria bacteria if you're born vaginally, natural childbirth, okay, what winds up happening is that you squeeze your big head or big heads through the tiny birth canal, all the mom's bacteria gets squeezed into our eyes and our nose and our mouth and we swallow it. When we crawl up this when we crawl up the the mom's chest, right? Skin contact, crawl up the chest, up with the nipple, the first um, mouthful of mom's milk that we have um, the skin of the nipple has good, healthy bacteria, so we get into our system. And then the first squirt of milk it contains bacteria that came from the mom's gut because around eight months during pregnancy, um, the mom's healthy gut bacteria knows we're about a month away from delivery. Let's get up into the nipple. So literally, some gut bacteria call other cells that can transport them. They're called neutrophils. It's like calling an Uber. Okay, and the swell, cells uh, swing by the gut, the bacteria, certain bacteria get into the Uber, the cellular Uber, the Uber drives up to the breast, they get out, and they park right there by the nipple waiting for that first suckling. So that's how we build our good bacteria. And the reason I'm pointing this out is that we get our good bacteria from mom. What you're, what you're, what you're saying is that can we eat to build more good bacteria? Yeah, we got to maintain them. Our gut bacteria need to be fed. Foods with dietary fiber, leafy greens, uh, uh, mushrooms, uh, all those uh, uh, tree nuts, walnuts, pecans, almonds, pistachios, absolutely um, uh, good pears, a good source of dietary fiber. Uh, apples, also a good source of dietary fiber. But we can also continue to eat bacteria too. So look, when I went to medical school, I can tell you that in our infectious disease course, the professor opened up by saying, Bacteria, we're going to learn about bacteria because bacteria are bad. And we want to be able to identify the bad guys. And we're going to, I'm going to teach you how to prescribe antibiotics to kill those bad guys. So our whole thinking in medical school was uh, bacteria are bad and we must, must kill. Okay. Turns out that in fact, most bacteria in the human body are good. There's a few bad guys that come out, but we don't want to actually have collateral damage by wiping out all the good citizens. 
And yet this is how medicine is changing. This like tip of the spear research. We want to protect the good good guys and we're going to be very, you know, we want to use SEAL Team 6 to get the bad guys, not this broad spectrum antibody. And we want to grow, grow more good guys as well. So sometimes eating fermented foods, kimchi, uh, sauerkraut, yogurt, uh, some forms of cheese actually all have laden with good, healthy gut bacteria that can actually uh, replenish and help that ecosystem become richer, wealthier. It's kind of like, um, think about um, adding fish to the Great Barrier Reef. Parts of it are actually kind of being bleached and destroyed. Yeah, let's add some more fish to it so we can so we can actually establish itself and protect that ecosystem. That's what we can actually do. One last thing I'll tell you about the gut microbiome as a health defense system that's really important for people to do. We can't destroy the good system that we were born with. And yet it's so easy to harm that ecosystem. What harms our good, healthy gut bacteria? What wipes out good gut bacteria? Too much alcohol, too much sugar, added sugar. You know, the 10 teaspoons of sugars in a can of soda. Man, that's not good for your gut bacteria. It starts to kill them off. Okay. Even worse, uh, uh, artificial sweeteners like a diet soda. Your gut bacteria really doesn't like the gut, but that doesn't like the, the, the synthetic sugars, artificial sweeteners. That really changes them. Okay. And so there's so many things that we can eat that actually alter our gut bacteria. In addition to eating foods that can build the good ones, we need to just be aware we, we have to cut down or cut out the things that actually harm our gut bacteria. So what I'm hearing you say here is there's three different angles. We want to make sure we're bringing in new healthy bacteria. We want to feed those bacteria through fiber. And then we also want to protect against things like artificial sweeteners and alcohol. We did talk about a pair there when we were talking about fiber. I'm curious now, are there specific foods, quote unquote, superfoods, when it comes to things that we can take in on a regular basis to build up that microbiome that might be better than, you know, things like an apple or a pear, or more, you know, co- not necessarily common, but special foods that have even more of an impact. Yeah. Well, you know, like I, I think that um, what's really amazing is that the research is, is blazing a trail forward, discovering more and more foods that can actually um, provide the fiber that actually feeds the gut bacteria and also other elements, other bioactives, natural chemicals in the food that actually activate our other health defenses as well angiogenesis, stem cells we haven't talked about yet, um, the DNA repair, as well as the immune system. And so there are some foods that I call them grand slammers, because not only are they good for the gut microbiome, they pop up all the other four health defenses as well to really give you, you know, I don't call it a superfood because I think that that's kind of a marketing slogan. Um, when it comes to food and health, it's not so much about a superfood. It's really about the super body. Like that's what we're beginning to realize is that we're really designed pretty amazingly well if we don't harm it. So uh, what are some foods that can actually do that? Green tea, actually a food that actually has fiber. Matcha, which is a whole tea leaf, even more fiber. Great for the gut microbiome, lowers inflammation, activates our angiogenesis system, starves cancer, kills cancer stem cells, protects DNA with antioxidants, slows down the burning of your of cellular aging uh, by, by protecting your telomeres and immune boosting. That's an example of something that you could sip all day long, and I do myself, green tea, and you can actually get all these benefits while you're taking care of your gut bacteria. Where's another one? Another one would be dark chocolate. Now, chocolate, a chocolate bar you might buy at a gas station, okay, is a confection. What I'm talking about is dark chocolate, you know, like 80% or higher. It's mostly cacao, all right? Cacao, which is a plant-based food, is a seed pot, and it's got tons of dietary fiber. So if you have really dark chocolate not that doesn't, isn't filled with a lot of nougat and all these extra sweeteners and all these artificial chemicals, you have something that actually can feed your gut microbiome. And the, and the cacao, I've done research on this, anti-angiogenic on one hand, prevents cancers from being fed. On the other hand, it actually can um, groom your blood vessels to make them healthier. Um, uh, if your blood vessels are scraped up, damaged, whether it's from smoking, atherosclerosis, cholesterol, um, COVID, for example, um, uh, dark chocolate um, can stimulate a process that can help to resurface and clean up our blood vessels, kind of like a Zamboni does 
uh, after a hockey game, you know, that big machine that drives out of the side of the rink and it literally just like grooms the ice. So it's perfectly smooth, perfect ice afterwards. So dark chocolate's one of those foods that can actually do that. It's another grand slammer because it has so many great um, properties. Tree nuts is another one. Tree nuts feeds a gut microbiome. Uh, cashews, walnuts, almonds, pistachios, pine nuts, uh, pecans. Those are just some examples of great tree nuts. Um, uh, I would avoid having them if they've been deep fried or, or coated in uh, uh, sugar or other artificial seasonings. I always tell people like if you're going to have a, a trail mix, okay, make it yourself with the un uh, seasoned, artificially seasoned nuts. And if you're going to buy nuts raw, look at the ingredients on the side or with the can container they come from. Make sure there, there's nothing added to them that you don't want to be in your body. And those, the fiber from nuts actually activates your gut microbiome, but they also support all your other health defenses as well. And earlier, Dr. Lee, you touched on calories, but I want to take some time and go into the nuances here because it seems like there's so many different camps, you know, in the calorie realm, people that are diehard counting calories, people that say calories don't matter. And then I'm somewhere in between where I think they have some value, but they're not the whole story. How do you feel about calories when it comes to food consumption? Yeah, again, I, I'm a scientist, I'm a doctor. So I sort of go by, what does the science tell me? And then as a doctor, I think about like, what's best for my patients or what's been, what do I know about how the body responds? And I'm a researcher because I, I really am excited to sort of see what are we new, newly discovering about the body. So calories to me is just a word. It's a label and it's a label for the units of energy that we get from our food. It's our fuel in the same way that we call gallons, you know, or octane for, uh, uh, Gallons are how we call the quantity of fuel that we put into our car. Octane is the quality of the fuel, right? So calories are like, like the gallons. Like, and, and I, I don't want to get fixated on how many gallons, counting your gallons, you know, gallons in, gallons out. Like that actually kind of beats the point. You're just focusing on the volume of things. Look, I think what you want to do is focus on the quality of the calories, quality of the energy that you're consuming. Get good quality fuel in your body. Number one. Number two, don't overload your tank. Don't overload with calories. It's very simple. But, you know, to get fixated on, the, on like the numerical counting, if you're really disciplined, you can, you can do that. I don't have a problem with that. But it, for most people, I would say most people watching this, it's really hard to keep that up over a long period of time. And I would prefer people to not expend their brain power trying to count all the calories and make a log of it and all that stuff. Um, Use your body, get into a harmony, get into a flow that works for you. Get your body in fuel burning, fat burning mode. Up your metabolism. You'll feel it. You'll feel more energy. And focus on things like making delicious choices for your food. Like in my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, I write about 150 different foods that you know you can find in an everyday grocery store, in almost every section of the grocery store, and not expensive stuff either. They're, they're very, very inexpensive foods. Put them together in delicious combinations that harken back to the Mediterranean cuisine or the Asian cuisine, you know, or anything in between and go about your way. Use your life. I mean, time is the most precious commodity. And I think for people that are really trying to count calories, do it if you've got the bandwidth and if you've got the discipline to do it, don't do it and try to be a little bit more relaxed about coming into harmony with yourself if you have other better things that you want to use your time on. I think it's important we address that just because typically, classically, when people come into the weight loss realm, what they're told by their doctor is to cut calories and move their body more. So a lot of people come to this conversation, that's probably all they've ever heard. So we just want to bring light to that part of the conversation and how it fits in. Yeah. Now, now look, the other things we have touched on, but that is probably worth at this point talking about is that you're putting fuel into the car. Um, you want to really don't forget like the next day or, you know, your next meal, you're going to be filling up again. We do know that your metabolism, uh, works best when you're actually, uh, burning fuel at a higher level. So that's staying physically active, staying physically active can mean getting a trainer and working out. Doesn't mean that you have to train for the Ironman or the, or a marathon. 
Um, and But it surely doesn't mean on the other end of the spectrum, sitting down like a couch potato, doing nothing, and especially eating junk while you're sitting down. So um, I think it's very important to know that regular physical activity, movement, even for a half an hour a day, that can be exercising. It could be working out. It could be just walking around your house regularly, moving. You want to move. You know, you don't need a aerobic exercise. You know, cardio is always good, better, good for you, better for you. All right. But, but just regular moving, you know, if you're walking, move your arms and legs. That counts as well. In fact, the study that I cite in um, my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, actually shows that amazingly, this was studied in England, even fidgeting can actually burn calories. So if you're fidgeting, will actually burn fat. Why? Because you know that fidgeting is like tap, 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 or shaking the legs, swinging back and forth. Even that is better than sitting down like a lump doing nothing. So stay physically active is absolutely vital for keeping your metabolism in good shape because we do need to burn down some of those extra calories, um, that the extra fuel that we're actually eating. Same, similarly, sleeping, getting a good quality sleep allows that extra burn as well. So movement, physical activity, and sleep, absolutely vital for being able to uh, um, help uh, burn body fat, help you with weight loss. Um, uh, and then, by the way, the other thing, the other kind of leg of the stool is actually stress management. Because when we are stressed out, we've got cortisol pouring out of our body, which increases our waistline, builds body fat. We've also got noradrenaline, norepinephrine surging out of our brain. It's okay in a, in a, in short bursts to have that kind of stress hormone out, kind of keeps us on the edge, sharp. Okay. But when it's continuously pouring out because like you are just so stressed about your work or about your relationship or about your whatever, your finances. And what happens is that excess, um, adrenaline actually causes inflammation in your fat. And so again, managing your stress. And by the way, here's, here's something that, that I was quite fascinated by when I was researching and writing my book. You know, stress. What is stress? Well, it's a lot of things to a lot of people. What is one really common type of, of chronic uh, uh, stress? Anger. Anger that you hold inside. Look, everyone gets pissed off every now and then. Outraged, pissed off. You blow off some steam, whatever. But, you know, how common is it? And I would tell you it's very common. Everyone has it where, um, you know, you just let something smolder inside you. You are angry and you haven't dealt with it. You don't know how to manage it. You hold it inside, stuff it. And then what winds up happening is that you are in a constant state of stress. That also screws your metabolism. So again, you know, we talked about the eating and the time restriction of, of time restricted eating and fasting. Um, we talked about all these other tricks as well in terms of, of, um, of uh, how not to overload your food and whether you should snack or not. But all these other factors that you're bringing up, staying physically active so you can burn that fuel, uh, getting good enough sleep so that your, body, your metabolism switched into fuel burning mode, and managing your stress so you're not in a chronic state of tonic stress so that your metabolism is, is, is derailed and you're in a chronic state of inflammation from your body fat. All these things play into each other. And I can imagine for a lot of people, they play into each other in a not so good way where, you know, they're dealing with day to day stress, go, go, go. Maybe they're not sleeping well and they're staying up late watching Netflix or who knows what. And they're not moving their body. Maybe they're, they have a sedentary job and they're gaining weight and all these things are compounding the other way. The good news is these are things we can change. And a conversation like this is bringing light to the different pillars that people need to act upon and start to move the levers the other way. Absolutely. I mean, very much. If you want ultimate health, what you need to start with is understanding how do we orient our body and our behavior in that direction, right? You want to head north, you got to figure out where north is first. So I think number one, understanding that our metabolism is very, very important. That's why I chose to write the sequel to my first book, Eat to Beat Disease. I chose to write it about metabolism and I called it Eat to Beat Your Diet, which is a trick title because it's not a diet book. It's an anti-diet book, which is how do you find your north star when it comes to health by looking for your metabolism. Our metabolism is something we're born with and, to, and it functions, helps us keep going until the day we die. And we want good energy. We want efficient use of energy. And we want to actually use 
every body part um, uh, in its perform in our every organ in the best way it can over the course of our lives. So to get towards that ultimate health, understand our, your metabolism, the, en- the engine that drives you um, in the right direction towards ultimate health. And if you want to take care of your metabolism, allow your body to do what it is hardwired to do. Go through those four phases leverage the fact that when you're not eating, your body's burning down fat, which elevates your metabolism naturally. Make sure you're taking care, good care of your gut, your gut health. Don't eat too late. In addition to the effect on your metabolism, it also can mess up the circadian cycle of your gut microbiome. And then they get confused and now they're not playing ball with you either. And so all these different kinds of as- aspects, you know, play into adding exercise, physical activity, making sure you're getting good quality sleep and finding ways to cope and manage stress. And I think this conversation, by the way, uh, Jesse, is ever more important because of where we are in the world today. We just came out of the, the tube of, of real darkness and stress, uh, at, you know, from 2020, uh, during the, you know, the, the height of the COVID pandemic. We've got all kinds of things happening in the world, whether it's war, whether it's climate change, whether it's economy. There's a lot of reasons that we need to kind of maybe reel ourselves back in and not just let ourselves out there on the fringes getting battered by these gale force winds. Bring yourself back together. Center yourself. Figure out who you are and what gives you that calm to be able to you work on these aspects of diet, physical activity, sleep, and stress. Eat, move, sleep, smile. These are really core concepts. We're going to get to some of the top foods soon that can help fix the metabolism. But before we do, I want to talk about while we're still in that calorie realm, a lot of people, again, coming back to that classic advice where people want to cut down on calories and move their body more to burn fat. Let's talk about, because this this ties into metabolism, let's talk about what happens to metabolism when we start to really cut those calories down how that can slow metabolism and actually work against us. Well, again, it's not a light switch. It's really more of a volume switch. So when we actually cut our calories down, one of the things that we're doing is we're slowing the fuel being loaded into our fat cells. And uh, and if we're not, and if we're cutting our calories down by giving our time, more time not eating, we're actually giving ourselves time to burn fuel as well. But there is an extreme to that. So if you cut your calories so excessively, so extremely, severely, that you're actually just not getting enough fuel, that's pretty much like running your car on empty all the time. Like we all have been through this, right? I mean, you know, uh, you know, I could probably run, I could probably get to the store without filling up, or I could drive home without filling up. You know, you know what that feels like. You feel like you're skating on thin ice, like maybe you you probably make it, but maybe you won't. Like that's actually stressful itself. And our metabolism actually feels stressed out when it knows that it is running out of fuel. That's why it's so important for us to listen to our body. And by the way, when we actually run out of fuel stored from our fat, you know where the metabolism normally goes to draw energy, our body goes? It starts to knock out muscle. It starts to burn your muscle. When And this really is sort of the kiss of death. You cross that line to start burning fuel from your fat and you start burning down muscle and you lose start start losing losing muscle mass now you're in a world of hurt in fact almost all the studies have shown it's a lot worse to be sarcopenic which means that you're burning down and losing muscle mass than it is to gain a little extra body fat body fat is really good muscle is absolutely critical when you are cutting your calories so severely that you're cutting into your muscle man like this this is the beginning of the end like you actually need Re, like metabolic resuscitation in that sense. Uh, clinical studies have actually shown, you know, when they look at people who go for a heart procedure called a cardiac catheterization, this is where the cardiologist takes you into the cath lab, they call it. Uh, we call it, and basically they put a little um, wire through your leg up into your heart and they squirt a little dye and on a screen, they can actually see how well your blood is flowing into the big vessels of your heart. If there's a blockage, you'll spot it right there and you can stent it open or knock it out, drill it, suck it out. So that's very common. It's a, it's a procedure that's invasive. There's a little bit of risk to it. And studies have shown that people who are ultra skinny and underweight are at greater risk for complication and death from that procedure than people who are overweight or obese. 
surprisingly, right? You'd think a skinny person might have less heart disease. Well, it turns out that if you have a complication of the medical procedure, being sarcopenic and having drawn down on your muscle mass, losing muscle mass is a lot more dangerous than actually having a little bit extra body fat. And tying in this muscle piece back to exercise, this can be another way, going the other way, building muscle, a good way to enhance your metabolism. That's right. And help with glucose regulation. That's right. Because actually building up your muscle requires, the muscle itself requires more metabolism, more metabolic capability to maintain that extra muscle mass. You know, it's just sort of like, you're going to bring an extra sports car into your garage. You're going to need more fuel, more better fuel, right? So basically, this is what happens when we're working out. A lot of people think about it as as feeling better, which is very, very important. Um, you know, like thinking about your long term health is a conceptual goal. You you don't you can't get in a time machine to know what you're going to be like in five years or ten years. So what you're doing is you're you're counting on how you feel and also how you look. Now, when you have more muscle. You're obviously going to look a little better. Most people feel like they're going to look better. Um, but in point of fact, uh, what it is is you're improving your metabolic capacity. The other thing that's happening when you build extra muscle, by the way, a lot of people don't know this. When you work out, when you exercise, all right, building more muscle is about breaking down the existing amount of muscle you have. Okay, you stress it out by working out. You tear your muscle a little bit when you're lifting, for example, or when you're running. You're actually stressing out and stretching your muscles and damaging your muscles a little bit. That's okay. Your body is super resilient to exercise. And when it rebuilds itself and regenerates itself and uses stem cells to create more muscle, okay, what's actually happening, it's growing new muscle. It's got to grow new blood vessels and new nerves. It's got to gain more cellular metabolic capacity to be able to use your fuel even more efficiently. So for all these reasons, having more muscle mass contributes to your health. Let's move into stem cells, go deep into this, because I think a lot of people, when they hear about stem cells, they think about more modern technology where people are, you know, taking fluids out of the body and, and then re-injecting stem cells in, which is, which is a thing. But let's talk about the fact that as adults, we still have stem cells in our body and there are different foods that we can use to encourage their, their health. Right. Okay. Well, Let's let's first try to define stem cells. So uh, I'm somebody who works in stem cells. I have helped and been involved with efforts in biotechnology to develop those artificial high tech stem cells that you pull out of the body, out of the fluid, and inject it back in um, into the heart or the brain. I can tell you, it's not ready for prime time yet. Uh, we're we're working hard on it. It might be. A few more years or maybe a few more decades before that actually winds up becoming ready to be used as a medical treatment. In the meantime, we've got a ton of stem cells in our body. Everyone listening to this podcast actually has stem cells. And why is that? It's because when we were developing, let's go back to our mom's womb. Um, we were just a few cells. Okay. We were um, stem cells. We were all formed from stem cells. We were made, um, you know, it was like, a few weeks after we were our, we we were uh, created by conception, our stem cells started. Our we our we were stem cells. Our stem cells started to form our chin, our ear, our liver, our hearts, our brains, our eyes. It didn't stop, by the way, until we were ready to be born at nine months. Our stem cells kept on working it. Now, when we're born. There's still stem cells that are trying to follow us to keep, do that last minute kind of work, um, even trapped in the umbilical cord. So you've heard of stem cell, like uh, uh, the stem cells from the umbilical cord that they harvest when you're delivering a baby. Those are those last bits of stem cells that are still following us, trying to trying to get to us before we're born. But when we're born, cord is cut. You get your spanking. You take your breath of air. Now you crawl up, get your microbiome and take your first drink of mother's milk. All right. Um, you have extra stem cells in your body. How many? About 70 million extra stem cells. It's a lot of stem cells. Now, why do we have ex why there's extra stem cells who've already born? Well, think about your bot your your the body being created like like a like a like a project that like a home project where you're painting a room. All right. You're gonna paint your room a new color, you're gonna test the paint out and, and say it looks pretty good. You're gonna go out and buy some more paint. You're always going to buy some extra cans of paint, right? Because the last thing that you want to do is to 
get to, you know, get to, oh, you're almost done with your uh, room and you run out of paint and you're like, ah, I, I ran out. So our body's the same way. They created extra cans of paint, ex extra stem cells. So we have overage. Now, 70 million extra stem cells that we're born with, they get stuffed into our bone marrow, hidden in our fat, okay? Some packed into our liver so and in our lungs. So we've got extra stem cells and these are bullets in our gun to regenerate our body throughout our lives. Whenever we have something that needs to be repaired, regenerated, okay, it's silent. You won't see it. You know, um, uh, you can't see it in a mirror. It's, our stem cells are regenerating fr uh, from the inside out. Now, how do we know that works? We know our gut regenerates. We know our hair regenerates. We know our skin regenerates. You ever um, eat like a, a really sharp chip or something like that and you and you scrape the, to the top of your mouth? And for sure, or thing. cereal, or, or, or yeah, yes. man, does that hurt, right? And you see that little thing of you feel that thing with your tongue, a little ring of tissue hanging down. All right, by the next day, that's all fixed. All right, and the reason it's fixed is that your body regenerated that with stem cells, not just healed it up, but regenerated that. Here's some other interesting things that most people know. If you had a surgeon go into your belly and remove two thirds of your liver, the liver detoxifies the body remove two thirds of it, that remaining one third will grow the rest of the two thirds back. Quite amazing. The liver can fully regenerate. If you, most people don't know this, but if you were to snip the top of the lung, the lung will regenerate. Okay. And in fact, I think it was last week, there was an announcement of a brand new discovery of a human cell. So there's a new human cell discovered. And this is something that really, I think is so awesome. Being a medical researcher is like, after these thousands of years of medical research, like we're still discovering new cells in the human body. So we discovered a new stem cell in the human lung that regenerates our airways. Think about that. So we can, so we can breathe better. That's really quite amazing. And so these extra stem cells are basically our repairmen waiting to actually fix things from the inside out, ready to roll. And they regenerate slowly, though. Okay, so most most of the time it regenerates slowly. Like the mouth will heal fast. If you scrape your cornea, it'll it hurts like stink. You're, you you'll go to sleep because your body says you got to close up your eyes. Your 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 stem cells will repair your cornea. The next day you'll be fine. Okay, um, but uh, uh, your heart, your brain, your spinal cord, very slow regeneration. So what drug companies are trying to do is to squirt extra stem cells into you, but your body can actually do it. Here's the cool part. And again, because I worked on the biotech side of this, I was able to actually take a look at the food part. You throw foods into the system. There are foods that can stimulate regeneration as well. Olive oil, fish oil, dark chocolate, mushrooms, barley, uh, apple peel. These are some of the foods that can actually spark, trigger regeneration in your body to, to use those stem cells on your, on your behalf. When you say the uh, injection piece isn't fully there yet and we're working on it, what do you mean by that? Is it is it not helpful to people, or is it actually causing harm? Well, so if if so, let's let's let me explain how we do the research for injecting stem cells. First, you got to get them. So where do you get them? Well, you can go into the bone marrow. I told you that's where the extra cans of paint are stored, um, and you can stick a pretty fat needle into your into your hip bone. Is a good place to go get it. Suck out some bone marrow, okay, in a syringe. And then grow out those stem cells. All right. Um, another place you can go, by the way, is your fat. So plastic surgeons will go for liposuction and suck out some of the fat and then remove the stem cells. How do you remove the stem cells from fat? You pour it into a test tube and you spin it in a centrifuge. Okay. The fat floats to the top. The stem cells go to the bottom. When you stop the whirring, you pull it out. You got a little pellet of stem cells. You pour out the fat. You take the stem cells. Now, the key thing is you got to grow those stem cells because whenever you suck out, not that much, you want to really grow them out. So you send them away, FedEx them to a cell farm. Okay, believe it or not, there are actually farms that grow cells. And they basically will have like, it's like a file cabinet. It's full of cells growing. All right, like 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 an aquarium, if you think about it. Um, and they're all growing cells. Once you grow enough, they FedEx it back to the doctor. And this is all in clinical trials. This is how we're trying to figure out how to do it biotech style. Now you've got a vial with a lot of stem cells that were grown out from whatever you sucked out of your bone marrow or your fat. And then you got to figure out how to deliver it to where you need to go. The heart, the brain, the spinal cord, wherever, the knee, 
Okay. And so all those steps are still in the process of being refined. And then when you run the clinical trials to see if you're actually able to help people reliably, what we're finding is that some people benefit like gangbusters, quite amazing. People that are paralyzed can start to move again. People that can't breathe can breathe again. People that, you know, have terrible chest pain, <clears throat> they don't have to take pills anymore. They can tie their shoes. They can, I mean, I have some amazing stories about stem cell therapy, <clears throat> excuse me, but we're not ready yet for prime time, which means that these haven't been yet been perfected to the point that most people will benefit. So not ready for prime time means we're not ready to get it approved yet by the FDA so that the medical community at large can start to prescribe. I hear you. You gave some great examples there of foods that can help support our stem cells. The other side to that is cancer makes its own stem cells. So in that case, there's specific foods that we can you know, include in our diet to kill those. So can you talk about what those are? Right. Well, so what's really, really amazing is that these stem cells that we uh, need to regenerate us from the inside out, they also happen to pop up when those microscopic cancers grow, right? So remember I told you it's sort of like the 10,000 mistakes a day and then you turn to these little pimples and are sitting around, they don't have a blood supply, cops on a beat into your immune system, wing by to take them away. They stick around long enough and they grow large enough, they will create their own stem cells, okay? And when they when the microscopic cancers create their own stem cells, and it takes a while, they gotta be pretty big, like they gotta get a blood supply, they gotta escape your immune system. Those stem cells, um, uh, are real, a real problem because if you use surgery or chemotherapy and you kill most of those cells, if there's any stem cells that are left, guess what? They're going to regenerate that cancer. And all of us know somebody who had cancer who looked like they were in remission or maybe cured. And oh man, like five years later, it comes back and then they don't do so well. Right. That's, that's an unfortunate story that we're all familiar with with somebody that we know. And. Why did it come back? Cancer stem cells. So what's good news is that there are some foods that actually kill cancer stem cells. This is a holy grail, bio, by the way, in biotechnology. There's no drug, although many drug companies have tried. There's no pharmaceutical, and there's no biotech drug that can kill a cancer stem cell. Yet Mother Nature is already created. It's in olive oil, hydroxytyrosine. It's in dark chocolate. It's in um, oregano. Uh, it's in tree nuts, walnuts. Um, in fact, there's a study that showed in people with stage three colon cancer, stage three, pretty advanced, who are getting treatment, that um, those people who actually had two fistfuls, two one ounce servings of tree nuts, okay, that's like 14 walnuts um, or, or seven, you know, 14 walnuts a, a week, okay, uh, over the course of a week. Think of it as a snack, trail mix, okay, that, that they actually had a 50% decrease in mortality or better response to their treatment. They responded better because they were eating tree nuts. So this isn't food versus medicine. This is food and medicine. So how does that make sense? Well, besides feeding the gut microbiome and rearing up your immune system to tackle the cancer, okay, um, guess what else? Walnuts have another natural bioactive that kill colon cancer stem cells specifically. So again, this is really part of the just how precise we're trying to get in food as medicine research to really get that to the bottom of like what foods that are practical and all around um, can that around us that we're familiar with um, that people actually like can actually be useful in supporting health and fighting disease. During that example there, you talked about revving the immune system up, and this is what's commonly talked about in the health and wellness space. What can I take to you know boost my immune system, which is an important piece, and I want to get into some specific foods that we can take on an ongoing basis to help with that. But let's start by talking about from the other end of things, autoimmune disease. People that have an overactive immune system, and they want to help tame that down using their diet. Okay, so... We got to understand what the immune system actually is. The immune system is an army of super soldiers that are in all of our bodies. And I use that term super soldiers specifically because there's a lot of different types of immune cells 
a lot of different parts of the immune system that all, that each part, each type, uh, each part of the immune system, each type of cell in the immune system has its own special weapons, own special tactics, own special training, but they all work together as part of a team to kind of defeat the enemy, whatever that enemy might be. So the enemy could be on the outside of the body, bacteria, viruses, fungus, right? Um, and that's why we know just from the last couple of years with the pandemic, how important a good, strong immune system actually is. But the enemy can also be on the inside. And that enemy is cancer, microscopic cancers. Remember I told you about the drug dealer on the corner of the suburb and the cops and a bee coming by. You need your immune system to conduct surveillance, patrol, to make sure there isn't anything, any invaders on the inside of our body as well. We also, by the way, have um, uh, a... Uh, and those are specialized super soldiers. We also basically have um, uh, the ability to mount uh, inflammation, which is important for healing a wound and cleaning up a problem. So if you scrape your knee, you fall down on a bike, you know, cut yourself uh, uh, in the kitchen somehow with a kitchen knife, um, pretty quickly you'll see a little redness around your wound, okay? It'll sting, it'll burn, it'll swell. That's inflammation. And what that's part of your immune system doing is cleaning up all the bad guys in there, killing bacteria, killing viruses. You're, this is a different part of your immune system that goes in there and just basically fries anything and everything that might be harmful. It's a quick blunt instrument response. Okay. It's busting out the fire extinguisher, just like blowing it at the, 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 um, at the stovetop for the kitchen fire, you know, the stovetop fire. You'll put it out. Okay. That's inflammation. But inflammation, if it, if, if it doesn't go out and it's allowed to burn, again, like the kitchen stovetop fire, like your pan's on fire, and it keeps going, you don't put it out, and it starts to spread, and now it's on your kitchen counter, now it's burning up your uh, cabinets, that's chronic inflammation. When it doesn't go out and it rears up further and further. Now, um, and that's, a, that's where disease comes in, because your, your body, your own immune system is a defense system. That zone that we talked about, your immune system knows how to turn up and turn down inflammation. And against those outside invaders, it produces antibodies to, it's, that's targeted to the outside invaders. So a virus that we might recognize today, okay, the gold virus or the chickenpox virus, it will remember that virus. And, in, and if the, through intelligence, it's kind of like an intelligence agency, it sees it again, it's going to pop out the weapons, the right special forces that take that out. What happens though is um, if it goes overboard in that kind of out exterior defense um, uh, function and you have excessive immunity and even worse, if your immune system actually accidentally trains itself against your own body, because your immune system doesn't actually normally attack yourself, but if it actually accidentally attacks your own body, um, like your intestines, for example, that's what happens in celiac disease. Um, gluten that you might eat affects your intestinal lining and your immune system learns how to figure out where gluten passed by. And wherever, whenever you've got gluten in your system, your own immune system will attack your gut, which is why people with celiac disease have to stay away from gluten, which is why people are in so, so much agony when they actually have gluten sensitivity as well. But it can be worse. You could have lupus. Now you're attacking the whole body. You could have rheumatoid arthritis that's attacking your joints. You could have psoriatic arthritis that's now attacking your skin. Autoimmune disease is basically your normal health defenses on steroids gone wrong, okay? And so you, so you want to kind of yoke that back. And it turns out that while drugs can actually play a very powerful role in yoking back your immune system, foods are another way to quell, calm your immune system, down boy kind of thing. And it turns out that there are foods like uh, that that have been studied in Japan, for example. Um, there's a section, a prefecture in Japan called the Miyagi Prefecture. High rate of lupus in that area. Autoimmune disease affects mostly women. Um, uh, some men can be affected as well. It's terrible. I mean, over the course of your life, your immune system continuously attacks your body. You've got flares. They studied and they found that um, uh, foods that contain a lot of vitamin C can actually quell the inflammation and lower the flare by 70% of lupus flares. That's really important. So what are some foods that contain vitamin C? Strawberries, red bell peppers, um, guava, uh, tomatoes. 
Those are good examples of foods that actually are very, of course, citrus. They're rich laden with vitamin C that um, can, has been shown to actually quell inflammation. Green tea, another benefit uh, is that it actually lowers and softens inflammation. And this is uh, studies as well, human studies. I like to, wherever possible, talk about where the human research has been done because that's a rubber meets the road. Green tea and green tea extracts have been shown to quell lupus as well. And so again, this is another thing where the doctor might write you a prescription for steroids or a biologic agent. Those probably will be effective. They're pretty powerful. They also have side effects. So is there something you can do for yourself that maybe allow you to go on a lower dose or eventually come off the treatment? Yeah, food is one of those things that is that tool in the toolbox that we're beginning to realize we need to be adding to the treatment of autoimmune diseases. You talked about that three hours before bed, and I totally agree. For people that are new to intermittent fasting, I think that's the best start for people for two reasons. One being the one that you said where you get that three hours of fat burning added to when you're sleeping. Two is that you're going to sleep a lot better that way too. You don't want to be consuming food and spiking your blood glucose and trying to digest while you're sleeping, which ties back into everything we're talking about today, where sleep is part of healing our metabolism. So everything's intertwined and there's 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 a couple different benefits there from cutting off eating after dinner. And I'll tell you one more thing. Um, they've actually studied this late night eating, food late night. So, you know, we get extra glucose, high levels of insulin, just you said, it's not so good for our metabolism. But guess what? We're also feeding our gut microbiome. And studies have shown when you eat late at night, like snacking late at night, like midnight snack, all right? What happens, you're feeding our meta where our gut bacteria. Our gut bacteria have, believe it or not, a circadian clock. They know what time it is. And they know very well that when it's time to get ready for bed, they shouldn't be fed. When they are fed, your gut bacteria are fed late at night. They have trouble digesting and metabolizing the food that they're eating to create their short chain fatty acids, which by the way, they normally do to lower inflammation. So when you eat late at night and you disrupt the circadian cycle of our gut, ba your gut bacteria, they don't make the same degree of short chain fatty acids. And guess what? Inflammation rises as well. So not only are you not getting a good night's sleep, your inflammation in your body is rising as well. And, and on top of that, your gut bacteria is getting confused. Like this is, by the way, why shift workers often have difficulty with their metabolism. Yeah, that makes sense. And how do you feel about people? Because a lot of people, the nature of our conversation are going to come here wanting to lose a few pounds. How do you feel about people pushing that eating window or narrowing it, I should say, if weight loss is part of their goals right now? And obviously, I'll caveat that by saying you don't want to go and all of a sudden start intermittent fasting for 16 hours a day if this is new to you and you have a higher carb diet because it's going to be an absolute nightmare. But for somebody to build up over time and use fasting as a tool, especially in the beginning when they're really trying to ramp up their weight loss. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, this has to do with what your goals are. If you're setting out to try to lose weight and burn fat, okay, and by the way, you want to do this to gain inner health. Vanity, I'm totally cool with vanity. You know, you should feel if you feel good by looking good, go for it. But what I am concerned about is really as a doctor and as a scientist, how do we actually gain inner health? If you're good on the inside, by the way, you're going to be, you're going to look better on the outside uh, no matter what. It's just that if you only work on the outside, but you're really kind of having problems on the inside, that's just cosmetics and inside could be, have a real problem. So what I always tell people is that if your goal is to actually lose weight, intermittent fasting, it's it's a trend, but it's really not something that was invented in order to create a trend. It's the most natural thing we do. Just eat. We intermittently eat and we intermittently don't eat. eat. Um, so we fast and we don't fast. So, but, but research has shown if you actually go 12 and 12, 12 eating, 12 not eating, as I told you, totally fine. Um, in fact, studies have shown that you can, you can lose about, uh, you, you can lose about 10 pounds. Uh, you know, by, by intermittent fasting like that, 12 and 12, if you want to lose more, you gotta, you gotta up your fasting period. You can ramp it up almost 30%. If you actually then crank it up to 16 hours of fasting. So 16 hours of fasting is basically like going to bed the same time I told you 
But remember, I told you, you've got 12 hours if you um, don't eat uh, breakfast until eight. Now you got to gain an extra four hours. So you got to not eat. So you skip breakfast and don't eat till lunch the next day. You get your 16 hours. Now, research has shown if you do that, and yes, you're giving your body extra fat burning time, you will lose extra weight, but you'll actually start losing weight just with a very reasonable 12 hours. And that's really what I, the message I want to send. Yes, you can push it. You can actually go 16 fasting, 8 eating, but 12 fasting and 12 eating also works. If you want to fast even longer, I mean, people have fasted um, 18 hours. People have fasted the whole day. Yes, you will actually lose, you will burn more body fat. Now, here's the thing that's important to understand. The difference between metabolic fasting, which we're talking about with intermittent fasting, 12 and 12, easy way to do it. I wouldn't, that would, that's a nice area to start and aim at. And if you can maintain that your whole life, you're going to be actually in pretty good shape. You'll be in a good zone. But don't forget, intermittent fasting, fasting is a continuum it's a it's a scale all the way to starvation, all right. If you got shipped on wrecked on a desert island with no food, yeah, you'd be intermittently fasting too. But eventually, you would actually be starving. And when you starve and you overfast, the problem is that you can actually cut into your muscle mass and you'll start to destroy your muscle mass. What's worse than actually gaining body fat is gaining body fat while you're losing muscle mass. So got to be really careful about this stuff. Um, uh, you know, and, and I think that just reasonable approaches for reasonable people usually is something that people can stick with. And that's how you get better health. You talked about the aspect of somebody's eating at night, the impact on the gut microbiome being, you know, less than healthy. What happens when people start pushing fast a little bit longer? in relation to the microbiome. So if people are doing 16 hour fasts, 24 hour fasts and giving that microbiome a break, obviously no foods coming into the system during that period to feed them, how do they respond? So again, this continuum, if you fast for an extraordinary long period of time till you're starving, your bacteria are actually going to start dying as well. You know, they're not being fed. They need food. It's like not feeding your goldfish, you know, in your tank for a long time. So that's the extreme. Reel it back. Okay. And now what's amazing is actually when you give your gut bacteria a break, proper break, and you're, but when you're, when you're eating, you're eating healthy things. During the fasting time, your bacteria reboot themselves. That's really quite amazing. They reboot themselves by first getting rid of bad actors. It's like purging the neighborhood of the crack dealers, all right. And our gut bacteria, thirty-nine trillion. They've got, um, uh, they've got um, a whole variety. It's a very diverse uh, ecosystem. But the problem that we have when we have when we suffer from bad gut health is really we have got a few bad bacteria that are growing. Some of these bacteria, when they overgrow, can actually be even lethal uh, uh, if if we don't watch out, like like C. diff and Pseudomonas. Other types of bacteria that we see in the hospital as doctors. But generally speaking, when we give our gut bacteria a break so that they're not overly taxed all the time with food, then they can actually reboot themselves. When they reboot, they're also lowering inflammation more effectively. They're supporting your immune system. They help your immune system uh, reboot as well. And they also um, uh, participate in all kinds of other healing functions that are also uh, beneficial as well. So again, this is all just um, leveraging the systems that are already present in our body. We haven't even talked about what foods you should eat or can eat to improve your metabolism. This is just playing around with your operating system. We're going to get to those foods, but before we do, let's really hash out this when you eat piece. And the last area I want to dive into within that is eating during our specific eating window, which is going to be different depending on the person and what their health goals are. But say somebody is having a later breakfast like you and, and stopping their meals at dinner. Are you a fan of having snacks during that eating window? And when I say snacks, I want to caveat that as well. I'm not talking about sugar and processed foods. You know, if you're getting hungry in between your breakfast and lunch, are you going to have an apple and some nut butter and whatever a healthy snack is to you? How do you feel about that? I, I feel totally fine with that. With the understanding that you got to realize when you snack because you are listening to your body, 
and your body's telling you the fuel tank is running a little low, time to fill up with a little bit of gas, and you pick the right foods to snack on. It could be nut, uh, it could be tree nuts, it could be you know some other healthy uh, piece of fruit or whatever. Um, that's actually an okay thing. Again, when you're snacking, if you don't overeat and you choose the right snacks. But so many of us actually snack out of habit. Well, you know, I'm just sitting at my desk and I'm working and I'm just going to reach over there and grab that whatever. If it's a, if it's a chocolate bar, you know, filled with nougat and all kinds of other, you know, uh, 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 uh fructose and all kinds of other artificial things, preservatives in it, that's not a good choice. And then you're, once, and you know, we, our brain's addicted to sugar. Oh, now we're going to eat another one. Now we're going to eat another one. It's like the proverbial, how are you going to clean up all that Halloween candy you collected when you were a kid? All right. Um, I think that snacking is one of those things where if you listen to your body and you need a little more fuel, that's perfectly fine. Choose the right fuel. High quality fuel is what you would want to put in your car. If you're somebody who takes care of your car well, you know, you have a choice at the filling station, at the gas station to choose what kind of fuel you want to put in. Want to put the cheap stuff in? It'll be fine, you know, for once or once in a while. But if all you do is put the cheapest quality fuel in your car, I guarantee you, your car is not going to run as well or as long as somebody who really takes good care of their car and tries to put high quality fuel. Snacking with high quality fuel is very important for your overall health and not over snacking, meaning you're not overeating even when you're snacking. This is a, by the way, this is the whole um, uh, the a- aspect of really listening to your body so that you understand what your needs are as opposed to falling into a habit where then you're mindlessly eating. If you're mindfully eating connected to your body, it's a lot safer. And this ties into the snacking piece. Do you feel like people ever, and the insulin that we were talking about before, do you feel like during that eating window, whether somebody is snacking or not, they get into fat burning mode? Because we know overnight with the fast, you know, insulin's going to come down and we're going to go into fat burning. And the longer we do that, the the longer we're going to spend in there and burn more fat. But what I'm getting at here is the nuances within the eating window. If somebody is not going to snack and say they have a few hours in between meals, are they actually going to get into fat burning? And then I would assume if they are snacking, they're going to, you know... As long as there's some carbohydrate in there, they're going to bring the insulin up and they're going to go into building and not burning. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you you got it exactly down right. If you're snacking, your insulin's going to go up, your fuel, your metabolism is going to switch back into fuel storing mode. But this is all a matter of degree. If you snack and keep eating and are munching continuously, you know, and I'm not just talking about like tree nuts, like you know, a thing of walnuts or pecans or almonds. I'm talking or cashews. I'm talking about the bag of chips, you know, or or the the thing of candy, where you're just mindlessly eating and snacking, yeah, you're going to really raise your insulin high. I think a little mild snacking, you know, you'll flip your body away from fuel burning mode. So if you want to be disciplined about it, again, this is a matter of what your goals are. If you are really trying to empower yourself to lose as much weight, fight as much body fat, improve your metabolism as much as possible, here's basically what it is: listen to your body, um, try not to snack. Give yourself as much fuel burning time as possible. Um, and by the way, listen to your body, meaning that if you don't snack and you are really hungry, be very careful because sna- snacking a little bit is okay. It's a lot better to raise your insulin a little bit during snacking than it is to feel ravenous at your next meal and then fall into that, oh my gosh, I'm hungry, and start to stuff your face and overflow your fuel tanks. And so Again, everyone is different. I mean, this is the other thing to really realize. It's And I read about this in my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet. It's really about what works for you, personalization. Every individual is unique and different. Your needs are different than my needs, are different than the person who's watching this needs. We all need to understand there's some hardwiring and programming that works for us. We have to just tweak it a little bit so that we can get what we need out of it without having to slavishly follow somebody else's rules. Let's talk about foods that are the biggest offenders, things we want to be on the lookout for that are destroying our health. Yeah, well, Jesse, this is such an important topic. And uh, while I mostly spend my research time looking at what foods to add, the truth of the matter is, is that most of us in modern society living our ordinary lives are encountering foods every single day. 
that are not so good for us. So while it's very important to know how to choose the right foods, it's equally important to know what foods we want to be cautious of, wary, and cut down or cut out or avoid altogether, right? And so, you know, the research has pretty been pretty conclusive that many of the foods that we were trained on and our parents trained us on and that maybe even our grandparents actually were used to, the kind of the renaissance of processed manufactured foods from the 1950s, post 1950s. These are the things that have, you know, um, rainbow colors. They're ultra sweet. They come in a box, come in a can. The ultra processed foods, they are categorically not good for our health. And although I know that there's a lot of criticism that you know, people throw out there, they throw a lot of shade at ultra processed foods. I think it's important to know the science behind this. And the science behind this is that you have to compare and contrast ultra-processed foods to whole foods, natural foods, unprocessed or minimally processed foods, because really it's comparing one thing versus another. It's not saying that one thing is just, you know, uh, bad all by itself. It's like if you had a a choice between a whole food, unprocessed or minimally processed versus an ultra-processed food, which is better for your health? Now, you know, one might say... What, does, what, what tastes better? What's less expensive? What's more convenient? That's not the question that you're asking me. We're saying, what is it that's better for our health? So here's the thing. Whole unprocessed foods contain uh, uh, not only calories, which is important for our metabolism and our body's energy, our fuel source, but it contains vitamins, minerals, and a lot of bioactives that are found in especially plant-based foods, although they're also found in meats as well, but especially plant-based foods. These bioactives activate our health defenses. And there's like things like dietary fiber and maybe even bacteria that actually are in whole foods. All those things activate our health. And the reason I'm actually taking the moment to, to create that kind of framing is that if you go to the other side of the equation, look at those ultra processed foods they tend to have the bioactives removed from them, the vitamins and minerals removed from them. Most ultra-processed foods, if they've had vitamins, they've been injected somewhere in the factory to replace the ones that were removed. Mostly fiber removed. And even the fiber that's there is synthetic fibers or manufactured processed fibers, not natural fibers that you would find in a fruit or vegetable or a legume or uh, a mushroom like a fungus. So... um, a lot of stuff has been in pro- ultra processed food is natural whole foods, broken down, taken apart, mixed with other foods, reformulated, extruded, and then shaped into a, you know, name your favorite cereal, breakfast cereal, or, or you know, or, or toaster uh, baked good, or whatever it is that you want to think about, or, or you pop in the uh, mi- microwave. Those things are actually missing a lot of the things that are naturally good for us. Now, this is actually why I think that. Uh, one of the reasons why ultra processed foods are not good, not as good as whole foods. But now let's talk about things that actually make ultra processed foods even more damaging. And that is the addition of, what do you think? Additives. So now you want to actually make shelf stable, inexpensive stuff that's going to be shipped around the world and, and stay uh, on a shelf for six months, a year, maybe even longer, you know? Um, uh, And that's when you start putting uh, stabilizers. You start putting preservatives, some natural, some not natural. Um, Oh, the color isn't so appealing. You know, a beautiful strawberry you pick from, uh, you get in the garden or a seasonal blueberry, unmistakable, right? Watermelon during the summer, you slice it open. Man, that's a beautiful color. If you want to make something in a box look like a watermelon, you're going to have to artificially color it. Now you're actually going to put chemicals in there that are actually giving the resemblance of something we want to see as opposed to the thing itself, which would be more natural. And those artificial colors and, by the way, artificial flavors, right? So think about a candy, a watermelon candy. Tastes great, right? But it's like ultra watermelon flavored. None of that is natural, right? Because watermelon actually is very subtle flavor. And so a lot of these processed and ultra processed foods – contain artificial flavoring, artificial coloring, uh, artificial preservatives and stabilizers, and a lot of other synthetics as well as saturated fats, including what used to be a real 
bad guy, which is trans fats loaded into the foods. And then you make it cheap, put it into a box or a can and stick it in the shelf and then um, have a lot of television advertisements um, surrounding us to make us want to buy it. That really is sort of the, the, uh, the, the, the slippery slope to becoming uh, used to and addicted, frankly, to foods that are not so good for our health. Well, that's really interesting. And you took it from the perspective of one end of the continuum, which is processed foods in a classic sense. But I'm curious how you feel about because of technology and this, you know, sudden burst of health and wellness, at least that's how it's appearing to me. It's, it seems exponential. People are becoming more aware and and wanting to take better care of themselves, at least in my world. Again, I might be in a bubble, but I think we better caveat what we're talking about here with this gray area in the middle of foods that are considered, at least by a lot of people in the health and wellness space, as healthy, but they're still processed. Things like dehydrated fruits, or there could be certain organic canned fruits and, and vegetables that are in BPA-free cans. And, and you mentioned you know preservatives and coloring. We could even use the watermelon candy example. There is actually dehydrated organic watermelon. That's one ingredient that we can find in, in a package form. Obviously, it's very different than buying and eating these foods in their whole food form. So I'm curious your take on that in between. Yeah, well, I mean, um, you mentioned dried food, foods. And dried foods by themselves, actually, and I mean, by the way, I, I, I've written a new book on this, which is coming out um, in, in next spring, um, that includes a lot about this. Dried foods by themselves aren't bad. In fact, if you go back 3,000 years uh, in the back to history, where there was the Silk Road that connected China, uh, Asia to Europe, and all the trading that went back and forth, not only with material goods, but also foods, in order to be able to actually put food on the back of a camel and, and walk it across a desert, you know, for three or four weeks, the reality is that most of the food is either dried or put into jars, right? So canning, jarring, and drying is not by itself harmful. It's the stuff that you might want to add to it or that gets added to it. Here's a great example. Um, you know, let's move away from the watermelon candy because candy in general is not really a healthy thing. Um, not for your teeth, not for your gut, not for your uh, overall metabolism. But let's take a look at something that is healthy, that is so easy to put into a package and make it less healthy, right? I think that's what you're talking about. So let's talk about tree nuts, right? Walnuts, pistachios, macadamias, pine nuts, uh, pecans, almonds. I mean, you know, all those things are really great. Tree nuts have been shown categorically to improve survival, uh, longevity, uh, lower the risk of heart disease, improve outcomes if you have cancer, and indeed even lower the risk of developing cancer itself. Now, if you go into the middle aisle of a store and you're actually looking around for packaged nuts, if you're not discerning, if you're not paying attention, you'll just grab you know some nuts that look like barbecue flavor, you know, um, uh, chili lime. All right, and this is where you know, I think that it's important that you call it the middle ground, where actually we have to have this caveat that if you're going to go after healthy foods, don't just oversimplify. It's not that simple. Pick up a thing of nuts as an example and take a look at it. The flavorings that are used are often artificial, synthetic additives. I always tell people to turn that package around and read that ingredient list, okay? If it's got like 25 or more ingredients, I can categorically, it's probably not that health, it's not the healthiest choice for you. You could probably find something with a nut that actually is going to be healthier. You know, uh, simple salted nuts and uh, roasted nuts, probably okay. But please do read that ingredients because the more chemicals that are in there, listen, I have a bi I have a science background, so I can handle a lot of chemical names, but it, 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 it really is sobering and a little frightening to me when I start reading, like, why on earth do you need 15 rows of chemicals on an ingredient label for something that, you know, you could dry and you could put it into a bag and, and you don't need a lot of other stuff. You could put a little salt or you could put a lot of so a few natural spices on it. That's an example of where a healthy food, when it's packaged, can easily become something that is less healthy. And another example I can think of where in the 21st century, we're really lucky to be able to use these processing methods is when it comes to different herbs and spices, um, certain superfoods like reishi mushroom, chaga mushroom, things that are coming from all different areas of the world. And now because we can you know, dry them out, powder them, 
and and seal them, we can have access. Like we can be here in in the U.S. or Canada and have them shipped to our doorstep, and and bring in all these valuable foods with different properties. Right. Well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of traditional mushrooms that have been used in uh, uh, traditional healing. So whether it's Ayurvedic medicine or traditional Chinese medicine, or even, you know, um, there are history of um, in Latin America, South America, traditional healing. So, you know, reishi mushrooms and shaga, uh, cordyceps, uh, you know, turkey tail, uh, these are, these have become kind of the quote, superfoods. Um, I will tell you myself, I would, because I do research on these kinds of materials, I, I'm very careful. You know, I don't think I'd want to just, uh, uh, pound down reishi mushroom because I, I know that, I mean, it has some pretty potent chemicals in there that haven't really been fully studied. And, and if you go back to the original countries in which they come, whether it's uh, Southeast Asia or in the mountains of China, I will tell you that people don't eat reishi mushrooms for, for fun. They reserve it for very specific ailments in which trained people actually would then prescribe and prepare the actual treatments itself. So, you know, this is an example of where well-intentioned people in the wellness business will seize an idea, and it may already be a trend, and figure out how to actually make it sexier, more available, add some things to it. I'm a doctor and a scientist, so I kind of go where the science is. I'm very excited by, you know, um, how to actually make healthy food more available for people. So to me, I'm all for that direction. But I think that the consumer beware uh, uh, aspect of this is that, you know, if it read the ingredient label, if there's a lot of stuff you don't recognize, be cautious. And frankly, because we all have access to the internet now, it's worth uh, taking a traditional um, healing food, like a mushroom, and looking it up. I mean, even a, even Wikipedia will tell you something about it, and um, you have to um, uh, you have to be open minded to recognize that, like anything, every food has a f an effect, and if uh, and if you have it in high enough quantities or in the wrong context, it can also have a side effect uh, as well. So I, I encourage people to really just really stay on top of things, especially I think if you're um, a health uh, if you're somebody who's health-minded and you are actively pursuing uh, knowledge on what's the latest in thinking about health, just be careful and try to learn how to discern sort of the 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 real information versus the market marketing that's built around it. Important caveat. And I think it's really important that you bring light to that through your answer there and through the work you do where a lot of the foods that you're highlighting when it comes to the other way around beating disease are things that we can find in a regular grocery store. So given again that you're a doctor and you're a researcher, you talked about reishi mushroom there as a specific example. Let's talk about for people out there who might be, you know, on a budget and they're really picking and choosing what they can buy and include in their diet, compare and contrast something like a chaga mushroom or reishi versus like a button mushroom that they can pick up and get a lot cheaper locally. Yeah, okay. Well, so this is actually a really important point. So my background is in vascular biology, so I study blood vessels. But I've also been involved with um, developing new treatments for cancer and vision loss and wound healing. Uh, and some of my work actually involves biotechnology uh, so I, I I understand what it takes to generate the evidence that would lead to an FDA approval. In fact, I've been involved with 43 FDA approved uh, uh, treatments and devices for cancer, uh, uh, blindness, and 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 di complications of diabetes. So um, the the thing that I think is really important to understand is that uh, is what is the mechanism? What is the active stuff in the mushroom that gives you the benefit? And what is the efficacy? What is the effectiveness? And what is the safety, right? And so this is where, you know, to use your example, but mushroom, you know, used in mushroom barley soup, 
uh, uh, used in uh, a salad, uh, used to, you know, uh, cook with all kinds of um, uh, foods. Mushrooms are pretty safe. Button mushrooms, I call it the lowly button mushroom, actually is very rich with a soluble fiber called uh, beta D glucan. This soluble fiber, when you eat it, does a lot of things. It activates your health defenses. It activates your circulation, angiogenesis, which actually makes you have better blood flow, which helps to keep your organs vital. Um, it also activates your and feeds your gut microbiome, the healthy gut bacteria, the 39 trillion bacteria that are in your gut. And that and the healthy fed, well-fed gut bacteria helps your body lower inflammation, streamlines your metabolism, and even text messages your brain to release social hormones so your our mood is actually better. Uh, in addition to you know helping our blood cholesterol and and fighting cancer and a lot of other benefits. That's all packaged in a lowly button mushroom that we know categorically is safe. Okay. Um, turns out that reishi mushroom also has beta glucan because it's got um, uh, it's a mushroom. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that it's a medicinal mushroom and it has a lot of other chemicals that are in it some of which have anti-cancer effects. I've actually done research on this, um, really powerful stuff, um, but it hasn't been studied in the same way for safety. And if you could take a look at what it can do, pretty powerful to kill cancer cells. Well, that sounds great, but do we know it's going to harm normal cells? And at what concentration? And how often can you eat it? Well, we don't know the answer to all of that, frankly, because it's not a drug. It's, it's kind of a natural substance. On the other hand, Go back to go back to Asia and say, well, do you eat reishi mushrooms normally, like you would white button mushrooms in Asia? No way. They don't eat it regularly. You got to ask the question: Why don't they eat it regularly? Because it's got all this other stuff, maybe useful stuff, but it might be potent stuff. And just like you wouldn't march into the woods to go pick out mushrooms on your own that you don't recognize, unless you are a um, mycologist, you know, unless you are a mushroom forager. I don't recommend people go out and pick out their own mushrooms, you know, on the side of a log and popping in their mouth. Like that's a very dangerous thing. So I'm not really knocking reishi mushrooms per se, but what I'm saying is that if you know what's good for you in a mushroom, you can go for the cheap, easily available, super safe and super delicious uh, way of actually just getting it from a white butt mushroom. You want to step it up? Go to a shiitake mushroom. You want to step it up further? Go to a portobello mushroom. You want to actually enjoy some cool mushrooms like a chanterelle, which is a, a summer seasonal mushroom, or a porcini, which in Europe like make, makes a really tasty dish. I love to cook, and so I love mushrooms. And there's all kinds of mushrooms. Some of them are more expensive, some, but a lot of them are really inexpensive that you can cook with that make an absolutely delicious meal that you will get the good stuff in it already. So be careful. You don't need to just spend more money and get a subscription of your reishi mushrooms or whatever to really be able to get the benefits by understanding. And this is what I wrote about Eat to Beat Disease, my first book, that, you know, like you want to you want to um, be knowledgeable about what's good and is it in the food that is most accessible and least expensive and also tastes great. Where this becomes really tricky is because, again, in the 21st century, globalization, it is so easy to get all these different foods from all around the world. And I'm sure there are specific examples of foods that have above average healing benefits. But then we got to look at, you know, how much of it is just marketing, how much of it hasn't been researched yet. So I like what you're saying here. For people, you know, they can go to the grocery store, they can get their button mushrooms or the other varieties you name there and get a lot of these other health benefits. Yeah. I mean, you know, and by the way, just a little uh, kind of pro tip for your viewers and listeners is, you know, if you go to an international food store, like an Asian market, and you want to find some exotic things that are used in foods, um, You'll, you'll often find that the ingredients like button mushrooms or other kinds of mushrooms, trumpet mushrooms, are less expensive and they're fresher because people are buying them all the time. And so that's a little trick if you're looking for something that's a little bit more exotic. Go to an Asian market. Go to you know um, an international and ethnic market and look for uh, foods that you might find at the regular grocery store. It might be not that expensive, but you might be able to find them even cheaper at, a, at an international market. What about supplements? When you talk about vitamin C being in these foods and being part of the the reason that they're great when it comes to autoimmunity, right away my brain goes to supplementing with vitamin C. So in this case and others, 
What are your thoughts on supplements? So, look, um, I'm somebody that believes, and I write about this in my book, Eat to Beat Disease, that wherever possible, you should get your micronutrients and macros um, from whole foods. So you can go to the market, buy seasonally, cook delicious foods that in ways that actually help support your health defense systems. You get the pleasure and the joy of the food as well as all the stuff that Mother Nature put into her food that your body will respond positively to. But, you know, um, there's also the world of supplements. And I think that supplements sometimes get a bad rap. They get a bad rap because the people who market supplements are not scientists. They kind of distort the facts and they try to make a sale. And there's nothing wrong per se with a business trying to make a sale. That's what they're supposed to do. But when it comes to what I do, it's sort of like looking at what are the facts concerning supplements. Um, let's first look at the word supplement. Supplement really means to top off. You're supplementing something. And so not everybody can eat enough from their regular food to get what they need. What's a good example of that? Vitamin D. Okay. Uh, people who are light skinned living in the Northern Hemisphere don't get a lot of sunshine. Sunshine helps our skin makes vitamin D. So those people need to be supplemented. You can get some vitamin D from your milk and you can get some vitamin D from mushrooms and things like that, but not a lot of dietary sources of vitamin D. Supplement top you off. How do, and that, by the way, helps your immune system. How do we know that? Well, because people just in the last couple of years, people who are very vulnerable to COVID, getting COVID infection and doing really bad, having a bad, inadequate immune response, were low in vitamin D. Doesn't mean you can use vitamin D to treat COVID, but it means that, that you need to keep your keep arming yourself to build your health defenses with vitamin D. Vitamin C, you can also get vitamin C from foods. Again, red bell peppers and strawberries and tomatoes, a lot, a lot of other uh, sources like that. But you know, it can be, not everybody actually is able to keep up with all the fresh fruits and vegetables. This is where a vitamin C supplement uh, can be helpful as well. Vitamin C is actually um, an interesting uh, 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 micro, uh, mac micronutrient because basically when you swallow it, like you can top yourself up any extras, any overage, your body will put it into your, uh, filter it through your kidney and you'll have it in your bladder, you'll pee it out. So it's actually virtually impossible to overdose with vitamin C. Not true with vitamin D. Vitamin D, you can actually overdo vitamin D. And so this is why another kind of, I would say, slippery slope on supplements is that it's so easy. You know, so many people uh, fall into this trap. Well, if one works, let me take 10. More's got to be more, right? Like, I mean, that's a common misbelief. Mis that, that, I mean, it's a natural instinct, but it's not necessarily true. And so I think that, you know, um, supplements are also undergoing this sort of careful study to figure out what's out there. Green tea supplements have been also really, really useful. Turmeric. Uh, curcumin supplements also have been found to have anti-inflammatory responses. So I'm somebody that really prefers to tell people wherever possible, eat whole foods. You're going to, you're going to get the joy out of the food at food at the same time. But there are some su things that you might want to supplement because it's hard. Omega-3 fatty acids. Not everybody eats seafood or algae or plankton or seaweed. Okay. So if you want to really get omega-3s, and you and you know you you can only eat so much flaxseed, for example, uh, uh, which is another uh, plant-based source of of omega threes, and and you just can't get access to enough seafood, or you're or you don't like seafood, or you're allergic to seafood. Well, omega three fatty acids are another convenient supplements are another convenient way to get that um, that bioactive into your body. And I would also assume it depends on the person. You know, if we're talking about somebody with an autoimmune condition. Maybe they're not eating enough oranges or whatever the different foods are to get enough vitamin C. So in that case, they might want to supplement somebody who's healthy and they're trying to make sure their immune system doesn't start over attacking their body. Maybe eating oranges and different foods is enough. That's right. So again, it's, you know, this is the other thing about nutrition and food as medicine. That's a little bit different than medicine as medicine, right? I mean, if you go to a doctor to get a prescription, they're going to write the name of the drug and the dose, and pretty much it's going to be the same for everybody. You know, um, that's how we write antibiotics, sort of like a one size fits all. Food's different. Food is highly individualistic. And because there's so many foods that can work, and I think that's an advantage because you can actually choose from your own preferences the foods that actually are good for you. So in atopic disease, I write about um, more than 200 foods 
that can actually activate your health defenses. And so I challenge people to find, um, and I put them in tables and charts. And so I tell people like, you know, like I get asked, you know, so Dr. Lee, how can I get started um, uh, eating to beat disease? Like I, I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed. And what I say, you know, um, take my book, all right, open up to the pages with the tables and charts, take out a Sharpie, okay? And just circle all the foods that you really love in that thing. Oh, you know, I like this one. Oh, I like this one. I don't mind that one. Okay. And then take a picture with your cell phone of those, uh, uh, the, the, of, of, of the list of the foods with the circles on them. Next time you go shopping, it's a no brainer. Whip open your phone and look at the circle, the foods that you circle and see if you can find it in the market. Like that's a way of taking a lot of guesswork out of it. I've already done some of the desk work. You can go buy, go buy those foods. And the other thing that I've been doing is really teaching master classes because there's new research coming out like the pear story that I was telling you with uh, about um, uh, uh, cancer treatment, uh, enhancing cancer treatment. And I've been trying to, um, because, you know, the research is coming out, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. There's new research all the time that gives us insights on what new foods that we might be able to actually eat. And so I encourage people, you know, like, don't get too stressed out about this. It's a lot easier than you actually think. There's a lot of heavy lifting that's already been done by people like myself and others. And all you have to do is trust your own preferences to be able to go to a list, a healthy list of good foods and start to identify the ones you like. Because if you can continue to eat and start with the foods that that are healthy for you, that you already love, then you're already way ahead of the game. Now you know what to do. Just keep expanding. Keep going where you're going. Like that's like job well done. You already got started. Dr. Lee, weight loss is a common topic for this show. But reading your new book, having you back on the show today, we're going to get into that in a whole new realm because typically it comes up in the realm of intermittent fasting, cutting back calories, and you're talking about it at least partially from the aspect of adding these foods in that are going to help fight obesity. So let's start by talking about some of those top foods in that category. Before we dive into the foods, let me kind of reframe the entire dialogue about the whole narrative about weight loss. Most people think about weight loss from the perspective of what they can see with their eyes and, you know, influenced by vanity, which I think is important. People need to feel good um, and and if they look good, they feel good. But that's not the real reason to combat body fat. And that's really where the new science of the metabolism teaches us that there are ways that we can actually use the hardwiring systems in our body around our metabolism. This is our operating system in order to be able to achieve the goal of inner health. So we can fight body fat on the inside as well as the outside. And, and, you know, there's ways of doing it um, that leverage, you know, um, when to eat and how to eat, you know, intermittent fasting is part of that uh, story. But the real surprise is that there are actually foods that can actually turn on our metabolism and use our fat so we can eat foods to trigger our fat, our good fat, to burn down our bad fat at the level of the harmful fat. That's really the new angle on this, which is that we can elevate our health by elevating our metabolism. And to do that, we can actually eat food. And this is what I wanted to get into because usually it comes from the aspect of taking away, whether it be Again, intermittent fasting, where we're going to take away a time period that we're eating during the day, uh, cutting back on carbohydrates, cutting back on calories. And this is why this is so exciting. And I'm excited to get into this with you today because you're talking about adding things in. And we know there's, you know, a lot of people these days that are struggling with extra weight on their bodies. And they've tried a lot of the classical ways to lose weight without success, or at least, you know, going back and forth and losing weight and then gaining weight again. So it's exciting to bring this fresh perspective that you're going to bring today where we're going to talk about adding foods in and give people a different way of going about losing that weight. Right. Well, you know, what led me to write my new book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is exactly what you said. I've personally been, as a doctor and as a scientist, been very frustrated with the fact that many of my patients are on diets uh, and they ask me which diet they should, should be on. Uh, and, you know, regardless, it's almost like no matter what diet you choose, they are all about elimination, deprivation, scarcity, de- you know, removing things from your diet. And it becomes very difficult 
the more extreme it is, the more difficult it is for people to stick to. So then they rebound and they wind up weight cycling up and down and up and down. And at the end of the day, they gain back everything they wanted to lose, uh, sometimes more. And then they're very frustrated because they uh, feel like they've been deprived. Well, here's, here's the deal. Human nature abhors deprivation, right? So when somebody tells you not to do something, you can't do something, or something is bad to do, our brains are hardwired to go, hmm, maybe just a little bit, or let me see if I can sneak around the side, or, you know, you just kind of build up that that um, resentment of actually having something taken away from you. That's our, I think that's part of our nature is to really have that freedom of choice. Well, so what I try to do in my book is to use the new science of the metabolism to upend this idea that you have to use elimination in order to be able to achieve health goals related to your metabolism. So this, there's three components, by the way, that allow us to actually re-examine, reconceptualize how foods can be used to lose weight in a healthy way. All right. This is the key, healthy way. So there's the new science of the metabolism. Um, uh, there is the new science of food. And then there is actually the practical aspect of how we actually put it all together in a way that allows us to embrace and find, rediscover the joy of eating as opposed to the fear of food because of what it can actually do to our body weight. Well, there's a lot of different ways we can jump in and and get to the nuances here, but let's come back to the opening question again, because we haven't gotten into specifics yet. Let's give a couple of foods to start off and then we can pivot off there and talk about what's happening. So what are a couple of the top foods for somebody just getting started that they want to add in when it comes to helping them lose weight and burn fat? All right. Let me, let me just throw a couple of foods out there that might be surprising um, as foods that can turn on our fuel burning, fat fighting processes that are hardwired in our bodies, things that you might not expect. Number one, beans canned beans, pre-cooked beans, ready-to-eat beans, dried beans you want to soak. It turns out that beans have been studied for their ability to actually help fight body fat. And not is it not only does it work in the laboratory, but it works in people as well. So human studies have been done to show that people who eat as little as um, uh, a cup of pre-cooked, ready-to-eat beans, like the stuff you get in a can in the grocery store, does not have to be expensive, um, five days of the week, five days out of seven, okay, is enough to actually shrink your waist size. That's how much, that's how round your the tube of your body is. We're not talking about the muffin. We're talking about actually how big your body circumference is by about an inch after a month. And the reason that works is because beans have dietary fiber that actually make our gut healthier. And as our gut health, our microbiome improves, it actually up, up, sort of um, upregulates it. It, it um, levels up our metabolism to burn fat better. So that's one example of a surprise food. Another one, which by the way, you could find in the middle aisle like beans, are chili flakes, the stuff that you put on pizza, all right? Um, uh, or dried chili, the dried ancho chili, poblano chilies, which you can find by the uh, dried section in the, in the grocery store, or of course, fresh chilies. You want to actually, you know, eat some Thai food with some nice, you know, Serrano chilies. That also works. And here's actually what's been found. Chili peppers ha- um, give some zing to your body. That's the spiciness. And we now know that that zing is caused by this natural compound, natural chemical in peppers called capsaicin. And also capsinoids. It's kind of a class of natural chemicals. One of the things that you know people have loved spicy food for is that it actually creates this nice um, flavor uh, sensory uh, reaction. Um, the, the capsaicin is what does it. Uh, binds to a special taste receptor, kind of receptor on your tongue, the spicy receptor. There's a name for it. It's called Trip V1. Don't worry about memorizing that. Just know that the the natural chemical in peppers is like a key. And and on your tongue is a lock and it goes key and lock, turn, bam, you actually have that spicy zing, right? Now, the key thing that is really exciting is that when the key goes into the lock, that hot, spicy flavor of chili touches your tongue. You do feel that spicy flavor. What your tongue does, that receptor, that lock does is text messages your brain and it tells your brain to release hormones, one of the hormones that it actually releases um, uh, is endorphins. So that's the feel-good hormone. That's why some people are really addicted to spicy food. 
Um, by the way, um, the other hormone it actually releases is norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is um, this special hormone that we use when we want to get pumped up, like fight or flight. You know, you want to square off against somebody. All right, you got your norepinephrine like flowing, right? And and the other thing that happens, and next time you eat chili, um, and hot ch- hot peppers, uh, anything spicy, do this. Kind of go into your meditative zone and like close your eyes and feel after the zing, you will actually feel this wave going down from your head, down the side of your neck. You, like literally, it's like a little tingling sensation. That is the norepinephrine coursing down the nerves around your neck. And this is where a special kind of fat, good fat, useful fat, hero fat called brown fat is located. Now, brown fat isn't jiggly. That's called white fat. White fat is what you have under the arm, under the chin. It's the muffin top. It's around your thighs and your butt. That's what actually most people are trying to get rid of. White fat is unsightly, but not as dangerous as visceral fat, which is packed around our guts, inside our body cavity. That's dangerous because it's like a baseball glove that like strangles our organs and becomes inflamed. All right. So what brown fat is, which is the other kind of fat, is a hero fat, is not wiggly and jiggly. It's not lumpy bumpy. And it's not under the skin, so you can't see it. It's paper thin, all right? It's like opening some printer paper and pulling it out, and instead of white paper, it's brown paper. And where is it located, that fat? It's close to the bone, and it's around our neck, under our chest, a little bit under our arms, like a girdle, a little bit behind our between our shoulder blades, and then in a bit in our belly. When the chili peppers text message to our brain releases that norepinephrine hormone, that travels down the nerves around our neck and activates our brown fat. It's like turning on the light switch of the brown fat. You know what it does? It triggers a uh, fuel burning. Like that brown fat becomes a space heater. All right. I'm going to, I have something here to show you guys. Space heater like this. This is a little torch. Boom. All right. That's what chili pepper does in your brain that goes down and triggers this kind of space heating burning. Now, where does that fuel come from? in your brown fat. It's got to burn fuel. It's burning energy. It draws that fuel from your harmful visceral fat. Good fat burns down bad fat when you eat certain foods. That's pretty cool. That's chili peppers and spicy foods. That can actually do it as well. Now, of course, there's a whole bunch of um, um, fruits and vegetables and legumes and seeds that can actually do the same thing. Um, Olive oil, other things you can find in the middle aisles, and also seafoods. I mean, there's a whole bunch of Things and beverages. And I write about all of this stuff um, in the middle of my book, Eat to Beat Your Diet, is really a tour of the grocery store, the ordinary everyday grocery store. I invite my reader to hop into my grocery cart like you used to do when you were a kid in your mom's grocery cart. And I wheel you around and show you everything you actually put in the cart that can activate your metabolism and help your good fat burn down your bad fat. All right. A lot I want to get into there, but where I'll start is with the brown fat. So We're activating brown fat. You mentioned the fact that what that does when it's activated, it starts burning the bad visceral fat. My question is, does it affect the subcutaneous white fat, which is also considered a bad fat, or is it just the visceral fat? All the, all, all all types of fat, uh, but the, but the key benefits, the most important health benefits you get is when it actually draws down on the visceral fat. So it'll actually shrink your waistline. You'll lose weight. Um, uh, you know, you'll, um, your overall fat will actually start to shrink a bit. Um, you'll, so you'll get the benefit, uh, for your subcutaneous visible fat as well. But the invisible part is really what I want to draw attention to, because that's the stuff that even skinny people have. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, this harmful white fat is, um, uh, both visible, uh, as well as invisible. The visible part is stuff that's, you know, lumpy, bumpy, invisible stuff's packed in your body. And it doesn't matter if you have a big body frame or if you're real thin, you can still have skinny fat. In fact, that's what they call it. Um, you know, thin on the outside, fat on the inside. It's that kind of dangerous fat. So think about fat. Like this is really the other thing that I think is so amazing about this new approach to thinking about metabolism and body fat. We used to assume, I mean, our, our, we think about fat really as sort of a, uh, a negative substance, right? Think about it. When you just... We all have walked out of the shower in the morning naked and out of the corner of our eye, we see our, our, our reflection in the mirror. And almost all of us, myself included, have seen from time to time lumps and bumps that you don't want to be there. 
right? So immediately go, oh man, I'm getting fat. And it gives you, it sends a negative signal. So then the next thing you do, I got to get in shape. I got to eat better. Next thing you do is step on the scale. And if that number isn't what you're expecting to be, you're disappointed and you kind of curse yourself, right? So right from the get-go as adults, we're assuming a very negative posture when it comes to body fat. But as a researcher, I'm a scientist. And as a researcher, one of the things that we like to do as scientists is to explore the origins of something and the origins of fat most people don't think about. And we think about it when we actually step out of the shower, but we don't think about where fat came from. And it turns out fat in our bodies started to form when we were still in our mom's womb. All right. So we began having fat uh, long before we had a face we could stuff with food. So then the question is like, well, what, why is fat important? Why is it forming so early? And this is what's really interesting. When your mom's egg met your bad, dad's sperm, turned into a ball of cells, and that ball of cells started to um, transform itself to become the future you, the first tissue that gets laid down is your circulation because every organ that forms is going to need a blood supply. The second tissue that forms are nerves because every organ is going to need really a wiring to actually instruct it what to do. The third tissue that forms is body fat, fat cells, little tiny globules of fat cells, which are actually fuel tanks for energy, form. And you know where they form? They form around blood vessels like bubble wrap, wrapped around every blood vessel. Now, why is that? It turns out that makes total sense because ultimately, when we have energy from our food that we eat, that energy goes into our bloodstream, right? And then our blood, when we want to store that energy for use later, are the, the energy comes from the bloodstream and it gets stored into these little fat cells. So fat at that level is really just a fuel tank. One of the many things fat does is a fuel tank. You store energy in it. So fast forward to nine months, you're born, right? Uh, fat figured adults might not be the most uh, pleasing thing that you would see in a mirror. But when you see a healthy baby, a fat, pudgy, chubby baby is the cutest, healthiest baby you've, thing you've ever seen. Fat, chubby cheeks, round belly, arms and legs that look like a balloon that the clown twists in the circus to make little toy poodles. All right. A, a fat baby is a healthy baby, right? So this is like a completely different kind of a jarring appreciation of like when we see, first see fat on the human, it's associated with health. In fact, if you saw a baby, a newborn who had chiseled cheekbones, thin arms, and long, thin thighs, like a runway model, you'd be freaked out. You would say, there's something seriously wrong with that baby. And you'd be right. And so this actually has to lead what to think about what does fat actually do? I told you it's a store, uh, a fuel tank. Very, very important because energy has to be stored every single day to a power us. Anybody who's watching this, listening to this is using fuel just to be alive and to, and to pay attention. Number two, Fat is a cushion. It's not just a, it's not a layer of blubber like in a whale. Uh, okay, it's actually a cushion, uh, and and the cushion in our body protects our organs. So if you didn't have body fat, you tripped on the rug and you fell on the ground, your organs would split open. All right, thank goodness we have some protective cushioning fat. The third thing that um, uh, I talked about that uh, in my book that is a bit of a surprise is that fat is now recognized as a normal, healthy organ organ in the body. An organ just like your pancreas, your liver, your kidneys, your lungs, your heart. Fat is an organ, and not just any organ. It's an endocrine organ, which means that it's an organ that secretes hormones. Now, one of the things I write about in Eat to Beat Your Diet is that there's at least 13 hormones that have been identified um, that fat makes. Normal, healthy hormones that our fat makes, just like your testicles and just like your thyroid and just like your ovaries make hormones, our fat makes normal hormones. Three of them turn out to be super, super important when it comes to our health and maintaining good body uh, composition, meaning regulating our body fat while giving us energy. One of those hormones is called leptin, L-E-P-T-I-N. And many people have heard of leptin, okay? Sometimes known as a satiety hormone, it regulates your appetite. When you have more leptin, you're less hungry. I would actually encourage you to think about leptin as a volume switch. It turns up and can turn down your, your appetite in your brain. And that's really important. So we know when, when we're actually going to want to eat something, right? So think about it. If our body is like a car, 
most people you know have driven a car. Um, in a car, you've got an engine. You need fuel to run that engine. And in a car, you look at the fuel gauge. When a fuel gauge runs low, you want to pull over to the filling station and put that nozzle from the gas pump filling state at the filling station into the gas tank to fill it up. In our bodies, that's basically when we're lo- running low on fuel. Our fuel gauge goes, oh, got to got to load up. Leptin goes down. That's like our fuel tank, our fuel gauge. We pull over, not to the gas station, but to the dinner table, to the refrigerator, to the pantry. And then we fuel up with food. So just like gasoline at a filling station is fuel for your car's engine, food that we eat is fuel for our body that gets into our bloodstream and then gets loaded into our tiny little fat cells as a way of storing that energy. All right. And so that's one of these three hormones that are really, really important. Important for metabolism, normal, healthy metabolism. It's made by body fat as an organ. Second uh, hormone that's really important um, uh, is if I were to, uh, as a doctor, um, uh, take a vial of blood, you know, after a medical visit with with you, Jesse, and send it to an ordinary hospital laboratory. Okay, and I asked as a doctor for the lab to actually um, give me a profile of all the hormones that are in your blood. All right testosterone and thyroid hormone, all the usual players, cortisol. Um, uh, I will tell you there's one hormone called adiponectin. Adiponectin is made by adipose tissue, which is fat. Adiponectin is a second fat hormone. That level, your level, would be 1,000 times higher in your blood than any other hormone. Higher than testosterone, higher than thyroid hormone, all the stuff we get concerned about, right? You talk about it, it's you know, people are, are interested in like, what about hypothyroidism? And, uh, and, and that I can tell you a diponect is a 1000 times higher. Now, why is it so high? Why is this, you know, sort of like at an, at an order of magnitude, several orders of magnitude higher than every other hormone? Because a diponectin created by fat for normal health helps your body's insulin, which is another hormone made by your pancreas, to draw in that energy that comes from food, from your bloodstream, into your cells. You need a adiponectin for your insulin to work. And when your adiponectin is messed up, which can happen when you've got too much body fat, okay, it's not working right. Now your insulin's not working well, so you're not even absorbing the energy and your blood sugars are going to go up. So that's a normal hormone that, that your fat makes. Second one. Third one is called resistin. Now, the adiponectin, the fuel storing hormone, is the gas pedal. Resistin is the brake. A dipinect is I store that energy. The resistance, no, not, not, not so hard, not so fast. It, it counters it. All right. These three hormones are all part of normal function. That's how we can get out of bed in the morning. That's how we can go take a walk. That's how we can actually, you know, uh, pet our dog. All those things are are regulated for normal energy, normal function, normal living, normal aging. Uh, by our body fat. So the interesting thing um, uh, is that is is our fat is an organ, and the and the fourth thing that um, fat does again is to serve at that space heater, this torch. All right, and that's the big surprise because until recently, we kind of just referred to brown fat as this thing that animals have when they hibernate, and maybe babies have a little bit. Recently, you've seen like the, the fitness and, and bodybuilding community talk more and more about brown fat. You see that stuff on the internet. <clears throat> I can give you the scientists and the physicians, the medical doctors, if you want it. It's real. It works. And the amazing thing is that there are foods that we can eat, like the chili peppers, like the beans, like broccoli and other brassica vegetables, like capers, uh, uh, like green tea, like coffee, that activate that space heater function. And when you turn on the space heater, it needs fuel to burn, to make energy, to make heat. And where does that fuel come from? Guess what? It steals that for fuel. The brown fat uses the fuel from the white fat. So good fat burns down bad fat. And that raises your metabolism. All right. A lot there. And I want to stick on this brown fat piece here for a bit. Mm. So we know we can activate brown fat. It's going to burn the bad fats. So we know now there's these specific foods and chili peppers are one of them that can do that. Is it all about activating our current brown fat or can we make more of that given it's a good thing? And if so, how do we go about doing that? Yeah, so that's the amazing thing. Our fat has this incredible regenerative capacity, meaning that there are actual stem cells in our normal healthy fat. In fact, we have a name for them. They're they're not called fat stem cells. They're called adipose stromal cells or ASCs. 
Now, as a scientist that's been working on medical research to develop new treatments for heart disease and other diseases where we want to regenerate organs in the body, we've been looking at these stem cells that are found in body fat for a long time. And I can tell you in my book, I write about how powerful these stem cells and body fat are. So what do stem cells and body fat do? Well, remember I told you body fat actually are fuel tanks. When you actually need to store fuel, it can actually fill up what you got from birth. And But if you've got more fuel, all right, if you overeat, your body needs to make another fuel tank. And so it can actually just use a stem cell to make another fat cell. Oh, you overate. You really overate. You had third helpings and fourth helpings. Ah, your, your fuel tank's not enough. Now you got to make more fuel tanks, more fat, more fat, more fat. This is how when you overeat, your body responds by making more fuel containers. It'd be like, you know, like a, a car. You just keep on making more and more fuel tanks. Pretty soon you got jerry cans all around the side of your, your, your pickup truck, all packed with gas. And that's basically our body's ability to do that using stem cells. Now, here's the key thing. Um, our stem cells in fat are very, very powerful. It reflects how important our ability to regenerate actually is. It's a health defense system. It allows us to make uh, make more organs that are injured, make more fuel tanks. But here's the thing. Uh, as a, and I wanted, before we talk about like the, the foods that can cause stem cells and fat and harmful fat to create more brown fat, which is what you'd want to do. You want more hero fat. You want more of that fat burning fat. All right. But let me just tell you how powerful these stem cells are. I write about this in my book. Um, we've been doing research for, for about a decade now, a little bit more, um, seeing if we can actually take people who have excess body fat and you use liposuction, which is what plastic surgeons do. It's like a little vacuum cleaner hose and you, and you suck out body fat and you get a jar of body fat. It's like this yellow gunk. And what you do is you pour in a little enzyme. All right. Uh, and the enzyme dissolves up the fat separates the cells, and then you put it into a centrifuge. It spins it around, round and around and around, faster and faster. And what happens is the stem cells go to the bottom and the fat floats to the top. And then as a researcher, we pour off the fat. Now, it's really interesting, and this is what's been going on for about a decade now. We take that tube of the stem cells in the bottom, and you can hand it to a, wait for it, cardiologist. Plastic surgeon can hand stem cells from fat to a cardiologist who will then load it up, inject it into your heart. And for people who have heart disease, and what we've seen, it'll grow new blood vessels, it'll grow new heart tissue. You can take people who are cardiac cripples and regenerate parts of their heart function. Amazing. And in my book, not ready for prime time yet, but it's part of the research that's going on. And in my book, I write about an even more amazing application. And that is that these stem cells are context dependent, meaning that they will turn into whatever, whatever is around them and what they, what they feel like turning into. So when they're in fat, they're more t- likely to turn into fat. When they're in the heart, they'll turn into heart tissue. So this was, a, and it turns out they'll also turn into nerve tissue as well. Okay. So I read about a case about a 30 year old um, young man who actually fell off a ladder and he broke his neck and became a quadriplegic, could not move his arms and legs, wheelchair bound, horrible in a young person. And um, he volunteered into a clinical trial in order in which he, uh, plastic surgeons took his body fat, spun it down, got the stem cells, handed the stem cells to a neurologist who injected it in the stem cells into his severed spinal cord. And guess what? It grew back spinal cord. And before long, he could move his arms and legs again, which is, you know, like that, that's jaw dropping that the, these stem cells are so powerful. So back to fat stem cells in fat. Turns out there are certain foods that we can eat that can also redirect our stem, our fat stem cells, these adipose stromal cells to say, you know what? Don't make any more white fat. Don't make me any more fuel tanks. All right. Why don't you go make some more brown fat instead? What are some of the foods that can actually do this? It turns out tomatoes with lycopene can redirect stem cells to tar- turn into um, from white fat into brown fat. So you can make more of the the, the, the space heater function. That is really, really cool because we want more of that, right? We want more, inter- like our, we want more power. It's like more ammo to be able to burn down like a, like a, an, an extra afterburner, uh, you know, on a racing car to be able to actually burn down um, uh, more of the harmful extra fuel stored in our white fat. Another food that can actually do this, um, uh, brassica. 
So broccoli is um, has got like is one of the brassicas has sulforaphane, but guess what? So does Swiss chard. So does bok choy. This whole family of foods have sulforaphanes that when you eat them, actually can help to redirect your stem cells to say, "Hey, buddy, nah, don't make any more white fat. We don't want that. We want you to make more brown fat because it's time to burn down some harmful fat." All right, so we can stimulate brown fat with certain foods. We can use other foods to stimulate stem cells that are going to make more brown fat that can be stimulated. How do we assess how much brown fat we have, or is that even of concern? Okay, so brown fat is invisible to us because it's close to the bone. <clears throat> it's paper thin, um, and you just just know that it's there. Like that is our birthright to have some brown fat. Um, we do know that cold temperatures when we're out in the cold. Um, uh, in the wintertime, for example, or people who live in cold climates but work outdoors, like lumberjacks working in, uh, in, the, in Scandinavia, the cold temperature actually stimulates uh, brown fat and it generates warmth. You know, probably brown fat keeps our insides warm. That's what it does for animals that hibernate, um, like uh, these little um, uh, like woodchucks and those animals that actually have to fire up or bats. The brown fat keeps them warm for cold temperatures, but certain foods will also um, stimulate the, 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 the brown fat and it improves the metabolism. And I'll tell you how we know in the medical research community that brown fat exists and how we measure it. Okay. So I got to tell you a story. And the story is that in the 17th century, there was a research a biologist, a naturalist who studies, you know, animals and things, plants and animals named Conrad Gessner. And he was collecting little, um, uh, little uh, squirrel-like animals um, that lived in the Eastern European mountains. Um, and he was dissecting them and drawing pictures of their organs. And he found this thing between their shoulder blades. It was this brown lump. And he didn't know what it, what it was uh, would do to, but he thought, you know, it was bigger in animals that were hibernating. So he called it a hibernoma. Like he didn't know what it was. He thought it was an organ. Okay. It is an organ. Um, fast forward, you know, um, into the 18th and 19th century, and even into the earliest 20th century, other researchers found that, yeah, you know what? Other animals that hibernate actually have this little brown lump between their back. Fast forward into the early, into like mid 20th century, the 1960s, um, uh, a UCLA researcher, by then we had the microscopes that were powerful enough to look deep down into this lump. He said, wait a minute, that is actually fat, but it's not white fat, j- wiggly jiggly fat. It's called, it's brown, it's brown colored. Why is it brown? Well, it turns out that the nuclear energy that turns on this space heater, the furnace, actually is a, 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 an organelle in our body called the mitochondria. And when I was in medical school, I used to memorize things, right? So mitochondria, I called it mitochondria. It is mighty. It's small but mighty. It generates a lot of heat. And because mitochondria, which is a natural suborgan of our cells, actually are loaded with iron. And iron, like rust, is brown. So when you have a lot of this nuclear engine, the furnace, with a lot of iron in it, it makes the tissue brown, brown fat. Has a lot of mitochond- has a lot of mitochondria, the space heating function. Now it starts to make sense. So they looked in people. They're like animals have it. What about people? People um, like maybe babies have it. So they found that there's a lump between a baby between her shoulder blades that actually is brown fat. And then they thought, well, you know, humans aren't born in the wild anymore on a cave floor. They don't need they don't need that. We're born in we put them in incubators if they need heat, um, and we grow up with you know with thermostats and and things like that. So um, must be vestigial, like your appendix or like your tonsils. Well, we know for now, for sure, that the tonsils and your appendix are not vestigial by by any means. They're important parts of our, they harbor our gut microbiome. They're important parts of our defense, all right? And by the same token, brown fat is present not only in babies, but in adults. Now, how did we find it in adults? This is an interesting story. In the 90s, there was actually a researcher that it was a patient that came to a Boston hospital who had a tumor in her chest. And um, when they, and right at the time, they had these scanning devices called PET scans, positron emission tomography. And when you do a PET scan, it's kind of like a CT scan or an MRI or an X ray, it, t- it takes a picture of your body. 
but it doesn't take a detailed picture. What it does is it measures metabolism. It shows you what parts of your body have higher metabolism. And when they took a PET scan of this one with a tumor in her chest, that tumor, that, that ominous area in her chest lit up like a Christmas tree. And like, oh my God, that thing is super metabolically active. When they biopsied it, they were expecting to find a cancer. And what did they find? Brown fat. And they're like, wait, this isn't a cancer. It is brown fat. And that led one of the researchers in Boston to say, I wonder if PET scans are actually able to find brown fat in adults. So he went back into the uh, medical records and pulled out a thousand PET scans from patients that actually had PET scans for lots of different reasons in the past and looked at them all. And what he found is that some people had brown fat, some people didn't. And he was like, ah, you know what? It's all over the map. We can't make any sense of it. But then he had this inspired idea. Going back to the hibernating animals, he said, let me check the weather forecast on the day each of these scans were done. And what he found out was on every scan that had brown fat lighting up around the neck, behind the breastbone, under the arms, and the back, and a little bit belly, like I told you where it normally is, it was a cold day, especially in the winter. So people who are getting their uh, scans, PET scans for whatever reason, you can measure your brown fat. It lights up in a PET scan that captures the metabolism. Remember, brown fat activates your metabolism. It fires up. You can see it on the PET scan. And that's how we discovered. And that's how we know brown fat is actually activated. Can you find it like a consumer? Like, is there a way of biohacking your way to measure a brown fat? Not yet. However, there are devices that are being developed. Um, like there's one that I've been playing around with. Um, that's like a breathalyzer for metabolism um, uh, that actually shows you that you're burning fat. Uh, so that's kind of a surrogate. And what I think is going to be really interesting is as our um, our, our grasp of uh, new human metabolism starts to become even more well-defined, we're certainly going to be able to find a way to measure brown fat. And where that gets really interesting is when you start stacking the two. You talked about you know the foods that we can take in that are going to stimulate brown fat, but then you mix that in with, with taking an ice bath or a cold shower. I wonder, is there any research you know of where people are stacking that together and, and you know, getting an even greater benefit? That's what's going on right now. There's the kind of research. I mean, now that we know there's brown fat there, now that we know that cold temperatures can activate it and, and, and your metabolism and foods can activate it, that's the next step. I mean, look, I'm a researcher. So as much as I would like to say everything is done and we can just gift wrap and put a bow on it and then people can buy it online. I can tell you the exciting part for me is that we finally know that there's a path forward for people that have been struggling with their weight and cycling up and down through crazy extreme diets that, you know what, maybe we don't need to be dependent and grasping at straws anymore. What new, what the science of the new science of your metabolism is telling is that there's a path forward our operating system for our metabolism is already hardwired into us. And if we actually just start tweaking it and respecting what our body is capable of doing, maybe we can actually achieve these goals. We can achieve these goals, you know, uh, higher metabolism, less body fat, elevated health, um, uh, without having to resort to these extreme diets, which is why, by the way, I put in my um, uh, book title, Eat to Beat Your Diet. It's not a diet book. That's a trick title. It's actually an anti-diet book to show how our hardwiring allows us to achieve health goals without having to go on a diet. All right. So we know now brown fat, there's no technology to detect the amount we have, but we know how we can stimulate it or make more of it. What about the visceral fat? When you talked about that earlier, you talked about the fact that somebody can look like they're maintaining a healthy weight, but still have a problem going on inside. And you mentioned something about strangling from the inside. So obviously we know this isn't a good thing. And for somebody who is going to adopt a lot of what we talk about today, what I'm curious about, is there a way to get a baseline to see how much visceral fat we're at in the beginning, and then hopefully take on, like I said, some we're going to talk about today and, and, and burn that away and get to a healthier visceral fat level? Because I'm assuming, and you can add this in too, is everybody must have some visceral fat, even if they're in a healthy range, correct? That's right. That's right. I mean, look. Remember, I told you that we started to actually build healthy levels of fat as an organ in our body from the time we were in the womb. We want some white fat. We want some brown fat. The fat actually has a lot of functions. It's a cushion. It's a fuel tank. It's a space heater. 
It's an endocrine organ that makes hormones. So we want to have a little bit of this. Fat is not to be feared. It's to be respected. However, what we need to, so we don't want to get rid of all your fat. Okay. You don't want to burn it, churn it, poison it. What you want to do is to tame it. Right. And that's, what's really important. And I think that's the whole idea. We want the fat to be something that's in harmony, in balance throughout our body. So there's brown fat, there's white fat. Within white fat, there's the stuff you can see, the wiggly jiggly stuff under your arm and under your jaw, the, the muffin top. All right. The visceral fat is the, of the, of the two types of white fat, the, the subcutaneous and visceral. Visceral, the stuff inside your body cavity, inside your tube, the body tube is the most dangerous thing. Now, why is that? Because visceral fat literally um, uh, is the first fat to grow when you actually start to have too many, too much body, too much fuel from too much food. Okay, it starts to grow, and because your body cavity is like a, a finite chamber, uh, all right, that's when the think about visceral fat normally like packing peanuts. You go to FedEx, you get a box, you're going to ship some champagne glasses. You're going to ask for some peanuts to make sure like it's padded so it's not going to break. You pour those peanuts in there loosely. You you tape it up and you ship it off. It'll be fine. But let's say you were, you know, aggressive and you're like, put the peanuts in. You got to keep on packing the peanuts. I bought that whole bag of peanuts. I'm going to use all the peanuts into this box. Now this box actually is like bulging with peanuts. And in fact, the peanuts are so packed in there that they're crushing the champagne glasses. For example, you're going to force the box shut, tape it. And at arm's length, is still a skinny box, but guess what's in there? Those peanuts are actually choking your, whatever you're shipping. Same deal when visceral fat grows too, too, too aggressively, it becomes that base focal to strangle your organs. Now, how do you know that you have growing visceral fat? There's a couple of ways. One, it's kind of obvious. Your waist circumference expands your belt. You suddenly need a bigger size pant. You know, the old clothes don't fit so well. All right. This is kind of like, also the beer gut, all right, you wind up actually having bigger and bigger circumference. The tube of your body gets bigger because the fat inside the peanuts in there are stretching your skin. All right, so how can you tell when you're actually losing visceral fat? Very easy. You can actually close down an extra belt hole. You're getting smaller. Another pants fit better. That's like a surrogate, simple, easy peasy way to know if you're losing visceral fat. Now you can actually get more uh, sophisticated. You can do a DEXA scan, Right, that's a scan that actually measures body composition. What, how much is muscle? How much is bone? How much is body fat? And a a DEXA scan, which is pretty sophisticated, um, uh, and but people can get a DEXA scan. uh, Like fitness experts do that. You can actually measure exactly how much visceral fat you have, and you can do that over time to see if you're losing any of it. But for most people who don't want to go to that trouble, your belt size, your waistline, your clothing is actually a really, really good surrogate. Um, uh, so that's, this is where when I was talking about eating the beans and the research showing that, you know, you're, you can, you can lose one belt hole, like that's an inch. That's pretty amazing that just eating beans can actually do that. I'm glad you clarified where I got confused. I was thinking of subcutaneous white fat as a separate silo from visceral fat. You explained there that white fat has basically, it splits off into the two, the subcutaneous Mm -hmm. and the visceral. So now that makes a lot more sense. So thank you for yeah. You got you got, you got fat, you got brown, and you've got white. And of the white, you've got two kinds. You've got visceral, which is gut fat, and you've got subcutaneous, wiggly jiggly fat. All right. Now, one thing I wanted I, that I was meaning to get to that this is another really important thing. Do you know where is one of the first places you gain when you're gaining body fat, gaining weight? Do you know where the one of the first places in your body that you're gonna that the fat actually accumulates, where do you think that might be? I would guess the belly. Right? That's what most people think because that's what you can see. You know, my belly's getting bigger, I must be gaining weight. Not true. It turns out one of the most sensitive places that you start to gain body fat as you're gaining weight, and this is true in skinny people as well, as well as big people, uh, large, larger size body people, is your tongue. Your tongue gets fat. You can get a fat tongue. Now, here's how it works. And this has been studied by people who look at anatomy of the tongue. So the tongue actually has three parts. The tip of the tongue is like Cirque du Soleil. It's like an acrobat. It can do all kinds of fancy things at the very tip. The middle of the tongue is is muscular, okay? It is super strong and muscular because it moves food around in your mouth, okay? The back of the tongue is kind of like a big beanbag, and it is 
marbled with fat, visceral fat, like a ribeye steak. That's normal, healthy. That's the way the tongue is actually made. So when you actually start to gain visceral fat, one of the first places that the visceral fat starts to grow is in the back third of your tongue. Now, how do we know this? This has actually been studied in skinny people, in fact, skinny women. And, and, what, and what, we, what happens is that um, uh, uh, people notice that, uh, usually it's the bed partners that say this, that, hey, you know what? You started snoring. Did you know that? You weren't snoring before. Now you're snoring. And the, and the person goes, you know what? Actually, that's really weird because I'm starting to gain a little bit of weight too. And so this is the connection. When you're growing more body fat, your tongue gets fatter in the back of your tongue. And what happens is, think about it. When you're sleeping, you're relaxed. And when you're relaxed, your tongue is also relaxed. And your fat tongue starts to slide back and block your airways. Now you snort. You don't sleep that well. It's called sleep apnea. And you actually snore as well. So snoring is another biomarker of accumulating extra, extra visceral fat in the back of your tongue. Uh, that actually is indicating that you're actually starting to gain weight and gain body fat. That's so interesting. And while we're talking about the different types of fat here, one more area I want to dive into. We know we can take certain foods in. They're going to impact stem cells and convert the white fat to the brown fat. You talk about a term in the book, browning of fat. Is that different or is that involve the stem cells? It's different. It turns out that there are some foods that can also take white, jiggly, subcutaneous, or visceral fat. And the natural chemicals in the foods can basically tap the white fat in the shoulder and go, hey, buddy, you know what, white fat? I, I, I'm going to try to convert you to being the good fat, the good brown fat. And so white, the, 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 the color between white and brown is beige. And so they call that beijing. So certain foods can even convince some of your white fat to turn brown like so that fat that was once wiggly and jiggly in a fuel tank can start to become fuel burning as well and this is how powerful foods can be they elevate your metabolism by burning down fuel by making more of the mighty chondria fat lo loaded fat that can burn down fuel by convincing stem cells to make more of that good kind of fat and by even convincing the wiggly jiggly uh, harmful fat to actually also become more of that good fat as well. This is really untapped human potential, literally, that is baked into our bodies as part of our operating system. And when you realize that foods that we eat can activate the different parts of these systems, you realize that, hmm, wait a minute, we don't need to fear our food. We should think about which foods can actually do this. And that all of a sudden flips, turn, really turns the entire, turns the tables on this idea of dieting by deprivation. Now, why don't we set the table and decide what dishes we're actually going to put in front of us with using ingredients that can do that? You asked a, a, a exciting question to me because it's an area of my research. How important is organic? First of all, let me just be really clear. I had had for years been a skeptic of organic foods. Okay, I'm not anymore. But the reason I was a skeptic is because I, I kind of felt like it rubbed me the wrong way. Why should I pay more money to buy a food that's grown without chemicals uh, in a more natural form uh, so that I could actually have the privilege of avoiding pesticides? Like it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way that, that it would be marketed something that was more natural and had less chemicals. I had to pay more money to actually get the more natural stuff. Right. Well, there's another reason that research now has shown very definitively the advantage of organic foods. And I want everyone to really hear this because it's important. This is this is science, not marketing. All right. Turns out that uh, a study was done and published in the journal Nature by a group, an agricultural group, horticultural group in England, and they were looking at strawberries. Now, strawberries, as we all know, have a very thin skin. You can't skin, you can't peel a strawberry very easily. And so a strawberry that's grown conventionally with pesticides, those pesticides are going to be stuck on that skin. And because the thin is skin, it, it, the thin, the skin is very thin, the pesticides will tend to penetrate inside that flesh, right? Nobody wants to eat a pesticide, a chemical lead in strawberry, right? Okay. What the, what the researchers did is they wanted to compare not the level of pesticides between conventional versus organic strawberries. 
They wanted to look at something that I care about, which is the bioactives, the good stuff in strawberries. What is among many good stuff in strawberries? There's something called elagic acid. Elagic acid is what makes a strawberry tart. Like strawberries are sweet and a little tart. Elagic acid and acid makes it a little tart. And it turns out elagic acid is so powerful. It actually can cut off the blood supply to cancers. You can eat strawberries to actually starve cancers. It also is really a powerful antioxidant. It stimulates your stem cells to repair your organs. Also feeds your gut microbiome. And it also is helpful for lowering inflammation as well, right? This is a really, really awesome natural chemical in Mother Nature's farm, a C. Not with a P, not with a pH, but with an F. It's found in a strawberry. Now, here's what's the surprise is. When you compare the conventionally grown strawberry, treated with pesticides, looks pretty because... Bugs aren't eating it, okay? There's no bugs or, or uh, insects uh, sw uh, swarming around a pesticide-treated strawberry. And you compare it to an organic strawberry, okay, where bugs are have actually been nibbling at it. If you compare the elagic acid, there's a lot more, three times more elagic acid in the organic-grown strawberry. There's three times more of the good stuff compared to the organic. Now, why is that? This is what's really amazing. Turns out, that elagic acid, like many of these bioactives, are Mother Nature's um, natural insecticides and pesticides. And so what happens is that in a organically grown plant, you actually have these little bugs that are nibbling on the leaves and the stems of the strawberry, chewing at it. And this whole strawberry plant reacts to that nibbling by creating more of a natural pesticide, natural insecticide called elagic acid loads up the fruit with it to protect the fruit because that's actually what's going to be responsible for the reproductive health so the strawberry plant can live to grow another day, right? Um, and so organic has more of the natural bioactive, whereas the pesticide treated or conventionally grown, it keeps away the bugs. Bugs aren't nibbling. Plant looks a little better, all right? But actually, it doesn't need to produce as much of the electric acid. This has been shown not only for strawberries, but peaches, even coffee beans, you know, organic coffee, you know, fair trade organic actually has a lot more of another biochemical called a bioactive called chlorogenic acid. Chlorogenic acid is incredibly powerful for streamlining your metabolism and actually improving your blood flow uh, as well. And here's another example with coffee where the organic version is better for you. And we've actually measured it. We found three times more of the good stuff. And there's an explanation. Little natural bugs and pests actually nibbling at the leaves and stems of our plants actually prompt them to actually secrete more of the good stuff. Now, I'm actually willing to pay more to get more good stuff. I don't want to be paying more to get bad, to get less bad stuff. I look at it now, it's just completely changed my mind about organic foods. And so now when I have a chance, I will actually look for the organic. I love that. And I love the explanation. That makes a lot of sense. And it's kind of riffing off what you just said there. We have this mentality up till this point of paying for volume and calories. But what this does is flips that on its head. And even though we're paying more for organic, we can look at it like we're paying more, but we're getting more nutrition. So there's the value there. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was trying to say. I think it's important we come at this from another perspective as well. So we know that the nutrients are upped and this is something not a lot of people are talking about. So I'm glad you went into detail there, but let's talk about it. And this ties into something you brought up a couple of times, the microbiome. So what happens with that strawberry example when it is sprayed with pesticides, which is there to, you know, keep pests away. And then it goes into our digestive system and we have all our good bugs there, hopefully a lot of good bugs. How does our body react with, with those chemicals? Yeah, it's a great question. So let me kind of back up. And what we're talking about here is bacteria. Microbiome is really an ecosystem bacteria, about 39 trillion bacteria that lives in our gut. Actually, it lives all over our body in every orifice, you know, your ears, your nose, your nostrils, your mouth, your anus. I mean, every place there's an opening, there's bacteria. But here's the crazy thing. Inside our body, we're packed with bacteria at the lower end of our gut. Okay. It's in an area that the most, the, the home, the Great Barrier Reef of these natural bacteria in our body is in a part of the colon called the cecum. 
C E C U M. And if you're, you know, if you're in the medical field, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a part of the organ system that a lot of people aren't familiar with that term. Uh, Cause, you know, uh, I used to wonder, like, okay, so where does a microbiome, where do all these bacteria live? It's called the cecum. All right. So uh, when I went to medical school, I was, you know, very quickly in the first week of school taught bacteria are bad, and you're going to learn and memorize all the bacteria that are bad, and then you're going to actually take pharmacology, and we're going to teach you about all the drugs, antibiotics that can be used to kill the bad bacteria, right? And, and you know, of course, even in kindergarten, we're always turned, wash your hands, get rid of the bacteria, you know, uh, take a shower, all these kinds of messages about bacteria that have made us as a modern society um, shun uh, maybe even be a little repelled by this idea of bacteria. Well, it turns out that that's, it's true. There are some bacteria that are really bad, bad actors, and they cause all kinds of problems. But by and large, most of the bacteria that we will encounter in our lives are inside our body, not outside our body. And most of the bacteria are good, not bad. And that's what we call our gut microbiome. Our gut microbiome actually is an ecosystem of 39 trillion bacteria, most of it living inside our gut. And what they do inside our gut is they um, they eat the food that our body doesn't digest. Let me explain. So you take a bite of, uh, of uh, an apple, all right? And our human bodies are going to absorb the natural fructose, the sugars in the, uh, in the apple. We're going to get the vitamins. We're actually going to get some of the other nutrients that are going to be absorbed into our body. But there's a lot of fiber that's going to be left over, right? You know, the the, the skin that you eat, if it's an organic apple, um, the fiber uh, from, there's a lot of fiber in apple or pear. And then that fiber trickles down your 40 feet of intestines all the way to the cecum. And the bacteria there you're feeding your bacteria, this leftover stuff. Whatever we don't absorb goes to the bacteria. I'm going to come back to that point because you're asking why are the chemicals not so good for us? It's because our bacteria get fed. But if it's normal healthy food, normal healthy fiber, our bacteria eats those that fiber and and in payback for feeding them, they the love that they, our bacteria show for us is they produce metabolites that are anti-inflammatory. These are called short-chain fatty acids or SCAFAs. Um, and they lower inflammation, they promote healing, they uh, streamline our blood lipids, they make our insulin sensitivity better, which is an important part of our metabolism. So the fuel is actually more rapidly absorbed into our bloodstream. You, nobody wants to have lots of glucose, lots of blood sugar at high levels all day long, and not good for our bodies, okay? It's like being stuck in a bathtub too long or a swimming pool too long. You know how your fingers wrinkle? That's not what you want. So you want your blood sugar to be readily absorbed into our cells. Okay, those are, these are just partially what we know our gut bacteria does for us. So we got to feed them well. Feeding them like three times a day is kind of like having a pet. Our bacteria, our microbiome is like a pet. If you have a dog, a cat, a parakeet, a goldfish... You know, most of us are responsible pet owners, so we make sure that we feed them our kibble or the flakes every single day or the seeds, right? Now, we most of us will choose what kind of food we're actually feeding our pet. You don't want to feed your dog crap, right? You want to choose carefully. You want to take care of your animal. Well, that's basically what eating whole uh, uh, foods uh, that are uh, as good as possible, high-quality whole foods, that's what we're feeding our gut microbiome, all right? Um, and, that, and they pay us back by giving us health through these short-chain fatty acids. Okay, let's go back to your question. What about foods that are laden with synthetic chemicals, artificial preservatives? Um, artificial sweeteners, by the way, is another big offender. All right. What happens is that we're feeding or we're eating it. Oh, there's no calories in an artificial sweetener. Uh, uh, oh, this uh, cheap shelf-stable stuff uh, with artificial flavor tastes really great. Goes down the gullet. Um, we absorb relatively little because it doesn't have as many nutrients as the normal whole food. The rest of it, where does it go? We don't just poop it out. We're feeding our gut bacteria, that 39 trillion uh, 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 population, and we're feeding them crap. We're feeding them chemicals. We're feeding them things that they shouldn't be eating, okay? Imagine if you fed your pet dog, okay, really terrible quality food, chemical food all the time. I don't think your dog's going to last that long. 
Okay, all the problems that your vet tells you that the dogs, you know, can have if you feed them poor quality food, that's what we're doing to our gut with all these artificial synthetic things. And so that's the reason why we need to take good care. You know, like this whole idea of um, the pregnant mom saying, I I have to watch what I eat because I'm eating for two. Well, guess what? Each of us, we're eating for 39 trillion. In fact, we are feeding our gut microbiome and we have that responsibility. If we treat our gut microbiome well, they will treat our health well. Well, let's let's go into this further. Let's talk about two different angles here. One being the pesticides. Let's come back to that and and talk about what happens when they get down there and how they affect the microbiome. And then two, what are things we can do on the other end? You know, we talked about fiber, but what are some of the things we can do to make sure our microbiome is thriving? Yeah. So first of all, what do some of the bad substances, the bad actors, the chemicals do? They kill off good bacteria. And when good bacteria get killed off, bad bacteria start to grow in. It's an ecosystem, right? So think about the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I've actually had the privilege of uh, swimming and diving and, and snorkeling around there. Amazing. You know, you're, you go into the water and you see this dizzying array of colorful sea life. If you start removing the moray eels and taking the crabs away and removing the clownfish and taking away the sea anemones, those are all critical players in the gut microbiome. What do you think is going to grow into that space? Something will grow into it. And in the case of our gut microbiome, it's the bad bacteria that replace the good bacteria. They overgrow. Okay. And when you got a lot of bad bacteria growing, they produce inflammatory compounds, not anti-inflammatory compounds. They start to create inflammation. And some of these bad bacteria, by the way, can drill their way through your healthy gut and even get into your bloodstream, which is really, really dangerous. In fact, there's one called C. diff. A Clostridium difficile, which is a big, deadly problem in the hospital that can cause terrible inflammatory changes in your gut. You got to be on IV antibiotics, and you know some people don't make it when they have that kind of infection. So that's why you know overgrowth of bad bacteria is a terrible thing. We believe that a lot of um, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory gut disease, and even colon cancers and gut cancers are probably at least partly attributable to harmful overgrowth of bad bacteria, and that's just in the gut. We also know that when you have harmful bacteria growing in your gut, it raises the chances of actually having heart disease, diabetes, and even Alzheimer's disease because of the gut-brain axis. There's a connection between the two. Bad actors in your gut cause bad consequences everywhere in your body. This is such a new, important field that we only understand the tip of the iceberg. And if I were advising a young uh, medical student going into their career right now, and they ask me, uh, hey, Dr. Lee, what kind of field, research field should I go into? I would say go study the microbiome. There's a whole vast frontier out there that teaches us how important our gut bacteria is for our health. So what are some of the good things that you can actually do? We talked a lot about the bad things. I'm always about the positive side. Like, don't tell me about, don't tell me about just a problem if you can't give me a solution, right? So the solution is this. Feed our bacteria, our good gut bacteria, to restore their integrity. Help the good guys grow back, right? So think about it this way. You have a perfectly good neighborhood, and the uh, uh, some of the people, the residents there, get older and older. They age out, um, and, and they die, and they move away. And now you've got gang members and drug dealers that move in. Okay, that's the overgrowth of bad bacteria. What do you think those drug dealers and, and gang members are going to do? They're going to attract more drug dealers and more back, uh, more gang uh, uh, gang members into the community. And, well, there goes the neighborhood. And that's what happens when you have an overgrowth of this bad bacteria. So what do you do? How do you rehab a neighborhood? What's the good move? Well, look, you've got to move some of the bad guys out. That's for sure. But then what you want to do is you want to move lots of good guys back into the neighborhood because you can actually rest- re- rehab uh, a a a downtown neighborhood by moving it by rehabbing the neighborhood, making the places nicer, putting moving people in that deserve to be there that can be good citizens, and how do we do that for our gut bacteria? We we start eating more whole uh, plant based foods. We eat fiber. We eat good bioactives. Uh, we eat the, the positive bioactives in whole foods. We cut down on the chemicals, synthetic chemicals, artificial sweeteners, artificial flavors. We try to grow back the good guys, and the bad guys will start to go away because the good guys can overgrow. They can actually dominate if you give them the opportunity. And so what we do is we do we can eat three types of foods. Number one, we can eat prebiotic foods. These are foods with a lot of dietary fiber, broccoli, 
uh, 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 apples, uh, lots of fruits, uh, pears, uh, 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 mushrooms, uh, celery, kale, uh, lots of these green veggies, uh, red bell peppers, green peppers, uh, onions. They all contain lots of dietary fiber. Awesome. Great. Good for you. Um, uh, even uh, uh, bamboo shoots that you might get in an Asian market, for example. I was just thinking about that because I said I went to an Asian market the other day. Also, great way of getting dietary fiber. That's why pandas eat bamboo, by the way. Um, they get the dietary fiber. Good bacteria helps to grow. You can also eat bacteria itself. So bacteria in foods, again, you know, we were always told if you look in, the, if you look in your fridge and you see some blue stuff growing on your food, toss it out. True. Please do that. You don't want to be eat, getting food poisoning. But there are certain foods that have good bacteria in them. What kind of foods? Yogurt. It's got made with, uh, it's fermented with good bacteria. Kimchi, sauerkraut, uh, pickles, uh, all made with uh, good, healthy bacteria. Uh, and even some cheeses, which, you know, have a lot of saturated fat and salt, so not really healthy for you. Um, even some of the cheeses can actually have good bacteria that are actually growing. Sourdough bread. Um, uh, you know, I'm not telling people to eat a lot of carbs or eat a lot of um, bread, but if you're going to eat bread, sourdough, that tang, that characteristic flavor of sourdough bread is made by lactic acid. What kind? How do you get the lactic acid in sourdough bread? You have a good, healthy bacteria that should be growing in our gut called lactobacillus, lactobacillus, lacto. Bacillus, ba 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 that kind of bacteria makes lactic acid, which makes sourdough taste tangy. The bacteria remnants are in that bread, and you eat them, you're actually replenishing your body by contributing to the ecosystem. And then, of course, there's something called um, postbiotics. And postbiotics are really whatever the bacteria produces, you know, can we actually add some of that into our system as well? Well, it turns out a, a, a jar of pickles or a jar of kimchi or a jar of sauerkraut already has postbiotics because the bacteria are already in there and they're already making their stuff. So we're already eating some of that good stuff. And I think that's really the thing to do. Stay away from the bad things for your for your gut microbiome. Add some of the good things for your gut uh, microbiome. One last point about this is that how does, what makes our gut microbiome happy, uh, happiest? It turns out it's not just plant-based foods, but diversity. If you eat the same damn thing every single day, your gut bacteria gets really bored and doesn't like it. So try to eat 20 or 30 different kinds of plant-based foods every week. All right. Not that hard to do. Spices count. You, you know, put some uh, a seasoning on there. It might be four or five plant-based foods already. And a salad, use more than romaine lettuce. Put different kinds of greens in there. Light them up. You know, uh, uh, diversity is what your our gut microbiome thrives on. And so this is where I think that this idea of loving your food and loving your health come into play. This is not about being a robot and following only one or two foods and you got to eat a lot of it all the time. But you know, look at all of these foods. I write about more than 200 foods I need to beat disease. All of them come from traditional food traditions that you can combine and make absolutely delicious and tasty. So that's actually how you get this diversity, which your gut microbiome will thank you for by um, having more diverse foods means more diverse bacteria, which means a healthier microbiome, which means an overall healthier body. For somebody tuning in who's realizing, okay, this is all great, but I've been abusing my microbiome for my life up until this point, maybe through artificial sweeteners, um, antibiotics, pesticides on produce. What I'm getting at here is, is there good research showing that if we include this fiber in these fermented foods and we don't have a good microbiome to start, do they, do these bacteria we're taking in, do they actually seed and stay there or how, how does that work? Yeah. So it's not a single bacteria. It's really the response of the ecosystem. And it turns out that if you eat um, a healthy food, like a kiwi, for example, that has a lot of dietary fiber. Your, it will cause your gut microbiome to grow healthy bacteria within 24 hours. So it doesn't take much to actually start the process of rehab going. And that's really what we're talking about. It's a process. And of course, you do want to actually cut down or cut out the bad stuff because if you're just, if you're just shoveling in harmful things to your gut microbiome, like it, you're not giving it a chance to recover. You want to back off the bad stuff, start the good stuff, 
And it's pretty quick, actually. You can actually usually get um, a replenishment of your gut microbiome. These days, by the way, Jesse, you can actually order out and send out your stool sample to have your own gut microbiome checked. So things actually, you know, we're beginning. It's not, it's not mainstream yet, and maybe some of the tests aren't quite ready for prime time. But it's a really, really useful way for us to be able to monitor our own health by looking for those healthy gut bacteria. Oh, that's great. And I just want to make sure what I'm getting at specifically, though, is the assumption that there is still, even if we've abused the microbiome, certain seeds and bits of the good bacteria that when we put the right stuff in, those bloom and and take up adequate space like they should? Or is it actually bacteria that are coming off the fermented food uh, or just, you know, bacteria in in our environment that we're taking in that are repopulating from ground zero? It's, it's actually all a little bit of all of the above. So it's the good bacteria getting an edge once again to grow back and fill up the spot that they want to fill up. It's the good bacteria that you're eating in the foods that are eventually that you're eating with some of the bacteria. By the way, kimchi, by the way, has two bacteria that have been discovered, newly discovered, like new to the biology world that is present only in kimchi. I, I was really absolutely surprised. I'm not Korean, but I, but I do like kimchi. And one of them is actually uh, fights influenza. It actually uh, is a bacteria that actually resist, helps us fight the flu. And another one actually helps us improve our metabolism. And so there are these unique bacteria that grow in foods that are actually really good for us. And so, yes, we want to be able to eat some of those and they stick and they grow. Um, our, the ones that are good already can actually grow back and expand more. And of course, we're being in contact with bacteria all the time anyway in our environment. Um, you know, one, one of the things we're starting to realize is that being, living in a sterile environment, not so good for us. We, we need to be participating in our planet, which is not so much as a dirty planet. I mean, well, maybe it is a dirty planet, but basically we need to actually uh, be in contact with, we need to be at one with the different kinds of bacteria out there. So you got a kid, let them play in the dirt a little bit. They're actually getting some good bacteria from the planet, uh, to help, uh, keep their gut, keep challenging their gut to making sure it's in good shape. And Dr. Lee, I know you're all about food first, which makes a lot of sense to me, but how do you feel about layering on with the fiber, with the fermented foods, a good probiotic? Oh, well, look, probiotics are, I, I mean, I take probiotics. I, I, I believe in them. A uh, probiotic um, is really a mix, gen, tends to be a mix of bacteria that we're just adding to the the good guys that are in our gut. I don't think a probiotic should be a replacement, however, to fibrous foods, you know, the prebiotic foods, the, the probiotic foods, because you get so much more, right? So this is what you call, um, you know, the pure bacteria. Yeah, probably helpful. I, I believe in it. But, I, I, you know, you get so much more from those healthy bioactives that are present in the whole food. And that's actually what I want people to kind of focus on is what are the whole foods that you really enjoy? You know, this isn't a chore. This is all about, you know, enjoying your health and enjoying your food at the same time. You you can actually pick from a menu of foods that are actually good for you. Don't eat the ones you don't like. For God's sake, choose the ones that you actually love and pick lot, you know, different ones and and vary it up. Enjoy it. Like I I, I really try to um, coach people into not being afraid of food, but leaning into food. Not worrying so much about the things that can harm them, but really focusing on which foods that you enjoy can actually bring you benefit because that's a win-win situation when you find a food that you enjoy and it's good for you. You touched on the fact that our microbiome is in communication with different areas of the body. I want to hone in on the communication between the gut and the brain. Hmm. This is something that you know comes up on the show periodically, but you're a guy that likes to go deep into the science. So I'm curious, how does that work? You know, it's so interesting because we don't fully understand it, but I'll tell you what we believe is happening. Um, Okay, let me set the stage by first painting a picture of how the gut and the brain is, is wired together. Okay, so out of our brain, we've got nerves that come out of our brain. Our brain is like tens of millions of nerves, but there are these cranial nerves that pop out like... um, uh, like wires coming out of the wall. And one of them, the one of the biggest nerves is called the vagus nerve, V-A-G-U-S. It's the one of the biggest nerves in the body. Comes out of your head, runs down your neck, 
wraps around your esophagus, which is the, the tube that we eat with, to our stomach. And then below that, it, 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 it um, branches out into thousands of branches. Those branches reach all the way down to our intestines. And it's kind of like um, a horse's tail in the blowing in the wind. You've got all these tendrils everywhere, and they're touching our gut. And what we believe is that the brain signals to the gut through these nerves that talk to the bacteria and vice versa, the bacteria can send a text message up to the brain through the vagus nerves. Okay, so you think about the bacteria living inside your gut, there's a gut wall, and then just on the other side is a is a wire. And the bacteria can actually just put a signal right through the wire. Uh, so this is a wired system, not a wireless system. And it goes up into the brain. Um, and of course, bacteria can also send wireless signals by, through the bloodstream. And then what happens is that when the brain receives those bacterial signals, they begin to release hormones, social hormones being one of the most important. There's one called oxytocin. Some of you, your, your viewers and listeners may have heard of oxytocin. Oxytocin is a social hormone. It is the hormone that your brain surges and releases when you see a great friend that you haven't seen for a long time. Like, oh my God, I feel so good being seeing that person. Or when you um, give a family member a hug, you know, a family member you like, a hug. Um, you know, it, you, you feel good. That's oxytocin. Oxytocin is what you actually get, um, not with a not with a peck on the lips with a kiss, but a French kiss, your brain floods out oxytocin. And the, and the biggest example everyone always remembers when I say this is that when you have an orgasm, your brain pounds out a gigantic burst of oxytocin. It's just there for a few seconds, but that's what makes you feel so great for a short period of time. Okay. The gut microbiome is connect, is co communicating through this vagus nerve up into your brain. And triggering, sending text messages, hey, a little oxytocin, please, a little more oxytocin, please. And so it actually helps us keep our mood going up. That's an example. Oxytocin is just one of them. Serotonin, and dopamine. These are all the things that psychiatrists are writing prescriptions for for decades to try to improve mood. You know, I think that we're beginning to realize that our gut bacteria actually plays a role in improving our mood. Now we're beginning to think, or I should say rethink, how we actually approach um, uh, improving somebody's mood disorders. How do we get people to feel better? Uh, I mean, even after surgery or hospitalization or um, you know a bereavement, like, are there ways we can actually treat our gut microbiome better that will actually make us recover, feel better, uh, sort of on a mental and emotional state as well. So that gut-brain axis goes way more deeply and profoundly than, than, uh, than, that, than, than um, you know, just simply communicating back and forth. It actually influences who we are, our identity. Furthermore, the gut-brain axis seems to help to um, influence whether or not we're going to de develop dementia or Alzheimer's disease, all right? You know, th this is an epidemic, right? Like the dementia in an aging population. And it's been so difficult to find drugs that can actually improve Alzheimer's disease. Could the answer partly be by improving the gut microbiome? Actually, I happen to think so. And so this is another really exciting area of research that we cannot ignore. You mentioned you're somebody who takes a probiotic as part of your supplement regime. Hmm. I'm curious, even though you are a big proponent of using food first, again, coming back to that, what other supplements are you into? You know, um, I do take vitamin D supplements. I take omega-3 supplements and I take some probiotics. Those are the three. I, I'm not a, I don't like a big pile of pills in front of me, but I am very conscious of the fact that, you know, there's some probiotics that are not just good for your lower gut, the cecum I told you about, but even your mouth. So there's a bacteria called Lactobacillus ruteri. It's the same, same bacteria, by the way, in, in sourdough bread, used to make sourdough bread. Also found in Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese, the original stuff they use in Italy. They use that to actually start the cheese. Turns out that that bacteria in your mouth, so I get a chewable, actually kills the bacteria in your oral mouth microbiome that causes cavities. 
And clinical trials have been done to show that you can actually lower the rate of cavities um, uh, and better gum health by having lecopacillus ruteris. So that's one of the probiotics, for example, that I take. Vitamin D, very important. Good for your immune system. It's cancer fighting. Uh, many people who don't are, are not outdoors as much um, wind up actually not getting enough sunshine. Uh, people in the Northern Hemisphere, for example, um, uh, or people who are in the Northeast, uh, northern climates, colder climates, wearing clothing all, most a lot of the year, like shirts and long sleeves. Um, uh, vitamin D is good for you, uh, and it can build your immunity. Uh, and we found, by the way, during the pandemic, that people who were who got sick faster earlier on in the beginning of the pandemic, many of them were uh, short on their vitamin D. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I mean, those are and, and the omega threes. You know, uh, I actually enjoy seafood, um, but uh, uh, for me, um, getting omega-3 supplements helps me top off, uh, on, uh, on that. And without having the mercury and heavy metals from seafood, it turns out that omega-3 fatty acids are actually originally plant-based. They come from plankton in the sea. Uh, and, and it's the fish that eat the plants that then the bigger fish eat the bigger fish, the smaller fish that actually builds up the omega-3s in their flesh. Um, but if you eat a, if you eat a, a, a fish uh, oil supplement, omega-3 supplement, you know, you actually just get the, the whole deal, shebang, uh, that, that you can to top off. Now, there was a study that was published last year that was a, a, a real eye-opener um, looking at um, levels of blood levels of omega-3s because you can find the blood, you can find a fingerprint of how much omega-3 is in your blood, in your red blood cell. Okay. Your blood, red blood cell is what makes your blood red. And it was a study of like several thousand people. And they found that those people who had the highest levels of omega-3 fatty acids lived longer, about five years longer compared to people who had low levels of omega-3s. Now, in those cases, the, the, the omega-3s are mostly coming from eating fish. But here's the crazy thing. That improvement of five-year survival by just eating having omega-3 fatty acids, was cited in this study as equivalent to the benefit of a smoker quitting smoking. So if you're a heavy smoker and you quit smoking, you'll gain five years of life almost immediately if you quit. All right. And here's the thing where you can eat something and gain benefit in life as well. And uh, so, you know, those are uh, three of the supplements that I take. Now that you're done with Dr. Lee, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Tim. He's got a lot more to share when it comes to using food as medicine. I'll see you over there. I think we've, we've gone far too far the wrong way and we need to get back to much more natural methods, certainly.